sponsored by NordVPN. Hello and welcome to a full compilation of my USS Enterprise series, the complete history of CV-6 and her journey through World War II. Now I should warn the viewership that the first two episodes of this series were made when this channel had a far heavier anime focus, so please keep that in mind and be open-minded, as I use the characters to anthropomorphize the ships and give a greater emotional impact to the story. Also, I should say that this was made over a long period of time, so the quality ramps up as the series goes on. With that out of the way, please enjoy. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States was at peace with that nation. And at the solicitation of Japan, was still in conversation with its government and its... What happened? This video has kindly been sponsored by the world's fastest and most popular VPN service provider, NordVPN. In today's ever-changing technology landscape, a VPN is vital for staying safe online. We all know what a VPN is by now, and let's be honest, most of us have one. We use it to get around region blockers and access our favourite content, which, as an anime fan, I definitely need. We use it to keep our data safe from hackers, we use it to secure our IP, and you can be sure that Nord does everything a great VPN should do, and it does it brilliantly, but what you might not know is that it does much more than that. Nord's active protection shields you from malware, trackers and ads, the inbuilt dark web monitor notifies you if someone steals your credentials, MeshNet allows you to connect up to six devices remotely and securely, and it comes with a dedicated IP that helps you avoid capachas and block lists. In my job here at YouTube, I have to go to corners of the internet a normal person really shouldn't be going to, so Nord's security features are vital for me, and they are vital for you. But the best part is, they don't track your information or share it, and are fully encrypted at all times, with an emergency kill switch should things get out of control. They have 24-7 customer support, a dedicated app for every device, and right now, you can get four months extra on a two-year plan by just clicking the link in the description below. They have a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you literally have nothing to lose by giving them a try. So please do give them a try. Click the link in the description and get that special offer. Plus, you'll help the channel, and I appreciate all the help I can get. Now, back to the video. Admiral Halsey, commander of Carrier Division 2, walked onto the bridge of his flagship, bearing an expression which many aboard the same ship now shared. It wasn't an expression of fear, nor an expression of anger. No. No, this expression was one of cold, concentrated rage. Everyone hates Mondays. It is a rule of life. Everybody hates Mondays. The reality check of a relaxing peace being shattered by the necessity of labour. But as Halsey gazed at the aftermath of the attack on Pearl Harbor, he was pretty damn sure that this had to be the Monday to end all Mondays. The ship on which he stood, USS Enterprise, was the darling of the Pacific Fleet. She had been given one of the very first production radar systems in the US Navy, the CXAM-1 air search radar. And she had been the carrier used for the film Dive Bomber, a US Navy propaganda masterpiece starring the great Errol Flynn, as well as the pilots of her air group, that being VF and VB-6. The Yorktown-class aircraft carrier known by the name Big E was a star of both the world's stage and the silver screen. 
but no more. No, from now on, she was a warrior. An unsheathed sword. A bringer of righteous vengeance against those who dared to do her comrades or her countrymen harm. And Admiral Bill Halsey was definitely looking to do some harm of his own at this point. As Enterprise pulled into her berthing by the quay, the one MC cried out its age-old cry of mooring, mooring, while the ship's bell chimed. This was followed by orders from the bridge that all hands, literally everybody, was to assist in reprovisioning and refueling the ship. They were to sail as soon as it was completed. What was normally supposed to take a full 24 hours was going to have to be done in under eight. From officers to enlisted, cooks, pilots, everyone. Every single man sprinted to the storehouses alongside. Enterprise and her sisters were now the only capital ships that the US Navy had as the ships which would normally sally forth to fight the enemy were now resting on the bottom of Pearl Harbor with many of their crews trapped inside, screaming as the wreck burned and sank. However, the few ships in the Pacific Fleet which could still sail were quickly made ready for battle, and all men aboard them knew that they were going to do what they were trained to do. And, as the famous John Paul Jones said, they were going to go straight into harm's way. But for Enterprise's air group, they were already in harm's way. On the previous day, December 7th, the day of the attack, Enterprise's air group had been the first to respond to the attack on Pearl Harbor. Their scouting squadron was ambushed by the Japanese as it came into land at Naval Air Station Ford Island, and so when intelligence came through that the Japanese fleet had been detected, it was Enterprise's air group that responded first. However, the line of bearing they were given was wrong, and they searched south of the Hawaiian Islands, rather than north. In hindsight, this was probably a good thing, as had they succeeded in launching their attack, it would have been one air group of 30 or so planes versus the entirety of Japan's Kido Butai, which would then also alert the Japanese to the US carriers being nearby, perhaps altering the course of history. Even so, they had taken casualties. The fighters of VF-6 returned to Pearl Harbor to land, only for the anti-aircraft defences who were understandably a tiny bit trigger happy at this point, to open fire on them. In total, on the first day of the war, the Enterprise Air Group had lost 10 aircraft and 8 aircrew. So, to say some payback was desired would be the understatement of a century. But thankfully, they wouldn't have to wait long to get it. Once the stores were aboard, Admiral Halsey ordered Carrier Division 2 and her escorts to sea. Their mission was to patrol the surrounding area for a possible follow-up attack, or even worse, an invasion. If nothing else, it would get the fleet mobile and ready to fight, as opposed to sitting stationary and waiting to get hit again. It was a miracle that the Japanese hadn't hit the logistics facilities like the dry ducks or the oil tank farms. Had they launched a third wave against those, their chances of mounting any serious response would be as minuscule as the amount of mercy they would show to the first Japanese ship they found. Over the next two days, the pilots of Scouting 6 launched off of Enterprise's decks into the clear and sunny weather of the Pacific. It must have felt surreal to be at war in a place so beautifully peaceful. For the sailors and airmen of both Japan and the United States, the winter holidays were about to start. Americans turned their thoughts to Christmas with their families as the snow had already begun to fall on the mainland, while the Japanese prepared for the New Year's celebrations, to honour their ancestors and pray for good luck in the year ahead at their local shrine. And yet both sides knew they wouldn't see home like that for a very long time. But they would have to push these thoughts out of their minds, there was work to be done. And no doubt, the pilot of the SBD Dauntless Dive Bomber on surface patrol was thinking that very same thought. Lieutenant Clarence E. Dickinson was scanning the surface with his binoculars while his gunner did the same. And they saw nothing. Sweet Foxtrot Alpha. They'd been in the air for over an hour now, and it was time to be heading back. 
One last sweep. One last scan, he kept thinking. He cranked his SPD over into the search pattern and began his vigil again. His gunner shifted in the seat at the movement. The new kid probably had the jitters. Lieutenant Dickinson mused that to himself with a slight pang of grief. His longtime rear gunner, aviation machinist mate Bill Miller, had been killed the previous day when Scouting 6 got shot up by those Zeros. He had shot down the Zero attacking them, saving his pilot's life, but not before being wounded in the process. The SPD banked around in its wide circle to the north, and levelling off, both men kept looking. Again, nothing. Today's flight was looking like a wash. Dickinson's eyes scanned the instruments with a cold, dispassionate expression. The fuel gauge was looking decidedly unhealthy. It was then a voice came from the back. Lieutenant, surface contact, two o'clock, three miles. His eyes shot to the two o'clock position, rolling the aircraft to ensure the wing didn't obscure his vision. And there it was. A small cigar shape in the water with a US destroyer bearing towards it. Got him. The aircraft flung itself into a tight bank and chased after the target. Earlier that same day, Ensign Perry L. Teeth of Scouting 6 had found a Japanese fleet submarine and attacked it with inconclusive results. After conducting a search from its last known location, Dickinson and the US destroyer went looking for it and had had little luck thus far. However, the reason why it had managed to stray so far is that it was running fast on the surface, most likely unable to submerge due to the bomb attack from earlier. With their quarry now in sight, both aviators and sailors were hauling down the lone Japanese sub, eager for the kill. But no matter how fast the destroyer is, they aren't as fast as an SBD on an attack run. Leveling off at 5,000 feet for a textbook attack, Dickinson looked down at his target. The crew of the Japanese submarine I-70, who had been the mothership for one of the midget subs that had infiltrated Pearl Harbor, began hard evasive maneuvering, their anti-aircraft gun blazing furiously at the offending American. It wasn't going to be enough. Dickinson's SBD arched over into a dive, its signature butterfly flaps extending to steady his aim. The telescopic bombsite reticule was fixed firmly over the submarine's conning tower, and down and down he went, his lips curling into a determined smile of satisfaction. He was waiting for his moment, and then it came. Now! The 500-pound bomb flung off the central trapeze system and hurtled straight down. Seeing the bomb's accuracy, two of the Japanese sailors manning the AA gun qualified for the Olympic long jump out of sheer desperation. The third and fourth member of the gun crew would soon join them, though it wouldn't be of their own volition. Dickinson's bomb impacted just to the right of the I-70's hull, inches away from the conning tower. The explosion ruptured the ship's ballast tanks and pierced the hull. The shock flung the remaining men above deck clear overboard, while the sea around the sub started filling with the telltale sign of a black smudge of leaking oil. Soon there was a large wave of bubbles as the stricken sub slipped beneath the waves, air escaping from the doomed ship, forming one last large oil bubble on the surface. Soon after, debris and detritus started floating to the surface, along with pieces of the crew. Dickinson pulled out of the dive and surveyed his handiwork with a sense of professional satisfaction. His rather youthful gunner, meanwhile, clapped and shook his fist. Nice drop, sir, came the cheerful voice from the back seat. Acknowledging his gunner's exultation and wanting to signal the destroyer below them, Dickinson waggled his SPD's wings and headed back to Enterprise. For this action, as well as his dogfight against the Zeros of a Pearl Harbor, Dickinson was awarded the Navy Cross. The two airmen didn't know it at the time, but they had just made history by scoring the US Navy's first kill on a Japanese fleet vessel. Nor did they know how appropriate it would end up being that the first kill for the Americans 
would go to none other than the men of USS Enterprise. With this first victory under her belt, the Big E continued her patrol beat around Hawaii, while the rest of the US carriers, Saratoga and Lexington, attempted to relieve the now besieged Wake Island. But due to Soryu and Hiryu making their presence known, as well as a large-scale surface force with an invasion fleet, there was little that the Americans could do. Lexington attacked Wake Island with her air group, but it was little more than harassment. With US forces stretched so thinly, risking the carrier force was not an option, and so they pulled back to Pearl Harbor with Enterprise covering their retreat. Once all ships were rearmed and resupplied, they headed out once more to guard reinforcement convoys to American Samoa. But playing guard dog did not sit well with Admiral Halsey. He wanted to go out and hit the Japanese square in the face. And however way you cut it, sailing to Samoa is going the wrong way to do that. He needed to worry though, because Ernest King, Grand Admiral of the US Fleet, had appointed a new commander of Pacific Fleet. His name was Admiral Chester Nimitz, and he was thinking the exact same thing Halsey was thinking. They had to hit back. It had to be a hard hit, too. And he had a pretty good idea of how. The question is, could they pull it off? Enterprise finished its convoy duties and once again returned to Pearl Harbor for reassignment. Upon arrival, they were greeted with a wonderful sight. Sitting in the harbor at Carrier Point, north of Ford Island, was none other than her older sister, USS Yorktown. She was almost ready to sail, taking on arms and personnel, while Naval Air Station Ford was quite literally swarming with aircraft. It looked like the United States was finally getting into this war proper, as much as it could be expected right now anyway. Hornet wasn't present, but for some reason her berthing was frantic with activity. Something weird was going on. There seemed to be a large amount of equipment alongside the quay covered in tarpaulins. What was stranger than that, however, was the sight of army officers standing with them giving directions to the navy guys. It was strange. A bizarre sight, to say the least. But, time waits for no man. Once again, the resupply and rearmament dance began in earnest, as everyone got to the business of getting E into fighting shape once more. Meanwhile, Nimitz began his briefing on what their next move was. Admiral Halsey and Admiral Fletcher both viewed the charts in front of them with professional intent. The US Navy would not be in the position to do anything major for another few months, while all the reservists and mothball ships got brought back online. That said, despite the current disadvantage, the US economy was swinging into overdrive regards war production, and as such, new ships and crews were now well on the way. Say what you will about the Yanks. They have a lot of faults, but if there's one thing they can do, it's get into the arms business. I got yeah. seven Mac 11s, about eight, 38, nine, nine, ten, Mac 10, the ships never end. The the time for a fight back had come. The upcoming strike on the Japanese had two phases. The second phase was classified to high hell, so high that Nimitz couldn't tell his men about that part yet. But phase one was just as vital. After World War I, the Japanese had seized the German Pacific colonies throughout the Gilberts, Solomons and Marianas, and in the initial phase of the Pacific War, the Japanese had taken Wake, Guam and the Philippines. Hitting these forward bases would put a dent in the enemy's pride, while posing minimal risk to the task force. It would also give their own crews some much needed combat experience, as well as the satisfaction of some good old fashioned payback. With provisioning complete and their orders in place, Yorktown and Enterprise alongside their escorts set out to launch the first offensive action the US Navy would take in World War II. They sailed with purpose across the Pacific, until reaching their target area on January 31st, 1942. Tomorrow, the men of the USS Enterprise would head into a true battle for the first time, and they were more than ready. 
On February 1st, 1941, the complete air wings of both USS Yorktown and USS Enterprise took off and headed to their respective targets. Yorktown's pilots struck first, hitting the islands of Jaluit, Millie, and Macon. Their attacks did considerable damage to the naval and air stations while destroying three enemy aircraft on the ground. This was accomplished for the loss of only seven aircraft, four Devastators and three SBDs. However, in keeping with her character, Enterprise descended upon her enemies like the wrath of a vengeful god. Big E had been given the tougher target, Kwajalein Atoll, along with the other two islands, Watje and Tarawa. Kwajalein was the biggest base due to be hit on this operation, and sitting at anchor alongside the port facility was a small contingent of Japanese warships. Torpedo 6 needed absolutely no invitation. The Devastators immediately commenced an attack, while the SPDs of Bombing and Scouting 6 went after the shore installations and airfields. The Japanese were caught completely by surprise, and as if to make their point even clearer, the US escort force, comprised of cruisers and destroyers, got in close and laid waste to the islands with their main guns. A veritable hailstorm of bombs and HE descended upon the defenders as Admiral Halsey's men got to work. Three Japanese ships were sunk, while six were heavily damaged, including the Japanese light cruiser Katori, while 15 aircraft were destroyed on the ground or on takeoff. The bases, meanwhile, were trashed, and the port facilities ablaze, but unfortunately they weren't knocked out completely. Which, of course, the Americans would soon discover. With the mission successfully completed, Enterprise recovered her air group while the surface raiders rejoined the task force. This done, they set course east back to Pearl Harbor to replenish their fuel and ammo stores. But the Japanese had other plans, and would not let them go quietly. A formation of G3M Rico bombers had launched from Kwajalein. Having survived the American attack somehow, they were now seeking a little bit of retribution. And upon seeing Enterprise, their formation adjusted course for an attack. The anti-aircraft screen immediately opened fire while the ships performed evasive maneuvers. The bombers released their payloads with deadly precision. However, the seamanship of Enterprise's helmsmen proved superior, dodging the entire fusillade of oncoming bombs. But of course, that would turn out not to be enough. One of the G3Ms took a direct hit to one of their engines, which was now burning furiously. Now, given Japanese aircraft construction, that being one lacking self-sealing fuel tanks, they were essentially origami aircraft, and hence once aflame, the airframe has apparently, well, only a few minutes to live. With this knowledge, the crew initiated a kamikaze attack directly aimed at Enterprise. Through the AA he came, bucking with every hit. This aircraft was being torn to shreds, but he kept on coming. Enter aviation machinist mate first class, Bruno Guido. Seeing the attack incoming, he sprinted back to his SPD, now sitting on the flight deck being rearmed, and with complete disregard to his own safety, he manned the rear gun of his aircraft and engaged the Japanese bomber, nearly emptying his entire remaining ammo store. His aim was true and it was deadly. The wing came off and then the G3M slowly disintegrated, dropping short of the aircraft carrier itself. But it was so close that the disintegrating wing of the bomber cut off the SBD's tail as it crashed. As soon as Bruno got out of the aircraft in front of his disbelieving comrades, he was summoned to the bridge where Admiral Halsey, being the man that he was, promoted Bruno two ranks on the spot. And so, the men of USS Enterprise returned to base victorious, with a heroic story to tell. They were going to rearm and reprovision, getting ready for the fights ahead. When they arrived to Pearl Harbor, it was to a hero's welcome. US press had made a big deal of this mission. We all know how the American press likes to drum shit up, and thankfully, this time they were doing it to positive results. This was their first strike on the road to victory, so it was painted. The first of many, it was hoped. But the crews of Yorktown and Enterprise were a bit concerned at the fact that their little sister Hornet still wasn't in port. 
No matter though, Enterprise always has a mission, and so yet again, they headed out as the lead ship in Task Force 16, attacking the airfields on both Wake Island and Marcus Island to keep the pressure on the Japanese, while keeping US ships out of direct confrontation to preserve their strength. This was wise, as unbeknownst to them, Kido Butai had detached two of its carriers to pursue them in the wake of the Marshal Gilbert's raids. The trade-off is, of course, that the raids themselves did no critical damage to the Japanese war effort in any way, and while conserving strength was vitally important, it really was time to do some actual proper damage. Otherwise, the Japanese would just retain the initiative. It was then that Enterprise was ordered to a rendezvous point just outside the Hawaiian island chain. Through the early spring rains, Enterprise cruised to her rendezvous point, and very soon she arrived on station. And as they linked up with the reinforcing task force, the sailors and airmen aboard could not believe their eyes. Their sister ship Hornet, their little sister pulled into formation alongside, her decks filled with twin-engined B-25 bombers. All while Yorktown and Enterprise had been raising hell in the Pacific and kicking up a ruckus, Hornet had gone all the way to Norfolk, Virginia, and then all the way back to Alameda, California, to pick up a full squadron of US Army Air Force bombers and their crews, as well as their larger-than-life commander, Colonel James Jimmy Doolittle. Disbelief really was the only appropriate reaction to this plan, and for once, it's not because Hornet actually voluntarily sailed to Virginia and California, as I don't know why anyone would go to either of those places. As I was saying, that would be a valid cause for assumptions of insanity. The B-25 was an excellent aircraft, sturdy, reliable, and carrying a decent payload. She would go through many variations across her service life, stretching from medium-range strategic bomber interdiction bomber, tactical bomber, close air support gunship, and even a form of proto-A-10 with a massive fuck-off 75mm anti-tank gun mounted in the place of the bombardier. But as you can imagine, with all that modularity and capability, one must reach the ultimate conclusion. This thing is heavy. Too heavy to get off the deck of a carrier. Enterprise's aviators looked at this with derisive scepticism, and it was perfectly due derisive scepticism. It was tough enough getting their SPDs and Wildcats off the deck. Many a young aviator had met their end by failing to reach takeoff speed due to the boat going too slow, and them not paying attention. Just how these madmen were going to take off was anyone's guess. But Doolittle had been doing what he was famous for thinking on his feet, and flying by his ass. Earlier in January, while Enterprise had been tearing around the Japanese perimeter defences, a naval officer by the name of Francis Lowe approached Fleet Admiral Ernest King with the concept that Army medium bombers could launch a long-range strike on Japan from the Navy's fleet carriers. He was promptly told that he was insane and that it was in turn an insane idea and had absolutely no hope of working and he should go dunk his head in a bucket of cold water. But there was pressure from on high, namely the White House. Not to mention the public were kicking up a storm and requesting a strong counterattack. Basically, they needed a win. And they needed a big win. And so, the mission was given the go-ahead. Too little, who was America's best test pilot at the time, proved the concept of getting the B-25 off the deck of a carrier in theory, by launching from a naval air station runway marked with a carrier's deck length, namely Chambers Field in Norfolk, Virginia. However, as it stood, the B-25 did not have the range to hit Japan and then return to friendly territory unless the carriers got suicidally close to the target, and even then they probably wouldn't be able to get off the deck with a full load of bombs on board. To resolve this, the Americans went to, quite frankly, insane lengths. They fitted a collapsible bladder fuel tank in any spare space they could fit one, literally all throughout the damn thing, along with some spare jerry cans for use in a pinch. They also resolved to carry only four 500-pound bombs, 
three high explosive and one incendiary bundle, and these were specially constructed bombs with the goal of saving weight. Although, there was a little bit of excess weight on those bombs as they had attached Japanese peace medals offered to American servicemen as a symbol of goodwill. They were going to be returned in customary American fashion. Here comes the Y'all don't really worry like hell. Yeah. Here comes the Ooh. Ooh. Here comes the Ooh. Ooh. Here comes the Y'all don't really worry like hell. Yeah. Finally, they tore everything out of the aircraft that was able to be removed, including the defensive guns and ammo. The only guns they kept were the nose gun for strafing the target and the top turret, as that had 360 degree traverse and was the most effective gun for minimal weight. The rear and waist guns were replaced with broomsticks painted black to look like guns in the hopes that it would scare zeros off. The weight reduction was actually so extreme that even the bomb sights were replaced with lightweight basic aimers designed by one of the crew members, as they were going in so low that precision bombing equipment was unnecessary. Now, despite what Michael Bay would have you believe, the Army Air Corps did not transfer their Hawaiian-based fighter pilots, which for some reason included a commissioned RAF officer, to a special forces unit under Doolittle's sole command. Rather, they selected the best crews from the 17th Bombardment Group, who had been the first group to receive the B-25 in operational strength. Funny thing that, instead of sending a bunch of P-40 jocks with no hours on twin engine, or any serious IFR training for long distance over water or at night, they sent, funnily enough, bomber pilots. The guys with the most experience on the airframe, led by America's best test pilot. It's incredible how that works. Quite frankly, to break character for a sec, this is the only part of that movie I really got irritated by. All of it was perfectly good, if a bit cheesy, with Hollywood bullshit dialogue up to that point, and the flying sequences were awesome, but this is when they jumped the shark. It was completely ridiculous. That said, it was nice that the Blue Ghost, USS Lexington, CV-16, got a cameo as USS Hornet. Anyway, back to business. With the planes ready and the pilots chosen, they loaded aboard Hornet in Alameda, California, and sailed to meet Enterprise and her task force. Their targets were Tokyo, Yokohama, Kobe, and Nagoya. Once their bombs were safely delivered to their intended destination, the raiders were to haul ass to nationalist China as fast and as low as they could go, with the hope that maybe, just maybe, they'll get away with it. And so Enterprise, and her now very heavily armed little sister, sallied forth into Japanese territorial waters, deep behind enemy lines. Enterprise's air group was providing both scouting and the fighter cap for the mission, as Hornet's flight deck was filled with her precious cargo, and therefore unusable. The mission went completely without a hitch. Everything was going to plan, and it was fully on schedule. Until on the 18th of April, with the task force still en route to their launch point, located 500 miles from Japan, the Americans were spotted by the Japanese picket ship Nito Maru who immediately radioed Japanese fleet headquarters with an attack warning. It was the only action they would manage as very soon after USS Nashville literally immolated her with point-blank gunfire, picking up only five survivors from the water. The Americans knew their cover was blown at this point, and after checking their charts, Doolittle and Hornet's captain realized that they were 200 miles further out from their launch point than they were supposed to be. They had a choice. Attempt to close in on Japan according to their original plan, running the risk of losing their task force to ensure the survival of the raiders. This was a possible option. It was going to take some time for the Japanese to get a force ready to attack. However, that's operating on the assumption that they were in port under resupply or refit. If Kido Butai is at sea, they could very well turn around and attack within 24 hours, resulting in the loss of two-thirds of the US Navy's combat power in a single battle. The other option was, of course, to launch immediately, on what would most likely be a one-way trip for most of the Raiders. Doolittle didn't hesitate for a single second. They were going to launch and take their chances. It was better to risk a handful of bombers rather than the US's most important operational assets, and it was this decision that he relayed to his pilots. 
However, they hadn't signed up for a suicide mission, which was now what this was most likely going to be. They had a choice. They could go, or they could step out. They could not be ordered to do what they were now asked to do. Every single man stepped forward. USS Hornet turned into the wind, going at flank speed. The engines were going so hard, the prop shafts would probably shake the screws if it kept going for very long. Doolittle had his brakes hard down, and he had pushed the balls all the way to the wall. He was waiting for the signal to launch. He would get it a second later, as the shooter dropped to the deck with his flag outstretched. The brakes came off, and away he went. Enterprise's crew, on their flight deck, watch dumbfounded as this fat, heavy, plainly ridiculous army bomber somehow lurched into the air off of Hornet's deck. Doolittle was immediately followed by the other B-25s, bearing names like Whiskey Pete, Bat Outta Hell, Whirling Dervish, and The Avenger. And to the rapturous cheers of all present, every single one of the bombers made it safely into the air. By midday on April 18th, the B-25 formation came sweeping in over Tokyo Bay at 1,500 feet. Which, for a bomber formation, is practically on the deck, given terrain, bomb arming distance, and enemy defences. The Japanese populace, meanwhile, treated it as just another air raid drill, and no serious alarm went out. The sirens rang and everyone just carried on with their day. What finally got them moving was the sudden barking of anti-aircraft guns. Rolling in over their targets, the Americans released their bomb loads, and miraculously, all of the raiders hit their intended targets except two. One of them had to jettison their bombs due to their defensive armament failing while under attack from Japanese fighters. The other didn't hit their target because they had spotted a better one. The unfinished aircraft carrier Ryuho was sitting in dry dock and they saw it. Mine. They seriously damaged her, blowing her to bits, delaying its launching by six months. With their mission complete, they continued on their exfil route to China. However, not all of them would make it. One crew landed in Vladivostok, and as the USSR was technically neutral in the Pacific War, the crew was interned. Thankfully, the NKVD, the forerunners to the KGB, helped them escape from the... Hey. Hey, what are you doing? Hey! Get your hands off! Get your... I'm on your side! Have you seen my hat? Get your hands! Get your fucking... Get off! The camp guards were bribed by filthy capitalist pilots, and through their lying capitalist scumbag means, they got all the way across the Soviet Union and into the British Embassy in Iran with absolutely no help from the Soviet state or any agency of her government. There was no Soviet involvement in escape of American prisoners. Never. Full stop. The rest of the raiders got away cleanly to China. But due to their mission being compromised, Admiral Halsey wasn't able to transmit the raid signal to Allied airfields in China so they could set up beacons to help guide the bombers into land. As such, all the aircraft had to be abandoned. This, sadly, resulted in the capture of eight of the raiders by the Japanese, who promptly beheaded the three most senior men, while imprisoning and torturing the remaining five. Another three men were killed in action, while the remaining raiders escaped safely into nationalist China. Given they had lost all of their aircraft and a good number of his men were either captured or killed, Doolittle considered his mission to be most likely a failure. However, in actuality, it was an incredible success. The damage done to the Japanese in a material sense had been minimal, but the boost to US morale and fighting spirit was immense. However, even more a key factor was Japan's response, which was... Oh no, you fucking did it. Yep. Although, unfortunately, I wish I could keep the humorous tone going, but I'm 
Gonna have to get serious for a second. After the Doolittle raid was completed, the Japanese decided they were going to take measures. The first order of business for the Japanese was the aforementioned execution of the senior prisoners of war. However, as retribution for the attack on their homeland, they considered the Chinese people complicit in the raid for harbouring the escapees, and as such, accessories to what they considered the murder of Japanese civilians. 10,000 Chinese civilians were killed during the search for the escaped US airmen. And later, another 100,000 were killed in reprisal after it was confirmed that the prisoners of wars they had were the only prisoners they were going to get. But they didn't stop there. Upon confirming that Doolittle had escaped and witnessing the resurgence of American morale as a result of his daring mission, the Japanese deployed an experimental warfare unit, designated Unit 731, from the Kwantung Army who on the orders of the Japanese High Command and most likely with the full knowledge of the civilian government, deployed biological weapons against the Chinese people, including weaponized variants of typhoid, cholera, and most barbaric of all, the bubonic plague. This made Japan the first nation-state in World War II to use weapons of mass destruction, including chemical and biological weapons resulting in the deaths of between 250,000 and half a million innocent men, women and children. But given the rural and underdeveloped nature of China at the time, the data would be incomplete and so the count was most likely much higher. At minimum at least, it was confirmed 360,000 people were murdered in cold blood. Which, in case you're counting, is 150,000 more people than would be killed in the atomic bombings in 1945. And all of that as a result of nuisance raids that killed 50 Japanese citizens, most of them being workers in arms manufactories. In any case, this, while a tragic and, to be quite frank, obscenely evil event, was not the most important result of the Doolittle Raid. The most important result was that the Japanese navy had been dishonoured. The Emperor's palace had very nearly been bombed with the Imperial family inside, and it was they who were primarily responsible for defending it against attack. Admiral Yamamoto and the Japanese naval staff had originally intended to have a defensive perimeter established to prevent any such attacks from being possible. However, it was evident that the current defences were not up to the task and as such a new defensive line must be formed, along with the neutralization of Hawaii. But most importantly of all, the American aircraft carriers had to be drawn to battle and utterly annihilated. Only then could the honour of the Navy be restored and Japan's safety assured. It was decided that once their campaigns in the South Pacific came to an end, all of Japan's naval might would be brought to bear for the Kantai Kesen, the decisive battle. And as US codebreakers listened intently, the same name kept cropping up. Target AF. Something part of a larger operation. An operation codenamed MI. We of course know it by its real name. <laughs> As Enterprise and Hornet exited Japanese waters on their way back to Pearl Harbor, their crews had no idea the shitstorm they had just caused. The Imperial Japanese Navy was apoplectic and running rampant to hit back as soon as possible. Admiral Yamamoto was planning Operation MI and getting ready to force the Americans to battle. However, the next major battle would not involve Kido Butai or Enterprise. It would instead be a clash of the old hands versus the rookies. USS Yorktown and USS Lexington were covering Allied forces in the South Pacific against further operations by the Japanese in New Guinea. The Japanese army had occupied the northern half of the island during their opening phase of the war. However, they had run headlong into the Anzacs. And given that it was Erwin Rommel who said, I would use Australians to invade hell and New Zealanders to hold it, 
you can probably guess how well that was going for them. For the record, yes, I am damn fucking patriotic about these men. Given that us Aussies were doing our specialty in war, that being a royal pain in the ass despite our limited numbers, the Japanese High Command had resolved in early April to build a task force to invade Port Moresby, which was the primary supply port and headquarters area for Australian forces operating in the region. Kido Butai had struck Darwin as well as other key targets in the area before being recalled to Japan, and so holding this position was vital. With Midway coming up, however, the Imperial Japanese Navy did not want to take too long with this operation, especially in the wake of the Doolittle Raid. As such, they ordered Carrier Division 5, Shokaku and Zuikaku, their fastest and most modern carriers, to lead the task force on Operation MO, the invasion of Port Moresby, and the conquest of New Guinea. If this mission is successful, the more modern carriers could use their extra speed and sail back at flank speed to Japanese waters to rejoin Kido Butai for the showdown with the American fleet. With their orders clear and their invasion force assembled, the Japanese set off. However, as we have established before, the Office of Naval Signal Intelligence was also listening to Japanese communications, and having picked up the order of battle as well as the assembly of an invasion fleet, Nimitz and his team deduced that Port Moresby was their most likely target, given that the intel specifically indicated a South Pacific objective. To that end, all US carriers able to sortie were given orders to do so, including Enterprise and Hornet, who immediately set sail at top speed. But before they could arrive, battle commenced. The Japanese had planned a double assault on both the Solomon Islands and New Guinea itself and on the 3rd of May a Japanese invasion force landed on the island of Tulagi. They were met by an Australian garrison who gave the Japanese a serious bloody nose, but with two fleet carriers and superior numbers they had no chance of victory. But in launching this attack the Japanese had directly signalled exactly where they were, and in the coming days this was confirmed by recon assets from the US Navy, the United States Army Air Force, and the Royal Australian Air Force. And so, to the absolute disbelief of the senior officers aboard the Japanese carriers, the Americans made their presence known in the American style. Hi, welcome to Chile. What followed was a battle of brutal intensity. It had all the dimensions of a particularly nasty sword duel. Move and counter move, thrust and repost. As I'm not covering one of the participants, I won't go into too fine a detail here. But it has to be said that if one phrase was to describe it, the best choice of words would be a slugfest. From the 7th of May to the 9th, both task forces hammered each other with a series of successive blows. The Americans obliterated the light carrier Shoho with a ferocious coordinated attack from both SPDs and Devastators while the Japanese air groups savaged the USS Lexington, rendering her dead in the water. In reprisal, the Americans launched an all-out assault on Shokaku, who suffered terrible damage when two 1,000-pound bombs tore open her forecastle and her flight deck, thus preventing flight operations. Enraged at this development, Zuikaku and her aviators launched a ferocious attack on USS Yorktown. One bomb penetrated her flight deck, right into the bows of the ship, causing critical damage, while as many as 12 near misses ruptured her hull below the waterline. However, the Japanese paid a high price as Zuikaku's air group was savaged, having to run through the entirety of both Lexington and Yorktown's combat air patrols, as well as the SBDs, who had finished their bomb runs and were now playing interceptor as they couldn't land while their ships were under attack. They were also, uh, I can imagine, kind of mad. By the end of the battle, both sides had either run out of young men to sacrifice, or couldn't launch aircraft at all. The Japanese had lost Shoho completely, while both Zuikaku and Shokaku had been critically damaged, one of them with her air group destroyed, the other unable to launch due to damages to her deck. The Americans meanwhile watched on helplessly, as USS Lexington burned until eventually she exploded, sinking into the abyss while USS Yorktown limped away from the scene of devastation, 
hanging on through the sheer grit and determination of her damage control teams, which were aided by the survivors of USS Lexington, who miraculously were almost the full ship's company. Everyone had made it, just about. All in all, the US lost more ships in this battle, as well as the loss of a capital ship. It was a costly tactical defeat. Enterprise and Hornet could not reach the area in time to prevent it. That said, it was an operational and strategic victory for the United States. Port Moresby was secure from invasion, and Kido Butai would not have access to its two most powerful aircraft carriers. The Japanese force on New Guinea would be forced to fight head-to-head over land against the Australian defenders. This would result in the disastrous Kokoda Trail campaign and the Battle of Milne Bay, where the Japanese suffered their first defeat on land at the hands of the Royal Australian Air Force and the Australian Army. However, at the time, this battle felt like what in reality it was. A draw. Worse still, the crew of USS Enterprise and Hornet arrived at the scene to find their big sister in a horrific state, while of Lexington there was no sign. The threat of invasion was still a real possibility, and with this in mind, Enterprise and Hornet took up defensive positions in case of another assault. Washington and the Department of the Navy were convinced that Japanese honour would not allow for a slight like this, and that another attempt on Port Moresby was likely. Other potential options could be an assault down the Solomon's Island chain, with an attempt at taking American Samoa, thereby isolating Australia and cutting the Americans off from their main staging base for future operations in the South Pacific. The guys at ONSI, meanwhile, thought that the target was most likely to be a critical installation in the Eastern Pacific, which the US Navy would be forced to defend. This was strongly championed by an intelligence officer by the name of Edwin Layton, who was respected and trusted by both the former commander of Pack Fleet, Admiral Kimmel, and its current commander, Admiral Nimitz. However, they weren't sure which base the Japanese were going to attack, and until they had that information, Enterprise and Hornet were to stay where they were. Yeah, look, that's not going to happen. we got to remember, Admiral Halsey is in charge of this formation. And Admiral Halsey's orders stated that they could change their area of operations if they were spotted by the Japanese. And given that Halsey concurred with Nimitz that the target for the next Japanese attack was in the Eastern Pacific, he immediately went and found a Japanese surface picket and attacked it. Can you imagine that radio call? Oh no, uh, they've spotted us. I, I guess we better leave. Uh, I'm heading back to Pearl, taking Hornet with me. Goodbye! At the same time those shenanigans were happening, ONSI hatched a plot for some shenanigans of their own. They sent a coded message to the men at the station they thought was the target. Soon, the Japanese reported that Target AF broadcasted in the clear that their water purification plant had broken down. The signals team at Midway Island were slightly confused as to why they were asked to make that transmission by the Intel weenies. That is until a few days later when they suddenly got a wave of transfer reports and shipping manifests. It seemed that the entirety of both the Navy and the Army Air Corps were being deployed to Midway all of a sudden. And it wouldn't take a genius to work out why. This was, in the words of science fiction's greatest admiral, It's a trap! Come on, guys. It's the same battle. You can use the same joke. Right? Anyway. The ONSI, if you will permit a vulgar expression, had Yamamoto by the balls. Literally. Almost. Or at least they would later. Hypo, the intelligence team based at Pearl, was decrypting pretty much everything coming their way. And what they were getting was intelligence gold. In a habit that would eventually lead to his death, Admiral Yamamoto was a stickler for regulation, procedure, and above all, planning. He was scrupulous in detail, and hence everything had to be done to his exact specification. The reason this got him killed is because he had a habit of transmitting his itinerary on inspection tours, which of course got decoded by Hypo, which in turn the US Army Air Force used to hunt him down and kill him with the aid of Charles Lindbergh and a squadron of P-38. But that's a tale for another time. Point is, the entirety of Operation MI was being transmitted and wired 
to all the ships taking part preemptively. The reason being is that in order to fool the Americans' recon and spy assets, the Japanese Navy had split the operation's forces into little task groups across the Empire to make it look like they were either planning for a defense or maybe another big operation to strike south, and so they couldn't have a full-scale fleet briefing with all senior officers present and hard copies distributed. Furthermore, once they set sail, they had to be under strict radio silence to prevent detection, so the entire plan had to be transmitted wirelessly to all ships prior to mission start. So in a beautiful twist of poetic irony, the Japanese were ultimately undone by being too careful. By the time Admiral Nimitz got a hold of the complete intelligence report, he had the entire Japanese order of battle, the target, the Japanese dispositions of their task forces, and even the date of the attack, right down to the hour of launch and the line of bearing it would come from. The Japanese outnumbered the Americans. They only had two aircraft carriers and an airfield. Granted, it was a really big airfield, but the Japanese had four fleet carriers, light support carriers, and battleships, not to mention all these support vessels to go with them. But, with the intel that Nimitz had, he knew they were going to be split up amongst four task forces. The invasion fleet, the battleship fleet, the destroyer and submarine screen, and Kido Butai itself. The battleships and invasion fleets were too slow to keep up with Kido Butai and the defensive screen, and those in turn would have to have a heavy recon AA and ASW presence to keep the Japanese flagship <laughs> safe which means that Kido Butai wouldn't have the huge cadre of support ships she normally would. If the US Navy could mass everything it had into one apocalyptic ambush, maybe, just maybe, they could initiate a defeat in detail Napoleon style. It was a gamble. A huge one. If they fucked this up, Every fleet carrier in the Pacific, as well as a solid chunk of their air assets, would be wiped out in a single engagement. But on the other hand, if they pulled it off, it would reverse the entire course of the war, and put the Americans on the attack. I know it sounds dramatic, and I know it sounds I'm hyping it up bigger than it was, because the Americans would, let's be real, honestly win in the end. But history as we know it was hanging in the balance here. There was big shit on the line. Nimitz was quite literally betting the future of the American war effort for the foreseeable future on one roll of the dice. But in the words of science fiction's other greatest admiral, Sometimes you have to roll the hard six. So say we all. As Kido Butai slipped out of its anchorage and the Japanese armada prepared to make way, Nimitz gave the order. Enterprise and Hornet were to sail, and in his words, hold midway while inflicting maximum damage onto the enemy with strong attrition tactics. On the 28th of May, the American fleet left Pearl Harbor. At its head was Enterprise with Raymond Spruance, Admiral Commanding. He had relieved Halsey as he was suffering from severe ill health. While this was happening... The radar teams aboard ship could see aircraft formations heading along their line of bearing out to Midway Island by the shitload. By June 3rd, the Americans had concentrated four squadrons of PBY Catalina flying boats, long-range, armed recon that could carry either torpedoes or depth charges for ASW. They had a squadron of B-17 flying fortresses, capable of long-range carpet bombing strikes on the opposing Japanese fleet while a squadron of B-26 Marauder medium bombers were provided for low-level anti-shipping and level bombing strikes. There were also two squadrons of dive bombers, one of SBD Dauntlesses and another one of outdated SB-2U Vindicators. They had also two squadrons of fighters, one of F-4F Wildcats and one of F-2A Buffaloes. And to round off this veritable armada of aircraft was the latest weapon in the American arsenal, the new TBF Avenger Torpedo Bomber, assigned to the forward element of Hornet's Torpedo Squadron, Torpedo 8. All in all, there were 126 aircraft on Midway Island, a welcome asset to Nimitz's force, 
but they were still outnumbered. Or so Enterprise's crew thought. As they hit the halfway point, the task force turned slightly northwest and slowed to rendezvous with the rest of their surface force. And that was when they saw her. Sailing proudly amongst the motley crew of old cruisers and refitted destroyers was none other than their big sister, USS Yorktown. The repair team from none other than USS Vestal had joined forces with what was, and this is not an exaggeration, the entire naval engineering team at Pearl Harbor. Thousands upon thousands of men, everyone from CBs to yardsmen, had somehow, by some miracle, managed to repair and restore and sail Yorktown in 72 hours. It was truly a miraculous achievement, worthy of an entire video to itself. If Drakinafel hasn't done one, I'll do one. This shit was nuts. Even as she was sailing into harm's way, the crew of USS Vestal had stayed behind to make sure she was ready to fight. Even the air group was a scratch team. The remnants of every shattered and reforming air group in the Pacific were brought together under the legendary Jimmy Thatch inventor of the thatch weave, a maneuver which had allowed the inferior wildcat to turn the tables on the infamous Zeros through good teamwork and the outstanding resilience of Grumman-designed aircraft. Enterprise and Hornet must have felt it. Their big sister would never let them go into harm's way without her, and together, all three of them, along with Midway's team, the Americans were, for the first time ever, on even terms with their enemy. And this time, it was they who had the drop on them. You got to know when to hold them. Know when to fold them. Know when to walk away. Know when to run. As the Japanese drew closer, it was though they were almost like a spectre in the void. The Americans knew they were there. They knew they were coming. But in a pattern that would soon become all too familiar to their ground troops, the Japanese had this unnerving habit of appearing from thin air and just as quickly vanishing. But not this time, resolved Admiral Spruins. He was going to see him first. Ordering recon efforts to maximum, the Americans had a plane for every patch of ocean within range. And they were looking for the enemy they knew was out there. Even the act of being in an ambush position saved Nimitz's men trouble as they had deployed beyond the Japanese recon screen of submarines before they were in place. Hence, as far as Nagumo and Yamamoto knew, the Americans were completely unaware of their plan. But let us not forget that this is the Yanks we're talking about. And even when they are laying ambushes, my colonial brothers and sisters, ironically, given the ship's name we're discussing, they have a habit not unlike Klingons. As we have established, Americans like to announce themselves violently. On June 3rd, a PBY flown by Ensign Jack Reed of VP-44 spotted the Japanese invasion force to the southwest of Midway. However, given the distance and the tension of the upcoming action, the ships were incorrectly identified as the Japanese main force. Upon getting this information, the Midway kitchen sink could be seen being loaded into one of the old artillery pieces on the island, while the cooks and the cleaners were sharpening sticks in the corner. Everything else was currently in the process of being thrown at the oncoming attackers. At 15.30 on June 3rd, 1942, the B-17 squadron from Midway attacked the invasion force. But despite their fancy Norden bomb sites, bombing a moving target accurately from height would not be possible for another 40 years until the invention of the modern GBU. However, the Navy successfully attacked one of the supporting tanker ships, the Akabona Maru, crippling her, incredibly, with a torpedo launched from a PBY. This, depressingly, would be the only successful torpedo attack during the whole battle, due to the uh, American torpedoes at this stage suffering uh, a big problem known as not working at all or at least rarely. But we mustn't get ahead of ourselves, as June 4th 
is dawning. That said, if you want to know the full story, you're going to have to watch my video on Akagi, who, as we speak, is preparing to launch the first wave of aircraft at Midway. Meanwhile, the Yorktown sisters were slinking into position to the northeast of the Japanese task force. Their aircraft and pilots were also warming up for action. All they needed now was a target, and they would soon get one. The PBY squadrons at Midway sortied at first light, scouting the surrounding area for the enemy task force, which they knew was approaching. After a mere hour of scouting, one of the Catalinas called in their sighting report. They had finally found Kido Butai, with confirmed eyes on Akagi and Kaga turning out of the wind. That must mean, of course, that the Japanese had already launched, which was confirmed by another PBY when he sighted a huge force of aircraft, numbering over a hundred. Midway's bombers had begun launching as soon as word was passed down of the carrier group. When radar finally picked up the incoming raid, the fighters launched also, climbing as hard as they could for precious altitude. Their fighters couldn't tangle with the Zeros. Slashing attacks would have to be the order of the day. But 20 Buffaloes and 6 Wildcats. These aircraft were not exactly known for their climbing prowess. They had managed to get organised above Midway in time to be co-altitude with the Japanese strike force. It was now 6am on June 4th, 1942. And it was now that the Battle of Midway began. The American fighters, unable to secure the height advantage they needed, now did the only thing they could do. They armed their guns and went head-on straight into the middle of the Japanese formation. In an act of near-suicidal bravery and defiance, the American aviators blasted a hole in the Japanese attack, shooting down four B-5Ns and one of the Zeros assigned a close escort. But as their attack passed through the formation and out to the rear, they had placed themselves directly under the Japanese top cover. The elite of Japan's naval aviators, the Akagi Fighter Group, descended on the Americans with a fury akin to a god. Two wildcats and 13 buffaloes were shot down within minutes, and while the other fighters were crippled, by the end of the engagement, only two of Midway's fighters were still flyable. At first glance, it would appear that the Japanese would take round one. However, after the bombers had flattened the airfield and strafed the defending ground forces, the Japanese raid leader, who was the commander of Hiryu's air wing, noted that there was no aircraft actually on the airfield, and that the Americans had reinforced in preparation for a heavy attack. In fact, the fighters were at the same altitude as them, it was just dawning on him what was happening. But he had a job to do. He signalled Nagamo, recommending a second attack as their first attack, it was obvious, had not been sufficient to knock out the airfield or the garrison. He also noted that the bomber aircraft they knew to be based here were nowhere to be found. However, this signal was practically irrelevant to Nagamo as he could solve that mystery immediately. All he had to do was look up. At 7.10, Torpedo 8's flight of Avengers attacked Kido Butai along with the B-26s of 18th Recon and 69th Bomb Squadron. A total force of 10 aircraft versus what amounted to Japan's entire fleet carrier strength. It was, like with the fighters, an act of suicidal heroism. The TBFs initiated their torpedo attack, However, the Japanese combat air patrol spotted them, and using their superior altitude and speed, they quickly closed in on the hapless Avengers. Despite the upgraded defensive armament on the Avengers, including a hydraulic turret and a ventral gun, this wasn't much good when on the attack run. They had to stay straight and level while maintaining a slower speed than normal. The Zeros, predictably, tore them to shreds, with only one Avenger surviving to return to base. The rest of them went down with their crews. The B-26s had better luck, but the seamanship of Kido Butai's helmsmen prevented any serious damage. At this point, First Lieutenant James Murray, commanding the B-26 Suzy Q, turned around after dropping his ordnance, and witnessing have no effect, 
decided to fly his aircraft directly at the flagship Akagi. His nose gunner could see the faces of the astonished Japanese crew beneath him as he unloaded his machine gun at them. The Japanese cap tried to engage him, but due to his proximity to the Akagi and the other ships, they couldn't risk firing for hitting their own men. It was then that one of the other B-26s who had followed him into this hair-raising manoeuvre was critically damaged. Under no illusions as to how they would be treated as prisoners of war, he aimed his bomber at Akagi's bridge, hoping to, in a tinge of dark irony, conduct a kamikaze strike. It was by the narrowest of margins that he missed, most likely due to control failure. And the bad news for Nagamo was only compounding, as this attack was going on, Admirals Fletcher and Spruance were beginning to take action. However, things were a bit tricky for the Americans, as their launch operations were complicated by the direction of the wind. To launch aircraft from carriers requires sufficiently high enough speed on launch to ensure the aircraft have enough speed to lift and get airborne. Due to the direction of the wind, the Americans would have to sail away from the Japanese to launch. And so despite knowing the Japanese position for the past few hours, they were only just close enough to launch at 7am. And this was at a considerable range, which made fuel economy a bit on the tight side. This caused two issues. First, the possibility of suffering losses due to running out of fuel. And second, due to this lack of fuel, it did not allow for an assembly period, meaning they would have to proceed onto target as soon as their group was launched. However, Spruance considered it vital that the pressure on the Japanese needed to be maintained. The longer they spent dodging torpedoes and bombs meant the less time to prepare another wave of aircraft or the recovery of their midway force. If they could throw them off enough, it would give them an opening to properly hit them. But if it didn't work, they would be without an air group and staring down four fleet carriers, fully aware of their presence. It was yet another gamble from the land of the free. But like the Rubicon, they had crossed the Pacific and the die was cast. Enterprise and her little sister began launching their planes. The Devastators took off first, forming up at low altitude for their intended torpedo attacks. They immediately turned on target, while the SBDs and Wildcats gained height. It was at this moment that the radar aboard Enterprise reported a singular air contact near the carrier group, flying a search pad. Almost as soon as this report was made, the contact receded at high speed away. Japanese scout. And he spotted us. Well, shit. This day just became a whole lot more interesting. Meanwhile, back above Kido Butai, it seemed to the Japanese that the sky was raining aircraft. The dive bombers from Midway began their attack. However, their level of experience and training was not equal to that of the frontline Navy squadrons aboard the carriers. It was a mixture of marine pilots trained for close air support and a brand new crop of pilots fresh out of flight school. Their commander was an experienced aviator, Major Lofton Henderson, US Marine Corps. He led his men fiercely into the middle of the Japanese formation, but courage is not enough when faced with odds this long, especially against the best naval aviators in the world at the time. Between flak and the zeros on cap, the Americans achieved no hits on any of the enemy ships and were subsequently slaughtered, with 10 out of 26 being shot down, including Major Henderson himself. The rest of the flight being severely damaged, with several more being write-offs. At the same time, the B-17s from Midway had climbed to their optimal bombing height and began their runs, but yet again, strategic bombing proved ineffective. So far, things had been going well for the Japanese, but with reports of American carriers now coming in, the situation was deteriorating. The constant attacks had achieved their goal, however. They were too busy parrying blows to enact launch or recovery operations. As if to punctuate that very point, it was soon reported that an American submarine, USS Nautilus, had been sighted inside the task force perimeter. Nautilus, like the absolute queen she is, had managed to stealth past the entire Japanese picket line 
during all the chaos up topside. She then commenced an attack on the battlecruiser Kirishima. However, as is becoming a theme, the American torpedoes misfired. One went erratic while the other failed to launch. Little did she know, however, that Little Nautilus may have just won the Pacific War for the United States, at least a year earlier than it would have taken otherwise had she not launched this attack. The Japanese destroyer Arashi, seeing the missing torpedo, followed it back to the periscope and immediately charged after Nautilus, who would in turn dive to evade. Arashi was ordered to pin down the submarine while the rest of the fleet could break away northeast to safety. What followed was an insane game of cat and mouse with Nautilus evading and then attacking another cruiser and then evading again, all while Arashi was pursuing her. And it was now, at 9.25am, that the Yorktown sisters finally joined the fight. The Devastators from both Hornet and Enterprise sighted Kido Butai and moved to engage. However, due to the extreme range and their needing to climb to maintain height, as well as receiving conflicting bearings to the target, the Wildcats detailed to cover them had to turn back. The turn northeast by Nagumo, along with bad luck, had stripped the attackers of their protection. They would have to run the gauntlet of Kido Butai's cap, which had been reinforced since the recovery of the Midway Force. Torpedo 8 went in first, initiating a torpedo run on Akagi. But before they could even coordinate their attack, the Zeros of Akagi's air group, rearmed and refueled, descended upon them in a fury. Of the entirety of Hornet's torpedo squadron, only one man, Ensign George Gay, survived this attack, left floating in the water in the middle of Kido Butai after ditching his crippled aircraft. The rest of his unit having been torn to shreds by the Zeros and AAA. Torpedo 6 under Lieutenant Commander Eugene Lindsay would suffer the same fate, with Lindsay himself being killed along with the loss of nine other aircraft. The other four Devastators returned to base, barely flyable and beyond any hope of repair. And all of this loss of life, all of these aircraft, with no damage of any kind being done to the enemy. It was into this maelstrom that Yorktown's torpedo squadron attacked half an hour later at 10.10, and they fared no better. Yorktown, under the command of Admiral Fletcher, had waited for Spruance's force to launch before launching his. He wanted confirmation of his own recon reports to ensure a successful attack. However, without the massive numbers from the other two squadrons to split the defences, the concentrated wrath of all the AAA and fighters descended upon them. Ten out of the twelve Yorktown aircraft went down without a single torpedo being deployed successfully, while damage to the two survivors was extensive. In the span of half an hour, the entire cadre of experienced torpedo squadron pilots in the US Navy had been wiped out. A wealth of talent and experience essentially wasted. It was the worst moment in US naval aviation history. But it had achieved something. Having been forced to intercept the torpedo attacks, a substantial number of the Japanese cap had to land and rearm, while others had to return to patrol altitude and reorganize. The cap couldn't be refreshed and recovery operations conducted while under constant barrage and the violent manoeuvring had hampered rearming efforts aboard the Japanese ships. While all this was going on, the American dive bomber force was running into difficulties of a different kind. And to people in aviation, it was a problem as old as time. What about you guys? We ain't found shit! Wade McCluskey, the leader of the Enterprise Air Group and Raid Commander, had flown to the coordinates provided by the recon units earlier in the day. But since Nagamo had broken out to the northeast, they were no longer anywhere to be found. They continued to search Patton towards Midway, and then back towards their own ships, and not a single Japanese vessel could be seen. Gas was low, and time short. It was then below them they saw the wake of a ship moving at flank speed. 
A Japanese destroyer was hauling ass like nothing else in the water that day. And it was then that it dawned on McCluskey that there would be only one reason for a ship to move that way. He was trying to get somewhere in a hurry, regardless of fuel or maintenance concerns. That meant orders, or a crisis needing all hands. Both of which would come from a task force commander. The Japanese destroyer Arashi had finally forced Nautilus away from the fleet, and with that achieved, was proceeding at full speed to rejoin the formation. The American dive bombers followed her line of bearing, and on the horizon, they saw their quarry. At 10.25, the SBDs arrived over Kido Butai, and they could not believe their luck. The Japanese cap was under strength and on the other side of their patrol beat. The cruisers and battleships, which would normally lend a large amount of heavy flak at higher altitudes to counter dive bombers, were busy protecting. <laughs> and the invasion fleet to the west. And unbeknownst to them, the entirety of the Japanese air group was currently being fully fueled and rearmed in their fully enclosed hangars below decks. So any one hit, any single hit on their flight decks, would turn their carriers into what amounted to a fuel air bomb. It was incredible. After a morning of pure catastrophe, Karma and the gods had decided to place all the Americans' luck into a single moment. All they had to do was seize it. And the men of USS Enterprise never miss an opportunity. The senior officers aboard the Japanese ships watched in absolute horror as the formation of 47 SPD Dauntlesses began their attack run. Through the hail of light anti-aircraft fire, McCluskey lined up on Kaga, he actually made a mistake as Doctrine was to detail attack by squadrons with the lead going for the target further away and working backwards. As such, McCluskey's pilots followed their leader, while the other unit duly lined up on the rear carrier. Therefore, the entirety of Enterprise's air group was now descending like the Hammer of God onto one target. Realising this mistake, however, Richard H. Best dick best to his friends, commanding VB-6, broke off his run with his wingmen right behind, and the three SBDs headed towards the far carrier, Akagi. As they looked over their shoulders, they beheld the awe-inspiring sight of 27 dive bombers hitting one carrier, and judged rightly that Kaga was doomed. In a rather beautiful twist of fate which adds a poetic justice to the story, the killing blow against Kaga was the impact of one 500-pound bomb on the carrier's island, and two more 100-pounders hitting the parked aircraft on the foredeck. These impacts paralyzed Kaga's damage control effort while starting a fire in the bow area which quickly went out of control. Combined with the other hits along the flight deck, Kaga was a doomed ship. What made this poetic was that the bombs which took out the island and set fire to the forward section were dropped by none other than Lieutenant Clarence E. Dickinson. The man who sunk the first Japanese fleet class vessel in World War II for the United States with his demolition of the ship's command staff now also held the title for the first American naval aviator to sink a Japanese fleet class carrier. However, his good friend Dick Best would one-up him by the end of the day. Best and his two wingmen were at this very same moment hurtling down into a hair-raising dive on Kido Butai's flagship. While the force attacking Kaga had mass numbers to disperse the AA, there were only three aircraft on this attack run. To call it running the gauntlet is putting it mildly, but the Americans pressed forward. The first two bombs were dropped by Best's wingmen. The first one whizzed down and impacted starboard very close, causing serious shock damage, while the second one splashed down away aft, shattering the rudder. Richard Halsey Best, however, was a man with balls of pure diamond, and held his aim, riding the line down and down until eventually 
He gripped his release lever, and the trapeze swung his bomb free. The bomb struck the middle elevator on Akagi's deck and went straight into the middle of her hangar bay, detonating amongst a flight of fully armed and fueled B5Ns. Akagi simply immolated along her upper hangar deck, with explosion after explosion rocking the ship. And as though there was some sisterly rivalry, the squadron of bombers from USS Yorktown did not want to be left out either. As the Enterprise boys made their famous death dive, VB-3 dove in on Sordiu, with their commander Max Leslie leading them in, and with the crisp professionalism Yorktown was famous for, scored three hits, dead center, resulting in an inferno. In the span of six short minutes, Akagi, Kaga, and Soryu were alight from bow to stern, with secondary explosions constantly rippling throughout their shattered hangar decks. While their hulls were intact and easily afloat, the damage to their interiors was just too severe. Their air groups lay burning in the hangars along with their pilots in their ready rooms. The scale of the catastrophe was beyond anything the Japanese Navy had experienced since the failure of their invasion of Korea at the hands of Admiral Yi Sun Sin over 300 years previously. Admiral Nagumo abandoned ship, muttering to himself in traumatized disbelief. And while I'm not generally the judgmental sort, if there was any man who needed to go down with his ship as a matter of honor, this man was it. However, a better man than him would honor that debt later. Admiral Tamon Yamaguchi did not hesitate for a second. Having signaled Nagumo time and time again to take decisive action against the American task force, from the moment it had been sighted, Yamaguchi had been ordered to stand down and rearm his planes back to torpedoes from ground ordnance. This decision had, through a myriad of circumstances, which you can see in detail in my Akagi video, meant that the Japanese air groups were rearming at the time the SPDs had shown up, resulting in the loss of almost the entire force. The only capable air group left was Yamaguchi's aboard Hiryu. The sighting report they had received earlier should still be semi-accurate, and it was Yorktown they had seen. The honor of the Japanese Navy was at stake. The entire honor of Japan was at stake. And a man like Yamaguchi would never let such a moment stand. Ordering the task force to make a direct heading towards the American fleet, he would close with Hiryu, giving his pilots the most fuel and initial launch speed he could, while closing the distance so his superior destroyers and cruisers could get in range. Like the samurai of old with katanas drawn, the remnants of Kido Butai, with rage in their heart, charged towards the enemy, determined for a violent last stand. force was returning to base. Their losses had been brutal with maybe half the SPDs returning in a serviceable condition. 
But as they began entering the pattern, the fleet's AAA opened up with a vengeance. The American pilots swiveled their heads to see what they were shooting at, only for their hearts to sink. Hiryu's first deck load strike of 18 vowels and six zeros had tailed the returning aircraft back to their carriers and had now commenced a ferocious attack. The men of Hiryu's air group were elites. While Akagi and Kaga had been renowned throughout the Air Corps as torpedo specialists, it was Hiryu and Zuikaku who were famous for their dive bombers. Yamaguchi's pilots pressed the attack with a fury. The American Combat Air Patrol desperately tried to fend them off. They shot through the escorting Zeros, downing three for the loss of one Wildcat, and once through the fighters, they then tore into the bombers. Eleven of the 18 Vows were cut down by the Yorktown sisters, with two more falling to the AAA, but the remaining five pressed their attack. The Japanese held their dives to an almost suicidal altitude. They couldn't miss. Three direct hits tore through USS Yorktown, while two near misses caused critical shock damage below the waterline. It had cost them almost their entire attacking force, but one US carrier was now out of action. But for the Americans, it was not for nothing. During this attack, the scouting patrols launched from Yorktown had spotted Hiryu, and with that, the stage was set. And as though an omen of what was to come, as the damage control teams aboard Yorktown extinguished the fires and restored power to the engines, they hoisted a new signal flag from their island. A full-scale, capital building-sized American flag, Old Glory herself, unfurled from the foremast and caught the blowing breeze of a carrier once again underway. What remained of Yorktown's air group rearmed and combined with bombing six aboard Enterprise, and with grim purpose, Big E turned into the wind at flank speed. The ragged band of naval aviators still alive with their hurriedly patched aircraft forged ahead into the setting sun. The final showdown was upon them. But unfortunately for USS Yorktown, it would be Hiryu. Who hit first. While the Americans had launched their dive bombers earlier, they had to climb to altitude and form up, giving Yamaguchi time to launch his second wave. This follow-up attack was led by the same man who had started the battle hours before. It was fitting that the man who begun the Battle of Midway should also be the man to lead off the battle's end. Joichi Tomonaga, the leader of Hiryu's air group, launched with the remaining B-5N unit, a total of 10 bombers and 6 Zeros. The very last Japanese aviators available knew that their chances were slim to none of survival. They were screwed. But believing Yorktown to have been sunk by their comrades earlier, they were determined to sink Enterprise. They followed the line of bearing laid out by their friends, and sure enough, the American task force came into view. What greeted their eyes was a practically undamaged carrier flying a gigantic flag. Believing the crippled but slowly reviving Yorktown to be the Enterprise, Tomonaga and his men conducted their attack runs, lining up for a perfect concentric attack with their deadly long lance torpedoes. And it was then that the Yorktown Combat Air Patrol descended upon them. Undaunted by fighter opposition, the attack was pressed home, one after the other, the B-5Ns began their runs, only to be cut down by the Wildcats. The American pilots were frantically, desperately trying to save their ship. Then it was Tomonaga's turn. Coming in for an aft-quarter attack, he lined up his shot. It couldn't miss. It was a perfect angle. But at the last minute, he was thrown off his aim by a startling jolt and a burst of flame. While focused in on his attack... Joichi was shot down by none other than Jimmy Thatch himself. In a final act of defiance and professionalism, he released his torpedo, even though he knew it would miss. Nevertheless, for the Emperor and his commander, he would carry out his orders. His wingmen, however, would see their orders through, sending two more torpedoes into Yorktown's side, shattering her engines and leaving her listing 23 degrees to port. 
The deadly long lance had claimed its victim. USS Yorktown, the defiant and doting older sister, was lost. While this tragic drama played out behind them, 10 pilots of USS Enterprise and 14 of USS Yorktown drove their SPDs onwards in search of Hiryu. Off their wing, they could see plumes of smoke from their earlier handiwork and corrected their heading. Sure enough, as the sun began to set, they spotted Hiryu underway as fast as her engines could take her. Yamaguchi was trying his best. His crews, meanwhile, were feverishly cobbling together some pilots and aircraft to make an attempt on Hornet, who they thought was the only surviving US carrier. Their error would be demonstrated to them shortly. With McCluskey out of the fight wounded, it was Dick Best in command of the Americans as they prepared to brave the fighter screen. NT and Yorktown's fighters had been detailed to protect their ships from Hiryu's second wave, and so they were going in unescorted, alone. A full squadron of Zeros, orphaned from their home ships, had been rearmed aboard Hiryu, and now dove in with a fury of men possessed. Anger beyond words would not describe this. They were seeking vengeance for their home ships. Three of the SPDs were blasted to shreds immediately, forcing the others to evade, throwing off their aim. But their intrepid flight leader held his course. Down and down they went for the last time, using the rising sun painted prominently on her flight deck, Richard Halsey Best grabbed his bomb release lever and pulled it savagely. His wingmen did the same at almost the same instant. As they swooped over the edge of her deck, four 1,000 pounders shattered the forward section of Hiryu completely, caving in her deck and setting her alight from bow to the back of the island. The resulting chain reaction of fires began detonating ordnance and aircraft in the hangar deck, but due to the aggressive but convenient remodeling done by the US Navy, the hangar deck was no longer enclosed and so the catastrophic fuel air explosions that doomed the other ships did not occur. But it was apparent that she was most definitely beyond saving. The second wave of SPDs thought so too, as they aborted their dives to attack Hiryu's escort. However, the rushed attack and more effective maneuvering of the smaller ships prevented any further losses. Nevertheless, the damage was done. The American pilots dove to the water and hauled ass away, while the Zeros, with no field to land on, ditched near friendly vessels once out of fuel. As the sun burned orange on the horizon, the American aviators returned to their carriers. Yorktown's pilots eyed their home in her final moments with a somber sadness before landing on Enterprise. The day had started with 233 aircraft spread across three carriers. By its end, only 124 aircraft remained. Many of those damaged or written off completely, with one of their carriers sunk. To put it bluntly, combined with the losses from Midway Island, 50% of the American force was destroyed. Though Yorktown's crew survived, but the damage they had done to the Japanese was far greater. The Japanese had lost 3,000 sailors and airmen. All four fleet carriers had been sunk, along with their attached air groups who had been robbed of their place to land. The core of Japan's naval aviation arm had been demolished, with the pilots, mechanics, and fitters dying in the conflagrations that had swept through the hangar bays of Kido Butai. Admiral Nagumo had abandoned Akagi and began withdrawing to regroup with Admiral Yamamoto. Admiral Yamaguchi, meanwhile, was still aboard Hiryu. Watching his command begin to disintegrate, he gave a speech to the assembled crew. He praised them for their hard work and heroism in, in partially redeeming the Navy's honour. And that the failure of this defeat was the responsibility of bad leadership, not that of its sailors and airmen. With Nagumo and Yamamoto withdrawing, Yamaguchi felt it proper that for this failure, as the senior officer left on the field, he should be the one to atone for it. He ordered all young men and men with families to abandon ship. Yokaro. 
後ろに突き火でもしよう総員退官 The next day, Hiryu was found adrift by a scout aircraft from Hosho, as seen in this photograph. Soon after this photo was taken, she slipped below the waves. Seeing the carrier force destroyed and not wanting to risk the flagship, <laughs> Yamamoto ordered a general retreat back to Japanese waters. Enterprise would leave them a parting gift. As the Japanese fleet turned back, the US Navy's aviators gave chase, and as they did so they spotted the Mogami-class cruiser Mikuma and launched a devastating aerial attack. Enterprise's SPDs scored five hits on the forward half of the ship, starting fires and blowing the forecastle completely apart. Two of the escorting destroyers, Arashio and Asashio, took one bomb each, starting fires and killing a substantial number of their crews. Mikuma, with the damage she sustained, slowly took on water, listing to port until eventually capsizing, sinking into the abyss. They would not be the first Japanese warships to face the wrath of American air power, and they would definitely not be the last. With Yamamoto withdrawing and the US fleet returning to Pearl as the sun set on June 6th, 1942, the most pivotal battle in the Pacific War came to a close, and thus the balance of history was forever changed. Despite being a strategic and tactical victory for the United States, however, operationally speaking, the Battle of Midway was, on the grand scheme of things, a draw. The Japanese still had several light carriers, as well as Shokaku and Zuikaku, not to mention the other fleet carriers currently under construction in Japan or nearing completion. With the loss of Yorktown and with the other commitments to the European theatre, the United States had roughly the same carrier capability as the Japanese did. What Midway had achieved was to even the odds, and one thing was apparent to both Yamamoto and the American Joint Chiefs. Successful defensive actions only avert defeat. They do not achieve victory. To achieve victory, you have to take the offensive and seize the initiative. And with the momentum now gained, Fleet Admiral Ernest King determined that it was time for exactly that. The game had now changed. It was no longer a game of dice with long odds. The game was now poker. And granted he had a pair of fives. But the thing about American officers, which the Japanese never really worked out, is they really like to bluff. And what better way to up the stakes than to hit the enemy where he was strongest to show him you know no fear. Not to mention you get to steal his shit. The Americans were determined. They were going to get in this thing for real, and they knew just how they were going to do it. Little could they realize just how historic their campaign would be, as it would define the story of the early war into the Pacific well into the next century. Their mission was to take a large island in the Solomons by the name of Guadalcanal. They called it Operation Watchtower. Stop! Wait a minute. Wrong enterprise, wrong war. Give me a second. Uh, yeah. There we go.
As we know, during the Battle of the Coral Sea, the Japanese occupied the island of Tulagi as a strategic outpost to bolster their move down the Solomon's Island chain in support of their final offensive to seize New Guinea. Uh, but as an Australian, allow me to say, suck it, bitches! <clears throat> anyway. However, due to the intervention of the US Navy, they now had to assault the Australian force holding the island directly, resulting in them being held and then forced back up the Kokoda Trail. Again, eat shit. Given this fact, along with the cataclysmic defeat at Midway, Yamamoto decided that since he couldn't use carriers, he was going to have to use island airfields to give his naval aviators the ability to strike allied ships. Tulagi was not suited for such an undertaking, it simply wasn't big enough, but the neighbouring island of Guadalcanal had an ideal location for a large airstrip named Lunga Point. From here, utilising the exceptional range of the lightweight Japanese aircraft, they could hit targets ranging from New Guinea to Vanuatu, and provide a springboard into New Caledonia and maybe even Fiji and American Samoa. If the Japanese achieved this, it would cut the United States off from Australia, rendering them without a huge, well-developed forward operating base to launch offensives into the Empire. Fleet Admiral King and Nimitz knew that losing Australia would devastate their plans and force them to launch cross-Pacific offensives with extended lines of supply and despite their recent victories, they were still desperately short of what they needed. With the intel that Japan was setting up a base on Guadalcanal, things became clear. Letting the Japanese complete this airfield, and then allow them the ability to occupy the rest of the nearby islands, was unacceptable. They were going to do a little bit of a, what we politely call, real estate acquisition. But where do you get troops for this operation? The Navy had successfully managed to hold their own at the Battle of Midway, and were even now getting the ships together. Enterprise, Wasp, and Saratoga were ready with the carrier force, along with the brand new battleship North Carolina, later to be joined by her sister Washington. They had cruisers and destroyers aplenty, including one impetuous destroyer by the name of USS Laffey, as well as cruisers San Francisco, Salt Lake City, Portland, Atlanta, and Minneapolis. Naval strength was definitely not an issue. But troops is another matter entirely. So they got to thinking, where are we going to get the troops from? Could MacArthur do it? No, his men are dug in with the Australians in New Guinea. What about the new boys back in the States? No, apparently they have some big operation in Africa coming up. I don't know, maybe we could ask our allies. The Aussies are busy, sure, but the Brits can help, right? No, they're already in Africa. Not to mention they're trying to hold the Burma Road to keep China alive. <sighs> Shit, we're running out of options. Who does that leave? Oh, right, Canada! I'll give the Canadians a call. Hey guys, yeah, I'm gonna need to borrow your army right quick. They're busy. It's you, Canada. What what could your troops possibly be doing? What do you mean they're invading France next week? Are you fucking kidding? This is just great. We have an offensive all ready to go and no army to launch it with. Well, we don't have an army. But there is the uh other option. Who? The Dutch? They already got run out of their colonies. There's no way they could do it. like what <sighs> They can't do it. There's not enough Pacific Islanders. Wait. No. No, 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 no. I refuse. The Japanese are committing enough war crimes for the both of us. They're the ones launching suicidal attacks and pulling off crazy shit. We aren't calling them. We, if we call those guys, we'd be lucky if there was an airfield left for us to even take. I, I'm not, I'm not going to be responsible for the humanitarian crisis we're going to cause if we call them. Oh God, we don't really have to call them, do we? Yeah, uh, yeah, we do. Oh God, fucking. 
On the 7th of August 1942, under the cover of a tropical storm in the middle of the night, the United States Marine Corps entered into the waters off Guadalcanal and Tulagi. The channel of water they were sailing in would soon come to be known as Iron Bottom Sound for reasons that will become apparent. As the sun came up, the United States Navy bombarded the Japanese defences on Tulagi and Guadalcanal, while the Marines boarded their landing craft. Over their heads were the aircraft of Enterprise and Saratoga. It was a good thing they were there. The moment the Japanese realised what was happening, Japanese Naval Air Service aircraft launched from their base at Rabaul and Lai to attack the invasion fleet. Men like Japanese ace Saburo Sakai were part of this force. They were the major elite cadre left after the Battle of Midway, members of what was called the Tainan Air Group. A furious air battle ensued as the Zeros and Wildcats set upon each other like beasts possessed, while the Japanese bombers dove in on their fleet. However, due to the efforts of Enterprise and Saratoga, only two ships were damaged for the cost of 36 Japanese aircraft, while they had lost only 14 of their own in the defense. Once again, the carriers had done their job and the Marines were safely ashore. It was now time for the bloody business of the day. One day on this channel, I would love to cover the Guadalcanal campaign in full, but as this is about Enterprise, I'll have to go with a heavily abbreviated version until we get to the major naval engagements around the island involving carriers. I highly recommend for the surface actions once again, if you haven't already by now, go visit Drakinafell. Please. Anyway, the Marines did what Marines are born and raised to do. And the garrison defending the airfield quite sensibly ran into the jungle screaming in panic. After being shelled by the US Navy, picking a fight with a loose assembly of mentally challenged teenagers with machine guns led by men like John Bassalone seemed like a rather poor decision. With this victory, the Americans had themselves an airfield, and as our crayon consuming friends had achieved the honour, they got to name it, subsequently naming it Henderson Field after the aforementioned man who led the do-or-die charge of marine pilots at Midway. But while the Japanese army was not feeling very much like a fight, the Japanese navy was eager for a little bit of well-deserved payback. After all, their finest fighting force was mercilessly cut down by the very same task force now attacking them here. Given that their biggest airbase in the region, Rabaul, was at the very top of the island chain, via a channel which would become known as The Slot, while their fleet headquarters in the Pacific was located in Truck Lagoon, nearby, all of these Japanese bases and assets were perfectly placed. They had an opportunity to hit the Americans, and hit them really fucking hard. In the middle of the night, on the 8th of August 1942, a surface force under the command of Vice Admiral Mikawa closed in on the cruisers and destroyers protecting the transport fleet, which were still offloading supplies to the marines on the surrounding islands. Given the ferocious response by the Japanese Naval Air Service against the invasion force, Admiral Fletcher had withdrawn Enterprise, Saratoga and Wasp to replenish their air groups and, you know, keep them alive. He also had the full intention of expediting the offload process so he could completely withdraw and reorganise while their role was assumed by the Marine Air Group, soon to arrive at Henderson Field. The Americans had not expected the Japanese to mount a counterattack until perhaps a week from now. But despite their code-breaking and intelligence assets, like their enemies, the Americans did not truly understand or comprehend the nature of the foe they were fighting yet, at least not fully. If a Japanese military force can attack in any way, no matter how hopeless, they most certainly will. 
and given that the Japanese surface force was trained and developed with the assistance of the Royal Navy in the early part of the century, all while being merged with the ancient warrior spirit of the Japanese culture, their gunnery, discipline and aggression were on a whole different level. And with the assumption that they were going to be outnumbered and outproduced, they focused on training to overcome the odds, specifically through small-scale night attacks. What hit the Americans that night around Savo Island was the true face of the Japanese Navy. While their aviators were the focus of Yamamoto's faction, the surface proponents had dominated for most of the IJN's development. They were as terrifying as they were ruthless. They carved into the American formation, firing at point-blank range, delivering blow after devastating blow, and once complete, the Japanese vanished seamlessly into the night. As though they were ghosts. Faced with the loss of four cruisers sunk, one damaged and two destroyers barely still afloat, the US Navy was forced to withdraw, leaving the Marines to fend for themselves. With the US Navy out of the way, the way was open for the Japanese to reinforce the island, and Admiral Yamamoto knew that if he could throw the Americans back from their first offensive move, it could perhaps give them some leverage morale-wise, and maybe even some political capital to bargain with. And so, with rare, and I mean really rare, cooperation from the army, the Japanese committed fully to the campaign. Japanese reinforcements began landing all throughout August. Along the Tenaru River, near the eastern perimeter of Henderson Field, the Japanese landed a detachment of 917 men in an attempt to flank the defending marines, as they had been fortifying to the west, expecting an assault from the Japanese main force. However, the Japanese underestimated just how many marines had been landed, as well as how well dug in they were. What ended up happening was a disastrous night attack, where those 900 Japanese soldiers attacked 3,000 Marines of the 1st Marine Regiment, 1st Marine Division. And despite how much shit we give our Marine Corps friends, there is one thing you can't deny. When you want a professional, well-organized fighting force to carry out political policy through violence, you call the army. When you need new real estate and an enemy dead, and I mean really dead, you call the Marines. For the loss of 44 men, the US Marine Corps essentially wiped out the entire detachment. Given this failure, the Japanese landed the rest of their reinforcements in an attempt to stabilize the situation. They were, along with the rest of their units on the western side of the island, preparing to launch an offensive to take back Henderson Field. But it was apparent more men were needed. Amri Yamamoto, though, was way ahead on the curve on that score. As he had sourced the rest of the Japanese division already ashore, as well as an elite detachment of Japanese Special Navy Landing Forces. This was soon to be a Marine versus Marine engagement. We were about to reach levels of war crime previously thought impossible. But this force had one other motive. If this convoy was to go through unmolested, it would jeopardize the entire American operation. Thus, the US Navy would have to contest it, which would almost certainly draw out Enterprise and her friends. Assigned to the task force were none other than the sisters, Shokaku and Suikaku, along with Mutsu, Kirishima, and Hiei. With battle wagons as a vanguard, repairs complete, and new air wings on board, the Battle of the Eastern Solomons was about to begin. by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But to secure these rights, governments are instituted among them, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed.
Yamamoto, as usual, was correct in his operational assessment. Upon reports of the battle at Tenaru and the arrival of still more Japanese army units, Admiral Fletcher realized that if the Marines were going to survive, they needed his aircraft and they needed them quickly. The Cactus Air Force, as it would be famously known, had only just received its first squadrons, numbering only 20 or so aircraft. Worse still, Wasp was low on fuel and stores due to being smaller than Enti and Sarah. As such, she needed to be detached from the task force. With the grim determination of an unwanted but essential mission, the two other carriers and the surface fleet did a U-turn and headed straight back into harm's way. The Japanese knew they were coming too. A scout aircraft had spotted the US task force, but before it could radio the position, Enterprise's fighters sent it screaming down in a ball of flame. If it had crashed or suffered a failure, it would have radioed for help. So when they didn't return, Nagumo, yep, him again, made an out-of-character, correct assessment that had been shot down by US carrier aircraft. These suspicions were confirmed when a PBY Catalina spotted their own force. They immediately reversed course upon sighting this, and sure enough, a few hours later in the space they would have been, came a strike force from Saratoga. With a new day beginning, August 24th, 1942, both sides prepared for battle. And as the sun rose over the Pacific, if I may borrow the words of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the game, Mrs. Hudson, is afoot. It was Nagumo who made the opening move. The light carrier Ryuho was under the command of Chuichi Hara, the man who led the Japanese fleet at Coral Sea. This ship was ordered to move ahead of the main force with the heavy cruiser Tone and two destroyers, Amatsukaze and Tokitsukaze. Their job was to act as a decoy vanguard to draw the Americans to battle without revealing 5th Carrier Division's location. While doing this, they were also able to neutralize Henderson Field with an airstrike comprised of Ryuho's air group and the Japanese Naval Air Service units launching from Rabaul. However, while en route to their launch point, the vanguard group was spotted by a PBY Catalina and their position was radioed to Fletcher. The time was 9.35, and this was the first solid intel that the Americans had received regarding a carrier group. But it was only a singular light carrier with a small surface escort. Yesterday, they had seen a huge invasion convoy, and while they hadn't seen 5th Carrier Division, they had a pretty good suspicion that they were around. Then again, there was a Japanese surface force right next to Henderson Field, with no protection. Every instinct Fletcher had told him this was a trap. But the opportunity to take out Ryuho without opposition was seriously tempting. He stepped up Enterprise's scouting effort and decided to play it cool. He would wait for the Japanese to make their move, which of course, true to form, Chuichihara did. He, after all, much preferred being on the offensive. And at 12.20, Ryuho launched 6 B5Ns and 15 Zeros to attack Henderson Field as planned. However, what wasn't planned was a storm front coming down the island chain, resulting in Rabaul's air group being forced to return to base. Meaning that the light carrier air group was now heading to into the target on their own, which meant consequentially the upcoming air battle would be fought on an even basis. As they approached the island, Saratoga's radar picked them up, which fixed Ryuho's exact location. Fletcher, seeing that battle was joined, decided to take a risk. He knew the Japanese force was most likely out there, but with the airfield under attack and a Japanese surface group so close, he could no longer ignore it. Saratoga's air group spooled up, and at 1340, 38 aircraft launched off her deck, heading into the fray, searching for Ryuho and her escorts. At 1423, the Japanese air group began their attack on Henderson Field, only to run headlong into the marine aviators of the Cactus Air Force. And just like their ground-pounding cousins in First Marines, VMF-223, who incidentally fly AV-8 Harriers these days, were absolute maniacs. Three B-5Ns and three Zeros were blasted out of the sky with the loss of only three of their own Wildcats. Just a side note about the Cactus Air Force. These men were so competitive with their kill counts that when one of the leading aces got sick with fever, he requested the other leading ace be grounded so they could keep the scores even. But the heroics of our crayon dieted friends while impressive, one not enough to prevent what happened next. At 1425, while the melee over Henderson Field played out, a Japanese recon aircraft spotted the American main force, and while Enterprise's fighters promptly obliterated it, 
The radio operator had managed to signal Nagamo their location. Zoikaku and Shokaku immediately launched their first wave strikes. 27 T3A Vals and 15 Zeros launched and began flying straight towards the American fleet. But as they made their way out, they noticed two SPD Dauntlesses flying towards them. Scouting 6 from Enterprise had now just found the Japanese main force. They attempted to radio back the location, however due to communication problems, these reports didn't make it through. This wasn't a good situation with all these Japanese aircraft around, not to mention all of the escorts. But being Enterprise pilots and not wanting to waste their bombs, the two SPDs decided to have a crack at it anyway, and immediately dived through the hailstorm of AAA onto Shokaku. They released their bombs, but unfortunately they went wide, only causing minor shock damage. That said, it forced five of the attacking Zeros to abandon their escort mission to chase them. But while they got the hell out of dodge, the two Japanese fleet carriers launched their second follow-on wave right after the first, numbering 27 more Vals and 9 Zeros. The Japanese had now committed all of their aircraft to battle. The contest was now, for better or worse, in the hands of the airmen. At the same time, that being 1600, Saratoga's pilots had located Ryuho and commenced their attack. The light carrier, having launched their air wing at Henderson Field, did not have a combat air patrol to cover their group, and thus a veritable hailstorm of bombs descended upon them. Ryuho was torn apart, with 120 of her crew killed and her flight deck absolutely trashed. Her hangar bays and machinery spaces were ablaze, and it was clear to the damage control teams that she didn't have long. Chuichi Hara gave the order for the destroyers to come alongside for an abandoned ship once the Americans had cleared out. That was 1-0 to the Americans. However, while this was underway, the Japanese were about to make their big play. Enterprise's radar picked up Shokaku and Suikaku's air group, approaching the task force at 1602. At that point, Enti and Sarah had cleared their flight decks of all aircraft via emergency launch. The SPDs, fully armed with bombs, fled out to the north of the battle area, under orders to search and destroy any Japanese ship in sight. The Wildcats, meanwhile, all 53 of them, were ordered to intercept and destroy the incoming attack. But like with Scouting 6 before, communications were patchy and the vectors infrequent. It was hard to clarify what altitude the attackers were at, as well as their precise line of bearing. So when the engagement began, the Wildcats were abeamed to the Japanese formation at the same altitude, and upon sighting this state of affairs, the Zero escorts placed themselves between them and the bombers. While this put the Americans in an excellent attack position once through the fighter screen, they wouldn't be able to hit the Vals until after they had launched their attack. The Japanese dive bombers moved on their targets, but due to their ingress route, they had ended up with the carriers at different instances and angles, and it was Enterprise who was the nearest carrier. Given this, and the heavy resistance from both Flak and the Wildcats, who were even now boring in on them, the entire Japanese air group chose to attack Enterprise. The first section of Vals dove in, lining up their target squarely in sight. However, Enterprise's helmsman obviously had something in his coffee that morning. With her aircraft all airborne and at full speed, NT threw herself around like a destroyer. All nine of the first wave of attackers missed their target, with no damage sustained to any part of the ship. However, the second wave of Vals adjusted onto her maneuvers and launched an attack which would very nearly prove fatal. The first bomber, flown by Petty Officer Kyoto Furata, planted a delay action armor piercing bomb next to the aft elevator, which went right into the bows of the ship, rupturing the hull below the waterline. Thankfully, however, the hull was only cracked and not blown open, meaning it would only cause a slight list. The next bomb was dropped by its petty officer Tamotsu Akimoto. This one smacked into the 5 inch gun battery next to the aft elevator, causing a secondary explosion through the ammunition locker, killing all of the crews in that part of the ship, starting a massive blaze. However, the final and most crippling bomb in terms of operations came from petty officer Kazumi Hori, who dropped a 500 pound bomb right on Enterprise's forward flight deck blowing a 10-foot hole and causing severe shock damage. Seeing these attacks, the other attackers believed that Enti was finished and switched their attack to North Carolina. However, the evasive moves combined with the heavy AA defenses prevented any more damage. Things were looking bleak. 
However, it was the heroism of the American damage control teams who saved the day, as anything that could threaten Enterprise's seaworthiness was immediately patched. While she had taken a pummeling, she would not sink, and with a little bit of TLC, she could be made ready for action once again. Meanwhile, for this limited success, the Japanese paid a very high price. Of the 37 aircraft that attacked the American fleet, 25 were destroyed, all with their pilots being lost in the process. This was on top of the loss of Ryuho and her entire air group. The Americans weren't finished yet, though. A flight of SPDs from Saratoga spotted the Japanese seaplane tender Shitose and crippled her with two near misses, causing horrific shock damage to her hull. She would eventually be forced back to Japan for repairs. This ended up being the parting shot as the second wave of Japanese aircraft were unable to find their target due to the ongoing chaos on their comms and being forced to return to base. The next day, when the Japanese reinforcements attempted to approach Guadalcanal, it would have to do so without the protection of Ryuho or the main body, as both their air groups were horrifically mauled. The result was predictable. The Cactus Air Force, along with B-17 support, savaged the Japanese fleet, with fully laden troop transport and a destroyer being sunk, while the other vessels were strafed along their decks. What was worse for the Japanese is that as their carrier had been rendered inoperable and US air casualties were so low, Enterprise's air group had taken up residence at Henderson Field, and they too joined in the fun. The Japanese, realizing that going ahead was surely to be a costly affair, turned around and withdrew. The Americans had once again blunted the mighty katana of Japanese naval aviation. But Enterprise was looking worse for the wear. Her air group, marooned on Guadalcanal, while some of her fighters had taken up residence on Saratoga, she limped back to Pearl Harbor for much-needed repairs on September 12, 1942. When she pulled into dry dock, like Yorktown, it was a general consensus she would need months in maintenance and a complete refit to be up to scratch. But yet again, due to the shortage of carriers, she was needed far sooner. This situation only got worse, as on September 15th, USS Wasp was torpedoed by Japanese submarine I-19 and sunk. This meant Saratoga and Hornet were now the only ships available to keep up the fight. Things on Guadalcanal, meanwhile, were not going much better. Marine General Vandegrift was receiving reports that a large Japanese offensive was being prepared to the west of the Matanikau River. While the Americans had forced the Imperial Japanese Navy back during the day, they still owned the night, and given that Japanese destroyers and cruisers were capable of high rates of knots, they had formed a nighttime ferry service for Japanese troops, which was quickly dubbed the Tokyo Express. They couldn't ship heavy weapons as the cargo ships were too slow, and they would be intercepted by the Cactus Air Force unless they had cover. But small arms, mortars, machine guns, and light guns could be shipped via the Tokyo Express. It was in this dire circumstance that the marines at Guadalcanal performed a ritual. A ritual which is still practiced today as seen in this clip from BBC's Planet Earth. And here we see a herd of North American marines, commonly known as a gaggle fuck. They are currently in the process of performing a tribal dance. Many misinterpreted for a mating ritual. It is in fact the process of summoning the ghost of Chesty Puller, a deity for their tribe. <laughs> this Chesty Puller, though, was not a spirit, but the man, the myth, the legend himself. He had arrived just in time as well. There was a brief lull in the fighting due to bad weather up and down the island chain. Both sides used it to reinforce and regroup. The Americans won a small victory against a Japanese surface group at the Battle of Cape Esperance, but other than that, nothing much happened combat-wise. That said, during a nighttime counterattack launched by Japanese troops against the Marines at the mouth of the Botanikau River, near Lunga Point, the Marines were forced to pull back and were on the verge of being overrun. Chesty ordered his men to fall back to the shoreline in order to get rescued by the Navy. At that moment, the only Medal of Honor to ever be won by a Coast Guardsman was earned, as signalman Douglas A. Munro, having volunteered for this dangerous duty, willingly positioned his landing craft between the Japanese and his comrades, now evacuating the Marines. He then proceeded to single-handedly engage the entire Japanese force 
with a 30 cal machine gun by himself before being mortally wounded. However, this small action, while massive heroism was demonstrated, was only one battle. Logistically, however, things were seriously moving. The Cactus Air Force now numbered 71 aircraft, while the whole of 1st Marines was now ready to kick some ass. It wouldn't be easy though, as Yamamoto had arrayed everything in the area against them. Army reinforcements, Japanese Marines, and now the entirety of the Congo class, as well as Shokaku and Suikaku. Not to mention the new conversion carriers Junyo and Hiyo, as well as the light carrier Zuiho. As my old cadet drill instructor used to say, defecation was about to collide with oscillation. Congo and Haruna bombarded Henderson Field, while a gigantic Japanese land offensive was launched all along the southern perimeter. On the 24th of October, and over the next two days, Chesty Puller's Marines at the 1st Battalion, 7th Marine Regiment, along with their other comrades in 1st Marine Division, fought a brutal close-in and occasionally hand-to-hand -hand fight with what was essentially the entire Japanese 17th Army, numbering 20,000 men. It was during this action that John Bassalone won his famous Medal of Honor, immortalized in the TV series The Pacific. But as this horrific scene played out, it would be in the seas just outside the Solomon Island chain, which would be the worst battle. A battle which would come to be known by the US Navy as Bloody Santa Cruz. Over the months straddling September on October, USS Enterprise, with the aid of Pearl Harbor's dry dock teams and the ever-faithful USS Vestal, was back online with her little sister Hornet, forming Task Force 61. And with her came a brand new air group, including a squadron which would go down in history as one of the finest fighter units in the US Navy. VF-10. The Grim Reapers. As well as the return of Admiral Halsey, and a new task force commander, Admiral Thomas Kim Cade. With the constant movements of naval forces towards Guadalcanal, and the constant pressure placed on the marines, as soon as Enterprise was able to sail, she was heading with her little sister down to her duty station when word came down. The marines were locked in a life or death struggle with a whole Japanese army, and that army was supported by what amounted to the entire Japanese combined fleet. As said before, Pretty much every Japanese heavy hitter was nearby, except for Because she was just too big to fit in the shallower waters between the islands. TF-61's commander, Admiral Thomas Kincaid, was on the lookout for the Japanese fleet. He knew Nagamo was out there somewhere, waiting to strike, and he had both fleet carriers available to the US Navy with him. If he wasn't careful, this situation could deteriorate fast. He was right to be concerned. While he Yo was not present due to suffering a fire before departure, Junyo was steaming towards Guadalcanal with an absolute powerhouse of a surface group surrounding her, comprised of Atago, Takao, Miyoko, Maya, Kongo, and Haruna, along with a substantial destroyer force. Their job was to get a sizable air group into knife fighting range to pin the Americans while their surface force could close in and wipe them out with superior firepower. Following on behind them was the main force comprised of Shokaku and Zuikaku, Hiei and Kirishima, Chikuma, Tone, Suzia and Kumano with Zuiho providing light carrier support. That's three fleet carriers and a light carrier with enough surface ships of size to eradicate any opposition they faced. It was a simple matter of arithmetic. If anything other than complete tactical surprise was achieved, the Japanese will almost certainly carry the day. And if any single wrong decision is made, or even one piece of bad luck befalls them, the entire carrier capability of the United States Navy is wiped out. And if by some horrible twist of fate they get close enough for a surface action, it's goodnight Irene for the entire task force. While the United States had more ships and higher potential combat power, in terms of concentration of force, Japan still held the advantage, and until 1943 comes round with a fully geared up war economy, any losses here would be devastating. But abandoning Guadalcanal and perhaps losing Australia and New Zealand is equally unacceptable. And as Admiral Halsey was in charge, being on the defensive was not going to happen. And so Kincaid committed to the battle, with scouting flights from both carriers 
and shore-based Catalinas, the hunt was on. In the early dawn of the 26th of October 1942, Chesty Puller and his men checked their lines and took stock of the aftermath. They had held Henderson Field, and in front of their lines lay the remains of an entire Japanese force. 3,000 men cut down by the guns of 1st Marines, with the loss of only 80 Americans. A total victory which would pass into the annals of legend. But out to sea, the vicissitudes of fate were ensuring that balance was maintained. A radar-equipped PBY had spotted Nagumo's main body early in the morning at around 3am. However, due to yet more communications issues, Admiral Kincaid did not get the signal until two hours later. As such, when given this intelligence, he assessed quite rightly that the Japanese would have changed position by now and held off launching an attack at dawn. However, had he been aware at how the Japanese had changed position, he might have reconsidered. The Japanese had either, by instinct or by luck, reversed course and closed on the Americans, so that by 6am they were within 200 miles. Given Japanese deck load strike doctrine, allowing them to mass two full waves of aircraft within minutes, the greater range and speed of said aircraft, as well as their lethal surface force, getting into close quarters rendered the Americans at a disadvantage. What would decide the matter is recon. Who would see who first? As fate would have it, they saw each other at the same time. At 6.45, a scouting flight from Enterprise spotted Nagumo's main force immediately radioing its position. Ten minutes later, a Japanese scout spotted USS Hornet and did the same. It was now a race to see who could get airborne first. Both carrier groups rushed to clear their decks of aircraft to launch a strike. While Enterprise's scouts honed in on the transmission to launch a spoiling attack, at 7.40, two SPDs from Enterprise's air group, who had been on the scouting mission, arrived over the Japanese formation while they were conducting launch operations. The surface escorts were putting up a huge flak screen while the combat air patrol was prowling around for scouts such as them. Attacking the main body was suicide, but below them on the periphery, they spotted the light carrier Zuiho, launching her own air group. The two Enterprise pilots decided on full send, and with the lethality they were famous for, deposited two 500 pounds bombs right through the flight deck. Damage control teams extinguished the fires immediately, and the central hits prevented hull damage, but a flight deck was out of commission. But it wasn't going to be enough. The Japanese doctrine, while having limitations in protracted fights like Midway, in pure ship to ship engagements, especially at closer ranges, it was lethal. Despite spotting the Americans after they had been spotted, it was their air groups who got airborne first. The first wave of 64 Japanese aircraft formed up in their respective units. 21 VALs, 22 B5Ns, and 21 Zeros. They had launched while Enterprise's scouts were making mischief. Once they had gotten airborne, both Shokaku and Suikaku commenced launch on their second waves. 16 B5Ns, 19 VALs, and 9 Zeros, not including Zuiho Zeros, which had been launched earlier when the scouts had been spotted. By 9am, the Japanese had over 100 aircraft en route to attack Hornet, with a full cap in place behind them. And worst of all for the Americans, those 100 aircraft were formed up en masse to attack in waves as their doctrine was designed. This fight was going to be a brutal one. The US force, meanwhile, was at this time still scrambling to get organized. They had no equivalent to the deck load strike doctrine, and due to the fact that a number of their dive bombers were outperforming recon while they had been caught off guard by the Japanese forces' proximity, they decided that hitting quickly was preferable to hitting hard. So both Hornet and Enterprise launched their aircraft as fast as they could, while ordering their pilots to commence their attacks as soon as able. This resulted in small flights of 20 to 30 aircraft proceeding independently to the Japanese fleet with only limited fighter escort, as the main force of Wildcats were forming the Task Force Combat Air Patrol. This posed two major issues. The first was the obvious one. It's easier to defend against three or four smaller attacks spread out over time than it is to defend against two really huge attacks back to back. The other was something that all naval aviators of World War II struggled with even under ideal conditions. Navigation across open sea, relying entirely on compass headings and airspeed over time, is incredibly difficult. One degree of angle difference exponentially decreases the chance of intercept, and given that we're talking aircraft and ships that moved at high speed, 
One tiny error can lead to the discrepancy in the tens, if not hundreds of miles. If you're spread out into small formations operating independently, there is a higher chance that the navigation variables will conspire against you. Which is exactly what happened. Though it must be said that with so many Japanese ships around the place, everybody at least found something to attack. The Battle of Santa Cruz was well underway now. And in a scene which would be comedic if the uh, fighting wasn't so depressingly fierce, the leading US force made contact with and subsequently passed the Japanese formation heading the other way. The time was 8.30 a.m. and it was now that the fighters would join the fray. Suiho's combat air patrol had been following the raid on its way to Hornet and seeing the American formation they moved quickly to intercept. The Wildcats turned into the attack and knocked down four of the attacking Zeros for the loss of three of their own in the subsequent dogfight. However while half the Japanese fighters kept the escorts busy the rest dove in on the bombers. Two Avengers went down immediately followed by two SBDs. Four more bombers were heavily damaged and forced away. Between Zuiho's fighters and the combat air patrol over the fleet, there was a formidable defense to get through. But the Americans, in their typical way, pressed home the attack. By the time they were on target, only 11 SPDs had made it, and they had selected Shokaku as their prey. The AAA was intense and the Zeros kept coming, but the Dauntlesses lived up to their reputation and their name. Between three to six 500 pound bombs, tore Shokaku's flight deck apart while blasting through the hangar bays and machinery spaces. However, unlike at the Battle of Midway, the hangar bays were empty, and the ordnance that was brought up from the magazine was now attached to the aircraft making a beeline to Hornet. Shokaku would live. The latter would not. At the same moment, the Japanese force had been sighted on radar. 37 Wildcats moved to intercept, but the issues that had plagued the Americans during the Battle of the Eastern Solomons struck them once again. Communications were patchy, vectors inaccurate, and altitude uncertain. Only a few of the Wildcats would manage to get into attack position prior to the Japanese bombing runs commencing. However, those that did gave a good account of themselves. Several valves were shot down while others were severely damaged, including the raid leader, Lieutenant Sadamu Takahashi. But 16 VALs and 20 B5Ns made it through unmolested and commenced their attack. During their transit, a patch of bad weather had made its way into the battle area, blanketing USS Enterprise in a rain squall, obscuring her from view, meaning that the only capital ship the Japanese flight could see was the wildly turning USS Hornet. The entire Japanese air group descended on her. The flak was biblical above the US task force, knocking down Japanese aircraft left and right. U.S. fighters even followed the Japanese into the attack, suffering friendly fire in a vain attempt to stop them. But it wasn't enough. Three bombs struck Hornet square in the center of her flight deck. Two armor-piercing bombs detonated in the center of the ship, tearing up her interior and causing severe shock damage, while the other hit was a HE bomb, blasting a huge hole in the flight deck. There were severe casualties on Hornet, but the damage was manageable. That was until the torpedo bombers came in. The 20 B-5Ns had come in underneath the valves, evading the American combat air patrol. The anti-aircraft fire was murderous. Like their opposite numbers at Midway, they were slaughtered on the way in. However, the defensive screen was not as dense as it had been on Kido Butai, and their attack was synchronized with that of the dive bombers. The flight released their torpedoes on time and on target. Hornet swerved to evade and succeeded in dodging a few, but she couldn't dodge them all. Two long lance torpedoes, the deadliest torpedo in the world as we know, smashed into Hornet's engineering spaces. The hole cracked open immediately like an egg, as the shock ruptured pipes and then shattered the propulsion system. Hornet slowed to a dead stop almost immediately as her insides began hemorrhaging, leaving her stationary for warrant officer Shigeyuki Sato. Sato had been in the last wave of vows. The American gunners had thrown up a wall of shrapnel between them and the Hornet, and some of that shrapnel had hit his engine, setting it alight. With only seconds left on his aircraft's life, he decided that he would use those seconds to the fullest. As Hornet steadily ground to a halt, Sato aimed his vow right for the island, with the rage-filled scream of a warrior administering the death blow like the samurai of old. He pushed his stick forward savagely, 
and dove straight into his target. USS Hornet's forward smokestack disappeared in a flash of flame as burning aviation fuel sprayed all over, setting the ship afire, including into the interior of the ship due to the hole in the flight deck. Damage control teams went to work and were managing to bring her back to life with the aid of the escorts and their fire hoses. Hornet's fires were extinguished and the emergency power was being restored. USS Northampton arrived on station quickly and began the process of towing her, but time was not in their favour, as the Japanese still had more aircraft incoming. Enterprise, meanwhile, had since emerged from the rain squall and was now recovering her aircraft. Hornet had been doing the heavy lifting attack-wise up to this point. However, Enti's Avengers and SPDs had come very close to sinking Chikuma, battering her with multiple bomb hits. The Grim Reapers, meanwhile, were doing their best, but the technical issues in the Combat Air Patrol's interception were making life very difficult for them. It was then that the second wave of Japanese aircraft arrived. Interrupting recovery operations for the first wave of aircraft, resulting in a lot of US pilots having to ditch alongside their escorts, that in turn would result in the sinking of USS Porter as the Avengers torpedo, still on board the aircraft, ran into the ship after the ditching. Meanwhile, the second wave of Japanese aircraft could now see Enterprise, and as Hornet looked done for, selected her for an attack. Once again, the Wildcats of VF-10 attempted to intercept, and once again, they only just managed to get into position after the Japanese had commenced their bomb runs. Nevertheless, they managed to shoot down two of the dive bombers before they started their attack. The other 17 would have to be halted by the gunners. Lieutenant Keichi Arima and his pilot, Petty Officer Kyoto Furata, led the attack and planted their bomb on Enterprise's forward elevator, severely jamming the mechanism in the up position. Another one of Arima's men managed to get the other bomb just aft of the island, while a near miss caused shock damage to the outer hull. It was then that the torpedo bombers arrived on scene and began lining up at different angles for a concentric attack. The Grim Reapers, though, were now organised and on station and spotted them, and immediately sent three of them down in flames, while a fourth was heavily damaged. That one launched a kamikaze strike on the USS Smith, severely damaging her and setting her ablaze. However, she wouldn't sink due to the captain being an absolute mad lad, he sailed into the wake of the battleship South Dakota, now going at flank speed to evade the incoming aircraft, and the spray of the massive blades churning the water doused the flames aboard USS Smith and saved the ship. The torpedo bombers, meanwhile, pressed their attack, but the Americans managed to evade all of their weapons and blasted most of them to pieces with AA at very close range. The attack was foiled, and things began to come back under control. But at that moment, a third wave of Japanese aircraft appeared. Junyo, having heard the fight going on, had turned about from their vanguard position and steamed back with all haste. Getting into range to launch her first wave, she duly did so, resulting in the arrival of a third wave of attackers, taking Admiral Kincaid and the Combat Air Patrol completely by surprise. Nevertheless, everyone aboard the US ships was on high alert, and the storm of anti-air that faced them caused devastation in their ranks. But the Japanese airmen pressed the attack on Enterprise, causing minor damage with their many near misses. But while their physical threat was negligible, it was this attack that broke Admiral Kincaid's nerve. Realizing that Japanese attack waves come in pairs, he had done the math that another force would be coming presently, which may spill over into another attack from Shokaku and Suikaku. With Hornet out of the fight and in dire straits, while Enterprise was wounded and busy recovering aircraft from both her air group and her little sisters, they were in no shape to continue the fight. Wanting to preserve his battleship and his remaining carrier, Admiral Kincaid ordered his forces to withdraw, leaving Hornet and Northampton behind. It would be the last time Enterprise saw her little sister. The Japanese were indeed preparing their final strike, but their casualties across all of their air groups had been catastrophic. Of all the senior officers launched from Junyo for the follow-up attack, only one returned. He raved incoherently about flak and fighters raining from the skies, of entire formations wiped out. It wasn't an exaggeration. Despite having done so much damage, 
the Japanese had lost 90 aircraft along with most of their experienced flight crews. These were losses they couldn't hope to replace in short order. That said, there were still aircraft and pilots left. Junyo and Shokaku launched their remaining air groups for a final attack to wipe out the American fleet, to ensure their emperor a victory. When they arrived at 1520, however, there was no fleet to be found. The enemy had turned tail and run. But they had left behind a wounded carrier with a cruiser desperately trying to tow her to safety. Hornet had evacuated everyone except essential personnel in order to conduct damage control to try and save the ship. They had restored emergency power and were working on getting the engines back online. There was hope. That is, until they saw Junyo and Shokaku's air groups. With deliberate precision, the B-5Ns under the command of Lieutenant Ichiro Tanaka lined up for a simultaneous torpedo and level bombing strike. And sure enough, both a long lance and a rain of bombs tore Hornet asunder. With emergency power knocked out, the pumps rendered inoperable, and the engines permanently disabled, there was nothing else that could be done. The Japanese were closing in with surface ships, and more bombers would definitely arrive before the sun sets. USS Hornet's crew abandoned ship, picked up by her escorts. By midnight, the Japanese would find her, and realizing she had no value, her enemies tore her apart with a barrage of torpedoes, plunging her to the seafloor. The Battle of Santa Cruz was over. Enterprise limped away from the scene damaged. Her dearest friend, USS Vestal, was even now preparing repair crews to get her back into shape. It was then that she received the news. USS Hornet was gone. Her little sister was dead. She was now the last surviving ship in her class. But at least they had stopped the Japanese attack. At least they had stood them off once more. But it wasn't enough. Soon after the battle, reports had begun arriving that more and more troops were landing on Guadalcanal via the Tokyo Express. And that the full might of the Congo class would once again lead a convoy down the slot to begin a final operation to seize the island. Enterprise was the only carrier in the Pacific left. Her sisters were dead. Her fellow task force members exhausted and beat up. Her countrymen, the marines who were in her care, were doomed to face annihilation. All of her sacrifices all of the blood, her sister's lives, all of it, would be for nothing. No. This wouldn't stand. Well, the enemy is strong. He may hurl back our forces. Success may not come with rushing speed, but we shall return again and again.
USS Enterprise stood alone. She was the only aircraft carrier the US Navy had in the Pacific Theater. Her sisters had fallen. Her surviving comrades were either cobbling together a defense around Guadalcanal, or protecting the convoys crossing the Atlantic, keeping their allies and expeditionary forces alive, while they slowly rolled the Germans back across North Africa. In fact, even as her dearest friend USS Vestal and her long-suffering crew of mechanics and CBs were getting to work repairing her, a large amphibious operation began in what was then called French West Africa, codenamed Operation Torch, with the goal of finally encircling and destroying Rommel's deadly Africa Corps, which had been making life exceedingly difficult for the better part of two years. However, of even greater concern was the advance of the Japanese. The Battle of Santa Cruz had been extremely costly for both sides, but it was clear that the Americans had come off far worse. Losing Hornet was a devastating blow, both materially and psychologically, to everyone concerned. But thankfully, the crew and most of her aviators had survived, and many of whom were even now aboard Enterprise regrouping. And as a result of being the only carrier still in harm's way against the advancing Japanese, the crew aboard Grey Ghost hung a sign in the hangar bay. In bold letters it proudly read, Enterprise vs. Japan. Overall, though, the situation was not looking good. Uncle Sam's misguided children had managed to hold off against the advancing Japanese Army and Navy landing forces, and they had done pretty well up to this point. But until new Crayon Crusaders arrived from Paris Island, manpower was going to be limited, while the lion's share of supplies were heading to support the aforementioned Operation Torch. Meanwhile, the Tokyo Express was bringing in reinforcements to the Japanese garrison on the island, who were now reorganizing for yet another offensive to take Henderson Field. Their previous assault had been a bloody failure, being brutally repulsed by Chesty and his men, resulting in the loss of half of their force. But with the advantage of having lots of forward bases nearby, a squadron of fast destroyers able to run down the slot in one night, as well as a military tradition reminiscent of a marketing strategy for overpriced miniatures. What is your duty to serve the Emperor's will? What is the Emperor's will? That we fight and die. What is death? It is our duty. Manpower wasn't much of a problem. What was a problem was firepower. Due to the fact that the Cactus Air Force, in typical Marine Corps fashion, violently assaulted anything with a red circle on it, this unfortunately included Royal Australian Air Force aircraft on more than one occasion, hence why we changed our roundel to the one without a dot in it. Honestly, when taken as a whole, actually, the Marines kind of remind me of this TV show when I was a kid. It was called The Big Knights. The height of two men, the weight of four, the strength of sixteen... Sir Boris, finest swordsman in the world, and his brother, Sir Morris, not the finest swordsman in the world, but the most enthusiastic. Yep. A small cadre of professionals leading a group of mentally challenged but highly enthusiastic killing machines. They are a menace to civilization, but they are our menace, and I ask you, where would we be without them? Anyway, where was I? Ah, yeah. Marine aviators. The marine aviators in question kept blasting ships that sailed down the slot during the daylight hours, and the Japanese had finally started to learn that fighting marines head-on is not an intelligent move, and that they would fight just as hard as their most zealous of troops. Worse still, they had problems of their own. While the Americans had been losing ships they couldn't afford, at least in the short term, and suffering heavy casualties on land and in the air, dislodging the Americans from their positions on Guadalcanal would take more than the resources they had on hand. Without heavy artillery, air support, and a lot of armor, their chances of winning this fight were practically zero. The Army High Command, therefore, petitioned Yamamoto to get a task force together to clear the way for a convoy. This convoy was to be filled to the brim with the heaviest equipment they could muster in the hope that if they could get their gear onto the island along with some ammo, the Tokyo Express could then get the men there to use it. It would take the bulk of their available surface force and all of the air power available in the region, primarily coming from their bases on Rabaul, with a smaller contingent from the aircraft carrier Junyo, which was hanging around. But, in keeping with Japanese doctrine of decisive battle, the idea was to focus 
all of their combat power in a single hammer blow. If this succeeded in defeating the Allied naval presence in the region, they could then use their warships to obliterate Henderson Field and gain air supremacy, paving the way for a massed assault to retake Wald Canal. Yamamoto readily approved of the plan. Given the loss of Carrier Division 5's air wings as well as the destruction of his light carrier forces, he had to operate within the range of his land bases anyway. And removing the Americans from Guadalcanal would seriously improve their position in the region, even if it meant detailing assets to support the army, something which all Japanese naval officers despised doing. There was also the other factor though to consider, the factor which every nation that fights the United States has to contend with. They were on a time limit. The Americans have enough logistical and material capacity to swamp Japan. In fact, they were already beginning to do so. After the reversal at Midway and the loss of Guadalcanal, they needed to score some victories and secure a perimeter while keeping their forces alive. They had gotten off to a good start as they had defeated the Americans at the Battle of Santa Cruz. What they needed to do now was capitalize on that success and regain the initiative. And so, Admiral Yamamoto put his plan into motion to do exactly that. As November 1942 began, the 7,000 men of the 38th Infantry Division boarded their transports as the heavy equipment was loaded into the cargo holds. Artillery, tanks, trucks, heavy mortars, and all the food and fuel they would ever need. 11 fully loaded heavy tonnage cargo vessels, packed to the mast, as Imperial Japan was not exactly known for the consideration of its soldiers' well-being. So, yeah, it was standing room only on this bitch. There were no do-overs at this point, no take-backs. They would either prevail or perish. And Admiral Yamamoto knew as he pondered his shogi board, failure here would doom any hope of going on the offensive in the future. And not only that, without a position of strength, they wouldn't have any hope of negotiating a peace. And in a war against the United States, that only ever has one ending. A funeral pyre for his empire. So everything he could provide to this offensive, he would. The Solomon's Island Channel was too shallow for the flagship. You thought I was going to do it, didn't you? <laughs> gotcha. Don't worry, though. She'll come back for her last hurrah in part four. So anyway, <laughs> without Yamato and Masashi, it would be the Congo class that were going to lead the charge, and they were going to be under command of Admiral Hirioke Abe. The flagship of the task force would be the battleship Hiei, flanked by her sister ship, the battleship Kirishima. They would be joined by the cruiser Nagara and a destroyer flotilla of 11 ships. And leading that particular flotilla was the Yukikaze, the luckiest ship in the Japanese Navy. With the destruction of Hornet and most of the battleships being still at the bottom of Pearl Harbor, the odds were in their favor. Or so it appeared. But there was one issue with this plan. The same issue there always is with Japanese plans. A secret plan only works if it's, well, a secret. And thanks to the Intel basement dwellers on Oahu, in the hypo room, this plan was not a secret. Admiral Chester Nimitz and his subordinates were viewing the intelligence reports while gazing with trepidation at their maps. Admiral Halsey, now back in action, was in his normal mood of wanting to sail directly to truck with his entire surface force in order for him to challenge Yamamoto to a one-on-one -on -one fist fight on the docks. But uh, given the situation and the aforementioned super battleships lurking in open waters nearby, such a course would uh, not be advisable. Even so, with the intelligence that the Japanese were getting ready to mount a serious effort once again to try and take Guadalcanal for one last time, it was decided that if the enemy wanted to force a decisive battle, the Solomons were the place to do it. After all, their carriers were under refit and resupply, while the super battleships can't engage here. With the Cactus Air Force to offer air cover during the day, and the new US battleships equipped with radar sets to handle night fighting, the equation was far more balanced than their previous surface engagements. In any case, Chesty's boys needed reinforcing, and so from every source they could draw, more marines were rounded up, contained, desexed, and dog-tagged for our safety. And even more amazingly, the army were following on behind with their heavier gear, as well as their own air group. As with Midway before, it was determined that should the Japanese attempt to take the real estate they paid so much for, 
it would cost them an incredible amount of interest. And the worst part for the Japanese is that all of this was done in advance of their departure. Once again, the Americans had set a trap, and they were ready to meet their foe on even terms. But I don't think either side had any idea just how badly this was going to go for everybody involved. As the newly arrived devil dogs dug in alongside their GI brethren, for as we all know, apes together are strong, the Japanese task force had put to sea. The battleships had been issued with special incendiary fragmentation shells. Similar to how modern cluster munitions are designed, their purpose was to critically damage aircraft and light vehicles while igniting munitions and fuel storage, perfect for bombarding an airfield. The Japanese, still convinced that all was going to plan, or all according to Kaikaku, for those of you who are indulgent in weeb memes, proceeded down the Solomon's Island Channel. However, after today, that Solomon Islands Channel would earn a different name. Iron Bottom Sound. You know, I would say spoiler alert, but given the track record of battles in these specific waters, you have all probably worked out how this is going to go. But believe me, calling what's coming up a mere shit show would be like me calling the American Civil War a slight disagreement over domestic policy. This is more of a septic tank through a steam turbine scenario. As the 12th of November was coming to an end with a glorious Pacific sunset, an American recon aircraft spotted the Japanese task force, radioing its position, which was immediately reported to the American task force commander, one Admiral Daniel Callahan. He immediately ordered his force on an intercept course, Sailing in column past Henderson Field, his force consisted of two heavy cruisers, three light cruisers, and eight destroyers. His flagship was the San Francisco, while the other cruisers in the formation were Portland, Helena, Juno, and Atlanta. But despite appearances, those cruisers, they aren't the true heavy hitters. For with him, he had one ship. One beautiful, magnificent ship who we shall meet at the most opportune moment. Though leading the destroyers was none other than a lead ship in class, USS Fletcher. Given the balance of forces, as well as the fact they had the speed advantage and prior knowledge of the Japanese position and radar, it would seem that the Americans were in place for a sneaky nighttime ambush. But alas, Grand Admiral Murphy of the JAG office was well and truly present. What can go wrong, will go wrong. And tonight, this guy was head of the prosecution. Admiral Callahan, despite having all of the aces up his sleeve, did not brief his senior officers of a plan, nor did he establish a concrete standard operating procedure for their rules of engagement, which meant that he would have to coordinate the operation completely on the fly via micromanagement, or simply rely on the captains of each ship to take a leaf out of their aviation colleague's book and wing it. And they were to do all of this in the middle of the night. But wait, he's not done. The Americans, with the newer cruisers and destroyers in the formation to support the older ships, should have constant range and bearing updates to plan around. As I mentioned, they have radar. Problem was, for whatever reason, Callahan had the radar equipped vessels at the back of the formation instead of the front. Again, in the middle of the night. I don't know what his plan was, but as the previous bit indicates, he probably didn't have one. Thankfully, American naval radar is actually outstanding and it has great range, so it would still give them an edge. It's just that they've lost 20 minutes of situational awareness they'd otherwise have. So yeah, the American camp looks pretty shoddy and all around terrible from this perspective, and it was really bad on this particular evening. But they weren't the only ones having problems. Admiral Abe was, in typical Japanese Navy fashion, operating under a far more complex battle plan in confined quarters at midnight with a timetable to keep. Now it must be said here again, the Japanese surface fleet until the latter stages of the war were some of the finest sailors of their day. Their training and discipline was matched only by their ferocity, 
It's why when the US Navy got into a gun range, 9 times out of 10 it was the Japanese who prevailed. It's ironic that, considering that the Japanese were in fact the ones to pioneer carrier aviation to what we know it as today, but alas, in such a conservative traditionalist society, the fleet faction won out. But as we know, that traditionalism was no match for the changing of the times. The Allies as a whole were modernising, using technology to augment their forces as part of a steel not flesh policy, which is why Allied casualties were a lot lower than all the other major combatants like the Japanese, the Soviets and the Germans. While the Japanese primarily focused on training and proven methods. This is a really fine balancing act, but when you match that technical superiority with the raw industrial might of the United States, you create something that's nigh on unstoppable. The Japanese vessels did not have much radar to speak of, if any at all. They relied completely on night sights, spotlights and basic communication, as well as extensive nighttime training drills for night battles that the Japanese crews were well proficient in. But it doesn't change the fact that they were attempting to conduct a complex night operation under near radio silence in confined waters. And when it couldn't get any worse, they hit a rain squall. The Japanese split up into multiple little groups, thereby breaking that formation entirely. They don't have a formation anymore. This was a terrible situation. And then, say it with me now ladies and gentlemen, it got worse. Through the darkness as they broke out of the rain squall, the lookouts on Hiei noticed shadows of the distance, contrasted against the dark indigo horizon. Meanwhile, on the USS San Francisco, Admiral Callahan had been getting panicked reports from his radar operators about Japanese ships that had popped up out of nowhere. Due to the myriad of blunders on both sides, the two groups were, in naval terms at least, right on top of one another. Admiral Callahan didn't believe the radar and wanted to clarify the range. They couldn't possibly be this close. He was originally planning to cross the T of the Japanese formation, but there were not one, but several groups of Japanese ships moving independently. Abe, meanwhile, had a different problem. He had no issue engaging the Americans. In fact, this was a great opportunity. Problem was, his battleships were configured for shore bombardment with the special cluster munitions, not armor-piercing and high-explosive for gunfighting enemy ships. If his rounds were to be fully effective, he'd have to pull the heavies back to reload, which would put the Nagara and her destroyers in a really tough situation. After giving it some thought, he decided to do what almost all Japanese commanders do. When in doubt, attack, otherwise known as default aggressive. The Japanese turned into the Americans and advanced. Seeing this, Callahan ordered his ships to do complex maneuvers to match the Japanese ships, but due to not having briefed his commanders the night before on what their roles or even their designations were, no one had a clear idea what was happening and so the US formation broke up just as the Japanese formation had done, with the American ships moving to meet the Japanese ships in their own little groups. All the while, on both sides, the captains of these vessels were frantically sending signals to their respective commanders asking, please, for the love of God, let us shoot. And both sides gave orders to hold fire. This continued until both formations were now intermingled. You heard me correctly. The lead US vessels had to evade in order to prevent collision with the Japanese ships. The distances to targets were now 3,000 yards. What we had was a Mexican standoff while in the middle of the Solomon Islands at 1 a.m. on November 13th, 1942. It was then that Abe made his move. He had closed the range in order to envelop the American formation while simultaneously ensuring that his main guns, armed with the special frag ammunition, had the best chance of doing critical damage. Hiei spotlights flashed on, illuminating USS Atlanta at point-blank range. Oh, sh shit. Ute! Shells began flying from the Japanese ships at the Americans. This initial volley was followed by a barrage of torpedoes. Atlanta's superstructure was immolated, while a torpedo shattered her engineering section. She came to a dead stop, adrift and burning, unable to retaliate against the swarm of enemy ships around her. She would sink later that day.
Meanwhile, the Americans instinctively returned fire at the nearby Japanese ships. The destroyer Akatsuki, which was the lead vessel that illuminated Atlanta, was the nearest target, and it was currently lit up like a Christmas tree. What amounted to the entire American cruiser flotilla and the lead destroyers fired on her all at once. Akatsuki took a hit in her magazine and exploded in a ball of flame, which lit up the surrounding area. Marines on Guadalcanal saw the fight in progress. Robert Leckie was among them. His recount is shown briefly in the TV series The Pacific. That huge explosion in this scene is most likely the Akatsuki. She was quickly followed in this fate by the US destroyer Cushing, who had been the lead ship and was now in the middle of the entire Japanese formation. She got blasted by all the Japanese ships in range. Coming to a dead stop, completely crippled, she kept firing her guns until her main power failed. She too sank later that day. All the while this was happening, Admiral Callahan kept giving confusing orders. He ordered odd ships to fire starboard, and even ships to fire port. The only problem is he hadn't briefed anybody on which ship was which, and who they were supposed to be shooting at. He then gave course orders, which no one could follow because no one had any idea where they were anymore. Their formation had basically ceased to exist. And thus, everyone just swirled around in a melee, trying to work out what to do while shooting everything they had at whatever target they could find. This was the kind of fight the Japanese had trained their whole careers for, and they soon started to gain the upper hand. The American sailors weren't their equal here, and what's worse, they would very soon be within katana range. It was then that the worst case scenario appeared. Out of the darkness, a huge bank of searchlights illuminating targets for her massive guns, came the flagship Hiei. Abe was tearing towards USS San Francisco, which he had identified as the biggest ship and obviously the command ship, given where it was in what was left of the American formation. It was then, something incredible happened. A battle cry, yelled from the darkness. A more ferocious call to arms than any samurai could muster. Alright chumps, let's do this! USS Laffy! The destroyer USS Laffy closed in between the cruisers and Hiei, getting within, and I shit you not, 20 feet of the Japanese battleship. So close that not even her secondary guns could track the destroyer. Laffy unleashed everything she had. The barrels on her AA guns and her 5 inches nearly melted, while men on the decks were firing with machine guns and rifles. It wouldn't surprise me if they even had bayonets on. Hiei's superstructure was obliterated. Admiral Abe was wounded as his chief of staff was instantly killed by shrapnel from Laffy's assault. But as with the meme that inspired the opening of this paragraph, Laffy's colleagues, seeing her dive into the maelstrom without fear, decided, screw it, we'll all go in too. The American destroyers went full send and closed in on Hiei, firing everything while the cruiser squadron fired on her as well over the heads of their comrades. Hiei's crew, though, realizing that there was nothing to be done about the destroyers, as they were inside minimum torpedo range, decided to kill the American flagship. While all this was going on, Hiei pummeled San Francisco, killing Admiral Callahan, while other Japanese ships tried to cover their own flagship, blowing Laffy to pieces. However, Laffy has a spirit that never dies. And we shall see her again. In the chaotic firefight that followed, San Francisco hit Hiei's engineering spaces, flooding them, while she herself was dismantled shell by shell. Then long lances started flying, crippling or outright obliterating American ships. They tried to fight back, sinking the destroyers Amatsukaze and Yudachi, while damaging almost all the other vessels. But they were simply outmatched. Kitashima joined the fray, crippling two of the destroyers, while Nagara and the other destroyers wrapped back around. And it was at this moment, this very moment for the first time that night, that both sides had a moment to breathe. The Americans were down to USS Fletcher and USS Helena, while the Japanese actually had most of their force still able to fight. But Abe, now receiving medical attention, was faced with a dilemma. 
Due to the surface action, he had expended a lot of his ammunition, as well as a lot of time. He could push on to Henderson Field, but that would mean shelling the field with only one battleship instead of two, as he, a his flagship, was now dead in the water. Not to mention that should preparations not be made immediately to launch recovery operations, it would be broad daylight before he could get his forces reorganized. And then there is the convoy coming down the slot behind him. If the surface force he just destroyed is dead, the airmen from Rabaul and Junyo should be able to cover them as Otago and Takao can bring the convoy in. If he regroups with them along with Kirishima, he should be able to assert total surface dominance in the area. Admiral Abe, despite only having two American ships in his way that he could easily sink, decided that he was not equipped to take out Henderson Field, and thus he ordered his force to withdraw. Once again, with victory so nearly in their grasp, a Japanese surface commander pulled back. They stand to learn something from their aviators. Rule 2 of the Dictabolcus clearly states, once an attack is begun, you must see it through to the end. But then again, the man had just taken a bullet to the shoulder in the middle of a horrific close-in firefight, which cost him several ships and all of his ammo. Plus, he had absolutely no idea if the Americans had more ships, because, you know, no radar. So I tend to cut this man a bit of slack, unlike a certain other admiral. As the sun rose, the aftermath could clearly be seen with multiple burning hulks littering Iron Bottom Sound. Portland was still listing and burning. However, upon sighting remaining Japanese destroyers, she fired what guns were still operable, while evacuations took place on both sides. Hiei, meanwhile, was under tow to safety. Yamamoto had ordered the convoy to regroup with the surviving vessels from the previous night, which meant they had to delay their run down the slot in preparation for making a night landing. However, they had failed to hit Henderson Field, their primary objective. Damage control teams aboard Hiei were struggling to restore power. Admiral Abe requested air support to cover the convoy from the Cactus Air Force, who would almost certainly now be on their way. Junyo, the carrier who was at sea 200 kilometers north of the islands, scrambled her entire fighter force, as did Rabaul. An entire wing of Zeros took station above the crippled battleship as she limped back to Truck Lagoon. But they wouldn't be enough, because the Marines were not the only ones hunting them. To rise ready, engage! Let's go. The Grim Reapers descended on the Zeros. They had expected attacks from the Cactus Air Force, and they had weathered an attack from B-17s earlier in the day. What they hadn't reckoned on was USS Enterprise. The dogfight was relatively even, with casualties on both sides, but given the loss of Carrier Division 5, between VF-10 and the Cactus Aviators, the Japanese pilots were outnumbered and steadily pushed back leaving the way open for attack pilots to do their work. Shiny brand new TBF Avengers rolled in on the target. Hiei was crippled and unable to maneuver. Even so, she desperately tried, managing to evade all but one torpedo, which slammed into the main torpedo blister. The dive bombers likewise struggled to hit their target, dodging the second wave of Junyo Zeros while diving in. But three 500-pound bombs from Enterprise's SBDs managed to flood Hiei's steering gear before they beat a hasty retreat. But the sturdy Congo class was still afloat, and as the dust settled from this opening salvo, the Japanese frantically worked to keep their ship alive, pumping the steering section and getting Hiei properly underway again. Admiral Abe, given the circumstances, ordered Captain Nishida to beach the battleship, but Nishida told him to go fornicate himself with his ceremonial sword and that he was going to save his ship. He still had some air cover, though limited, 
and his engineering teams were getting the ship back to running condition. All they needed to do was to make it to the protective envelope of the air cover between Rabaul and Truck, while being out of range of the Cactus Air Force. It wasn't an impossible task. At least it wouldn't have been, if not for the Grey Ghost. As the Japanese damage control teams finally got the steering repaired and the engines running, the lookouts began screaming the alarm. Under the depleted fighter screen, on the deck, at full power, with absolutely no fear, Enterprise's torpedo pilots thundered towards Hiei. Six TBF Avengers in attack formation, lining up their shot. Escape was impossible. All the Japanese sailors could do was watch in horror as the long silvery wakes of torpedoes tracked towards them. The Zeros dove in at the last moment on the attackers, but it was far too late. Two torpedoes slammed into Hiei's side. She was listing and therefore these didn't hit the armor belt, but the waterline. One in the aft quarter and the other one once again into the stern, wrecking the steering compartment completely. After all of their hard work to save it, the crew's efforts were undone in a second. But the ordeal wasn't over. With the Zeros chasing the retreating torpedo planes, they weren't able to respond to the follow-up attack from Enterprise's Dauntless pilots, and they did what they did best. Bombing and strafing here, emptying their guns into the superstructure and the bridge. Captain Nishida, even with bullets whizzing around him, remained at his post, refusing to take cover. He had fought valiantly. He had served as the Admiral's flag officer and ship commander. He had faced his enemy in mortal combat to the death. He would not run from this. But Admiral Abe had strict orders from Yamamoto. Hiei was to be abandoned but not scuttled. She was to serve as a distraction to the American aviators in order to draw fire from the approaching convoy. The crew was to be evacuated to the destroyer screen. However, Abe knew that Nishida wouldn't do it willingly, so he did the only thing an officer in the Imperial Navy would have to answer to. Admiral Abe put the order to abandon ship in writing and sent it over in a cutter with his adjutant carrying it. Nishida, upon receiving it, was seen to be stoic but despondent. This was his ship! But orders from the Yamamoto carry the Emperor's will and he was a Japanese officer sworn to follow those until death. He gave the order to abandon ship. Battleship Hiei would sink, taking 188 men of her crew to the bottom of Iron Bottom Sound. Captain Masao Nishida survived, but he took a staff job, bitter at the loss of his ship. And sadly for the Japanese, that sacrifice was in vain. Realising that Hiei was a doomed ship given how much damage they had done, Enterprise and her marine colleagues had received reports of the transport convoy now approaching. Every single aircraft and every ounce of ordnance they could muster was brought online. Both Enti and Henderson Field launched their entire force. Light was fading fast and they had spent so much effort on Hiei they couldn't let a second go to waste. What followed was a massacre. Rabaul was at the top end of the Solomon's Island chain, while Junyo was still about 150 kilometers north of the islands. Their air groups had put up a good account of themselves earlier in the day. They were, after all, still the finest fighter pilots in the world at the time. But as with their adversaries in the RAF, the problem with being one of the chosen few is that you keep getting fewer. And unlike the rest of the combatants in World War II, the Japanese pilot training programs were kept at their pre-war standards until things got properly desperate and it was far too late. And even then, they didn't have either the aircraft or fuel reserves to properly maintain what high training standard regimens they did have. As a result, replacements did not keep up with their losses. And those that did make it still had the same attritional conditions as their more experienced senpais. The fact was, they just didn't have enough planes or pilots. And they were operating at a much higher range than the Americans. For the rest of the 13th of November and throughout the 14th, Enterprise and the Cactus Air Force 
flew sortie after sortie against the incoming convoy, and it was bordering on cold-blooded murder. The Grim Reapers and the Marines overwhelmed the Zeros, while SPDs and Avengers sent enough ordnance downrange that if you lined it up, you could probably walk to the convoy from their base at Henderson Field. Six of the transports were sunk, while one more was heavily crippled, leaving only four of the transports to continue on. Most of the tanks, artillery, ammo, and most crucially of all, food for the forces in Guadalcanal were consigned to the depths of Iron Bottom Sound. Even so, the remaining men and equipment had to get through to keep the campaign alive. It was hoped that maybe they could keep the garrison going long enough to get another convoy through later in December. But as night fell on the 14th of November 1942, those dreams would be dashed. As the Japanese forces approached Guadalcanal to land their troops, an American surface squadron had arrived to reinforce the survivors of the previous night's engagement. The battle to come seemed to start exactly as the first one had. The Japanese, with a complex formation of multiple ships moving ahead of the convoy, managed to close in on the Americans, despite their superior radar. In the opening stages of the battle, they demolished the destroyer screen, sinking the four ships in it outright. However, unfortunately for them, there is a reason why they call it a screen. Charging through the gloom, two huge shapes came into view. Kirishima, along with Takao, Atago, and the destroyers, led by Iron Army, illuminated the lead ship and saw the USS South Dakota, a battleship armed with nine 16-inch guns. The Japanese reacted just as the Americans had reacted to Hiei last night. Oh, shit! As soon as the illumination came on, a barrage of five-inch fire smacked into Iron Army in the superstructure, setting her ablaze immediately. The Japanese returned fire, pummeling South Dakota with everything they had. But for some reason, the guns on South Dakota weren't firing. But they had just taken fire. Where did that fire come from? Something weird was going on. It turned out that the chief engineer aboard USS South Dakota had been troubleshooting an electrical fault, and as such, he had disabled the breakers. However, this had one problem. If a surge happened, it would start a series failure, and trip the safety on the electrical system, which it did. And as he had disabled the breakers, it ultimately meant that this would shut down power throughout the entire ship, which it did. South Dakota was defenseless, which then, again, begged the question, where the hell did that 5-inch fire come from? As Takao and Otago laid into the target, Kirishima was firing her secondaries while reloading her main battery. And in all of this chaos, they had forgotten. When they were approaching, there were two shapes moving on them. Not just one. Oh no. Oh, yeah! At that precise moment, Admiral Ching Li, five times Olympic gold medalist in marksmanship and certified stone cold badass, ordered his ship, the battleship USS Washington, to open fire with a full broadside of all nine of his 16 inch guns at a distance of 9,000 yards. Kirishima did not stand a chance. With South Dakota sailors cheering them on, Washington blew the Congo class apart like it was nothing. The analysis of Kirishima's remains several decades later showed so many hits it more resembles a scrap heap coral reef than a shipwreck. With the loss of their battleship, the Japanese turned tail and withdrew, scuttling Iron Army as they went. Though US losses were heavy, it would turn out to be a resounding victory. With the knowledge that two full-sized US battleships were tearing towards them, the remainder of the convoy ships beached themselves in the Japanese-held area of Guadalcanal, in the hopes of offloading their gear. But as the sun rose, they found out that the Americans had been watching them the whole time. The marine artillerymen down the coast blanketed the area in 105 shells, while the Cactus Air Force launched wave after wave of aircraft at the poor bastards still trying to unload their gear. The coup de grace, though, came as the destroyer USS Meade arrived on scene and blasted the transports with a withering barrage of 5-inch, 
rendering them flaming funeral pyres for the campaign. They hadn't had time to get their equipment off the ships, and so all they'd achieved was to deliver 2,000 men without food, weapons, or supplies to an already starving garrison. The arrival of Enterprise and her detached battleship escorts had quite literally decided the Battle of Guadalcanal. And once again, Enterprise had made history. She was the first to sink a fleet-class-sized vessel, the first to sink a full-sized fleet carrier, the first to sink multiple carriers in a single engagement, and now she had scored the US Navy's first kill on a battleship of World War II, and the first battleship sunk by the US Navy for over half a century. Enterprise just can't be stopped. In the Japanese camp, meanwhile, there was a sickening realization. Both the army commanders and Admiral Yamamoto knew. The Battle of Guadalcanal was lost. So the question was now how to get their troops out alive for use in future battles. At the rate things were going, they were losing 50 men a day due to starvation, malnutrition-induced disease, malaria, and all the issues an unsupplied army suffers from. But the situation was even worse than they feared. Submarines and long-range recon aircraft had spotted large American troop movements, bringing what seemed to be an entire division of troops to relieve the now exhausted Marines who had fought a campaign that would go down in history as a legend. Even worse still, US Navy reinforcements were inbound, which included, of course, USS Enterprise. They were against the clock and knew it. In December, Emperor Hirohito authorized a complete withdrawal of Japanese forces from Guadalcanal by February. Utilizing the Tokyo Express to make night runs to and from Rabaul to establish a new defensive line further up the Solomons. Problem is, of course, to get everyone out on time, they were going to need to make runs during the day as well. Which, as you recall, is a very bad idea. So they had to achieve air superiority of some kind, or at least air parity, to keep the Americans busy and off base enough to give them some breathing room. Operation K was its name. The objective simple. Throw enough air power at the Cactus Air Force and US Navy to keep them busy in order to get the troops away via the Tokyo Express. As always though, the Americans were listening, but for the first time in a long time, they completely misinterpreted the intelligence. Halsey and the gang read the Japanese build-up in the area as a sign of a renewed offensive, and thus threw everything they had into the region in order to draw the Japanese to a battle they could win. A troop convoy was dispatched in preparation for a renewed landing, along with a reinforcing surface group full of cruisers and destroyers, augmented by escort carriers and supported by the Enterprise Task Force. The Japanese spotted the convoy escort force on the evening of January 29th, 1943, while intelligence sources reported the departure of the troop transports. Fearing that these were troops being brought to take advantage of their weakness instead of the defensive force they actually were, Rabaul scrambled their bombers to interdict them near Rennell Island at the entrance to the Solomons. As the sun began to go down, the combat air patrols covering the various task forces returned to their carriers. The Japanese bombers, however, being bombers, are all trained instrument flyers and pressed their attack at sunset. The Americans were taken completely by surprise, sailing in column, unprepared for what was about to hit them. 32 Mitsubishi bombers, 16 G3Ms and 16 G4Ms swooped in on a torpedo run as a Jake recon aircraft dropped flares to mark their approach. Flak began lighting up the darkening sky as the first wave of 16 bombers pushed in. The destroyers and cruisers scattered, evading the torpedoes that followed, while claiming one of the bombers which crashed in flames in the middle of their churning wakes. Believing this attack to be the only one though, the commander of the escorts, Admiral Griffin, ordered the force to regroup, which put the cruisers in a compromising position just in time for the second wave of bombers to strike. Coming in at wave top height, the G4Ms tracked in on one of the biggest ships they could see, the cruisers up front. The AA guns once again began blazing away, knocking down two of the bombers, including the flight lead, but this did not deter the Japanese as they released their torpedoes. 
One of the weapons slammed into USS Wichita, but luckily for the crew aboard it, it was a dud. For USS Chicago, however, there was no such reprieve. Two torpedoes slammed into her machinery spaces, bringing her to a dead stop almost immediately, while killing a number of the crew. During the chaos, the Japanese beat a hasty retreat, their job done for the evening. But rest assured, they'd be back tomorrow. Chicago was taken under tow as the Americans recovered their composure. Enterprise, as a result of this, was ordered to link up fully with the formation and integrate the Grim Reapers into their combat air patrol to cover them all the way to Guadalcanal. Throughout the next day, January 30th, Japanese recon aircraft circled the various American task forces, tracking their movements in preparation to launch strikes in the afternoon. But every time they had tried to get precise locations, Enterprise's fighters chased them away. Even so, bases on New Guinea scrambled bombers, and 11 G4M Bettys made their way towards the US ships. At 1540, Enterprise's radar picked up the formation, along with the lead scout aircraft, and scrambled its alert fighters. The Wildcats turned in towards the bombers, which appeared to be heading towards the carrier group. However, their true aims became apparent. The Bettys turned in on the wounded USS Chicago and her escorts, aiming to finish what their comrades from Rabaul had started, but this time the Grim Reapers were waiting. As the bombers lined up their attack run, the combat air patrol descended on them. There were no zeros to cover them, and as such the Americans committed fully to the attack. The lead scout of the formation was sent down in a ball of flame, while the alert force of 10 Wildcats dove in on the attackers through their own anti-aircraft screen. Two more bombers went down into the sea before they could deploy their torpedoes, but the attack run had been perfectly timed to evade the beat of the combat air patrol. However, it would cost them their lives. The remaining aircraft released their weapons, which began heading towards their targets. Having carried out their duty, all that remained was their fate, which the pilots of VF-10 helped them meet presently, tearing the unarmored Mitsubishis to shreds scattering their wreckage across the surface of the water, along with the men inside. But their mission was complete. A full volley of torpedoes slammed into USS Chicago, while an outlying torpedo heavily damaged USS Lavalette. The cruiser was doomed at that very moment. Her crew abandoned ship as the wounded destroyer limped away, the sinking of this ship took a whole squadron of bombers and their crews, but their psychological impact was far more important. Due to the increased air activity across the board, as well as this successful attack, American forces pulled back into the Coral Sea in preparation for what they suspected to be a new Japanese offensive, allowing the Japanese to successfully evacuate from Guadalcanal and bring their naval forces safely back into their air defense umbrella. By February, the first major American campaign in the Pacific was over. And while it wasn't a decisive victory, it was nevertheless an incredible one. And it would not have been possible without the brave men aboard the US Navy's finest lady, USS Enterprise. Now it was the time to turn to a new offensive north. The Japanese had to be fully pushed out of the Solomons and New Guinea. However, to the north, storm clouds were brewing. A typhoon of Nippon Steel was preparing to put to sea. Carrier Division 5 had re-equipped, and new carriers were entering service with combined fleet. The world's two largest warships were based in an anchorage akin to a fortress, staring down the world, daring all brave enough to do battle and island after island had airfields being constructed, defended by thousands of battle-hardened soldiers ready to die for their emperor rather than surrender. Enterprise, scarred by constant battles since the beginning of the war over a year ago, stood alone. Her hangar deck still bearing that sign, Enterprise versus Japan. It seemed that again, once more, she would stand as the free world's only protector in the Pacific. Hey, Enterprise! We've 
got it from here. I'm Essex, the first of many and full of fight. I'm intrepid, defending our legacy. Bunker Hill, never surrender, never sink. Ticonderoga, on the seas and in the sky. Shangri-La, strike from the heavens. Lexington 16, forging the future. Task Force 58! With the arrival of the Essex-class carriers, Enterprise finally got a chance to return for her refit. On the 27th of May 1943, she returned to Pearl Harbor where Nimitz honoured her with the first ever presidential unit citation awarded to an aircraft carrier in United States naval history. Her air group were detached and sent back to the mainland for special training, while Enterprise herself was sent to Puget Sound Naval Yard for refit up to modern standards. She needed extensive overhauls to repair all the battle damage she had suffered from her valiant service. It was so bad that Vestal and a crew of Seabees had been aboard her, keeping her afloat all the way back to Pearl Harbor. Improving her defenses was therefore obviously the biggest priority, if she was going to survive the ever-increasing lethality of the battle space. And so, when she docked in Puget Sound on the 20th of July 1943, a question was asked. How many guns do you want on this thing? To which the response was yes. The sheer amount of firepower added to this ship boggles the mind. As Drakinifel so often says, this was going to be American levels of anti-air defense. Eight 5-inch guns, 40 40mm Bofors guns, 50 20mm Orlikon cannons, and enough ammunition to fight a police action single-handedly. Upgrades were made to all of her internal systems and radar, while adding huge armored blisters under the waterline for added stability and greatly enhanced protection from the deadly Japanese torpedoes. But as the title of this chapter suggests, and the fact that her air wing was on a special training rotation, there was one really big change to Enterprise's role that once again made her a pioneer and a legend. CV-6 was to be the first ever knight-capable carrier, designation CVN. And given her successor, you know why that's so perfect. The Reapers and their strike colleagues, meanwhile, were to become the experts at the cutting edge of naval aviation. However, there was one more vital change before she was combat ready. A new coat of paint. And emblazoned on her decks were the symbols she would be known by for all time. All who flew over her would be graced with a giant but singular numeral. The number six. It was time for the Grey Ghost to get back in action. Enterprise pulled into Pearl Harbor on November 7th, 1943, for her new assignment. Her assignment was to provide the long-awaited night strike capability to the Fast Carrier Task Force, designated Task Force 58. And to give you an idea where we're at, this is a picture of what Task Force 58 looked like in 1944. Just look at it. Military industrial complex go I got seven Mac 11s, about eight, 38, nine, nine, ten, Mac 10, the ships never end. Enterprise's first combat action after her refit was in support of retaking Macon Atoll by the 27th Infantry Division from November 19th to the 21st. The brand new F6F Hellcats with their multi-role capability proved to be outstanding at close air support. Unfortunately, though, the invasion was a bit of a fiasco. Japanese submarine I-175 managed to penetrate the ASW screen and sink the escort carrier USS Liscombe Bay with a direct hit to the ammunition storage hold, detonating the ship and killing 644 men. 
while the amphibious operation was a victim of bad intelligence, getting stuck on reefs and sandbars not discovered during the initial invasion reconnaissance. Nevertheless, the Americans managed to take the island after defeating the 400-man garrison, but the price was a costly one. But Enterprise came into her own during the aftermath of this operation and proved her new capability. On the 26th of November, a wing of G4M Bettys launched a night attack on US Task Force 50.2, attached to the invasion force. Enterprise scrambled its fighter squadron on the alert status, VF-2. In command of VF-2 was the legendary Navy ace Butch O'Hare. The fighters were vectored onto the oncoming Japanese formation, and spotting them against the dark indigo sky, commenced their attack. Several bombers went down in flames, while the remainder unloaded their defensive guns at the black shapes in the gloom. The Japanese were taken completely unawares. They had heard no reports or even thought it possible that they would face naval night fighters. In an uncharacteristic panic, they ditched their bombs and ran for home. Their job done, the Americans returned to base only to find themselves one man missing. And it was the unthinkable. The man who failed to return was Butch O'Hare. It's assumed he took critical damage or was killed outright by return fire from the bombers, as no shoot was seen or radio call made. He simply vanished and was never found. But war does not leave time to mourn, and Enterprise was the only night-capable strike weapon the US Navy had available, and they needed her for a mission which a year ago would have been near suicidal. So, you remember that massive fortress garrisoned by the two biggest battleships ever built, surrounded by hundreds of AA guns, five airfields full of Zeros, and enough soldiers to successfully police Chicago? Yeah. Truck Lagoon, Japan's fleet base in the South Pacific and target number one for US air power in the region. But now Enterprise had night capability. And moreover, she had an entire battle group of younger sisters in the Essex class, eager to lay waste to their enemies. And so a plan was drawn up by Nimitz to finally neutralize Truck Lagoon. The operation was titled Operation Hailstone. On February 17th, 1944, Enterprise Essex Intrepid Bunker Hill and Yorktown II, along with their escort carriers, moved into position. Between them, they had 500 planes and a plan. In the early morning darkness, the first wave of fighters launched, followed by the TBF Avengers, led by Enterprise's bomb group. After getting airborne and forming up, the entire strike force dropped to wave top height, flying at under 100 feet all the way to the target. Japanese radar was not as sophisticated as the sets used in Europe or the United States, and as such, they had no raid warning until lookouts sighted the raid approaching the target. The Grim Reapers upon this moment punched their engines and gained height above the bombers, while the Avengers moved in on the Japanese airfields. The Zeros on alert tried to get airborne, but only the aircraft on immediate standby managed to get up. Of the 300 Japanese aircraft based at Truck, only 80 managed to launch. The rest were incinerated by Enterprise and Intrepid's Avenger pilots, who blanketed the airfields in cluster munitions and incendiary bombs. As the Zeros turned to engage the bombers that had hit their airfield, they were set upon by the Grim Reapers, along with their colleagues from the other four carriers. The new Hellcats had huge engines, 650 cal machine guns, and pilots with hundreds of hours on type in training. The older A6M2s and A6M3s were already too slow to keep up with them, and even in the most favourable conditions they would have had a hard time beating them. In this situation, just after takeoff, no altitude, no speed, no warning, no chance. The Americans hit them again and again throughout the day, with almost the entire air garrison of truck being wiped out with the loss of only four Hellcats. The Americans had achieved air superiority over the target, and now they intended to use it. The airfields, having been suppressed, were finished off in the second wave, leaving the lagoon completely helpless against the systematic dismemberment that was about to take place. Luckily for the Japanese, they had recognized the vulnerability of Truck since the loss of Guadalcanal and the Solomons, which led them to withdraw Yamato and Musashi to their anchorage in the home islands. But the unfortunate fact was that this base had the majority of their infrastructure in their outer defense perimeter. And as a result, a large contingent of their transport shipping still transited through Truck regularly. 
The Americans launched multiple raids throughout the day, sinking over 200,000 tons of shipping. Two cruisers, four destroyers, three auxiliary cruisers, six auxiliary support vessels of various types and purpose, and 32 merchants. This was on top of over 250 aircraft, all of the base infrastructure, and 4,500 personnel. But the most impressive fact of all of this? Well, due to their ability to operate at night, the later strikes were exclusively conducted by Enterprise, representing the first radar-guided night attack by carrier-launched aircraft. The pilots of USS Enterprise would claim a third of all the ships sunk during Operation Hailstone, while the Reapers took a similarly hefty toll on the Zeros. The highest individual score across both categories among all of the carriers present. The next few weeks would prove frantically busy for Enterprise as she, along with her fellow carriers, sailed through the Caroline Islands as part of Operation Cartwheel, the ongoing campaign to encircle Rabaul and finish the Solomon Islands campaign once and for all. She launched strikes on Peleliu, Yap, Ulithi, and Woliai before sailing to support amphibious landings in New Guinea. It was a busy couple of months, but she executed her duties with the same lethal efficiency she always displayed. And it was then she was ordered back to the forward replenishment base on Majuro Island in the Marshalls to stand by for an upcoming offensive. Task Force 58 was to be the primary striking force in support of a campaign to take the Marianas Islands and to liberate Guam. And at the core of this operation was the island of Saipan and its airfields. Taking this island would give the Americans a base from which they could operate a brand new aircraft they were developing to strike the Japanese home islands. And there were quiet rumors in the upper levels of the Pentagon that it was also intended to carry a secret weapon. The Japanese, likewise, were committed. This was sovereign Japanese territory. Their territory. Allowing the enemy to take it would be a dishonor to both the army and navy, and it was one they could not accept, especially the navy, who after their Pyrrhic victory at Santa Cruz had failed to halt the oncoming American threat, and allowed their commander-in-chief, Admiral Yamamoto, to be assassinated by the enemy. They had to be stopped here. Combined fleet had a new armored fleet carrier, the Taiho. They had Yamato and Musashi. They had Kongo and Haruna. But most vital of all, they had Carrier Division 5, Shokaku and Zuikaku, who were both freshly equipped with new air groups. And that was just the capital ships. The light carrier force of the Imperial Japanese Navy was still very much in play, but the fact was the Japanese pilot losses had been horrific, and unlike the Allies, their reserves of trained manpower was much lower than the required number of replacements. The naval aviators of Combined Fleet were a shadow of their predecessors, but that was of little concern. The Kantai Kessen, the decisive battle, was once again upon them. This was their last chance to blunt the American offensive. If the Americans took Saipan, they could strike the homeland, their emperor. They must be stopped here. They must go this far and no further. Combined fleet under Admiral Ozawa put to sea. This would be the decider of his country's fate. History would come to know the upcoming showdown as the Battle of the Philippine Sea. But that's not its true name. The name of that battle was granted to it by the aviators of USS Lexington, CV-16, and it has been passed down through the generations to this very day as the tale of how the Japanese Naval Air Service died. This battle is known by this name. They'll come loud and they'll come fast But we shoot first and we can last Keep your rifle by your side Sing in, oh Lord This earth was made for us Sing in, oh Lord USS Enterprise, alongside the other ships of Task Force 58, ran an extensive air campaign throughout the Marianas, striking Guam, Saipan, and Rota amongst other targets. The Japanese had not expected a push this far north so soon. Rather, they were certain a campaign to secure the rest of the Southern Pacific, or perhaps an offensive launched into Indonesia to threaten their oil supplies. This is what led them to realize that their goal was air bases to attack the home islands. 
The problem was, while Saipan and Guam were veritable fortresses, guarded with the largest concentration of Japanese armoured units outside of China and Kyushu, as well as tens of thousands of men in well-entrenched positions, their air power was diffused amongst all their other installations, to guard truck, which as we saw didn't go as planned, as well as other major islands such as Rabaul and Peleliu, meaning they only had a force of around 50 land-based aircraft in the Marianas as a whole. This is what led to the aforementioned mass deployment of what amounted to the entire Japanese Navy. It was the only way to get enough assets in theatre to have a hope of achieving victory. If they could disrupt the landing forces and drive off Task Force 58, Yamato and Musashi could get amongst the transports and massacre the landing force in a counterattack. The odds were long. Like, really, really long. But it was all or nothing at this point. By contrast, the Americans had, as the youth of today say, aircraft for literal days. They outnumbered the Japanese two to one in aircraft, and what's even crazier is that the quality of those planes and their pilots was far superior. The Japanese, due to their industrial and technological limitations, had not been able to field new aircraft capable of meeting the American threat, at least not with their naval aviation designs. The newer Judy naval bomber was a step in the right direction, as were the later models of A6M5, but there simply weren't enough of them. The army was having better luck with the Ki-61 and the Ki-84 designs, and there was some hope in the horizon for the navy. The N1K Shiden Kai was one of the best fighters of World War II, and it had started service, at least in limited numbers, in 1943. But they, as I mentioned, were even rarer than the other designs, and worst of all, despite being a naval fighter, they were not carrier capable. And so, this battle would be fought once again, with Zeros, Vals, and Kates, versus Hellcats, Avengers, Corsairs, and Helldivers, although some FM2 Wildcats and SPDs were still present at this battle. As dawn of June 15th, 1944 swept the horizon, Amtraks began rolling off LSTs, forming a gagglefuck the likes of which mankind hadn't yet seen. Thousands upon thousands of malicious beings, fueled by nicotine, crayons, and hatred, slowly made their way towards the beaches. No longer were they the under-resourced and undermanned shambles that held the line two years prior against all odds. No, these were well-equipped, heavily armed, lean, mean marines. And in the words of Union Cavalry Commander John Buford at the Battle of Gettysburg, there would be a devil to pay. The Japanese were waiting for them. As the Amtraks approached the coral and shallows, the crews noticed odd flags fixed at various intervals, and then they realized with horror that the Japanese had planned way farther ahead than they thought. Range markers. Artillery began hitting the landing craft with deadly precision, killing hundreds of men before they even got to the beaches. The ones that did make it were very soon cut down by overlapping fields of fire from machine guns. Over a thousand men fell battling through those defences. But as they struggled through, the pillboxes and gun positions were systematically obliterated by airstrikes delivered by none other than USS Enterprise and her colleagues. By nightfall, the Americans had managed to establish a beachhead which they held against a brutal counterattack, one of the most incredibly tense battles of the entire Pacific War, inflicting devastating losses on the Japanese, wiping out much of their remaining armor in the process. The commander of naval infantry and what little air power on Saipan there was, one Admiral Chuichi Nagamo, yep, he's back advised Vice Admiral Ozawa of the situation. And so the fateful decision was made. The Kantai Kesen. The decisive battle would be fought here. And the entirety of Combined Fleet sailed to meet the invaders. Meanwhile, Nimitz, who was coordinating with Admiral Spruance, had been reading reports on large Japanese fleet movements while keeping up to date with the landings on Saipan. It was then he got an urgent signal from USS Flying Fish, a Gatto-class submarine conducting recon as an advance picket. They had spotted what to them looked like the entire Japanese navy sailing straight towards the Marianas. 
This was likewise met with reports from other submarines that detected smaller groups of surface ships, including battleships, coming from all axes of advance still under Japanese control. Both Spruance and Nimitz agreed that this had to be the all-or-nothing play they suspected would come sooner or later, and that every Japanese ship still afloat was coming to the party. This was followed by a signal intercepted from a lone communications vessel. Admiral Ozawa was sending word ahead to Guam that he wanted to use the airfield to forward stage his aircraft after their initial strikes. At this news, the Task Force 58 commander, Admiral Mitcher, wanted to sail his forces into an attack position, ready to strike first. But Spruance instead saw this as an opportunity. Instead of meeting the attack, let's play their game and set a trap. Frag orders went out to the fighter squadrons across the fleet. Combat air patrols would go up at dawn, while an entire wing of Hellcats would be ordered to conduct a defensive combat air patrol and fighter sweep over Guam, Rota, and the surrounding islands. If the Japanese wanted to come have a go, the Americans would be more than happy to oblige them. After all, they had radar, superior aircraft, an integrated air defense network, and the new anti-aircraft refits completed across all vessels, which came with proximity-fused ammunition. Any frontal assault by aircraft against them without adequate numbers of experienced pilots in good planes would be flat out suicidal. Unfortunately, the Japanese would later prove they had no hesitation in that regard. On the 19th of June 1944, the morning was filled with activity on both sides. Aircraft from Guam began taking off in search of the American fleet, while Enterprise and her pilots began prepping to launch. At 5.50am, a single zero on his search patrol found Task Force 58 sailing into the wind to launch aircraft, and immediately radioed the fleet's position. This done, he dived in on one of the destroyer pickets to deposit his bomb that he had on board. It was then that this poor Japanese aviator discovered the advances the Americans had made in their anti-aircraft defense, when he was immediately obliterated by concentrated fire. Realizing that they had now been spotted, USS Bella Wood expedited its launch procedures and scrambled its entire contingent of Hellcats to cover the combat air patrol mission over Guam. They had arrived just as the main strike group of Zeros were taking off, just as had happened at Truck several months before. The poor Japanese pilots had absolutely no hope of survival, and in the ensuing dogfight, 35 aircraft were shot down to the loss of one Hellcat. They then set about strafing the airfield and suppressing the defenders when an alarm call came through their headsets. Hey Rube! Hey Rube! Hey Rube! The emergency recall message. Task Force 58's air defense radar pickets had picked up a large formation of Japanese aircraft, several of them in fact, incoming to strike the American carrier force. Immediately all US aircraft were launched. The fighters formed up into their squadrons to be vectored for intercept, while the bombers moved to staging areas away from the main battle area for safety. Spruance wanted the carriers to be empty should they take any hits in order to preserve his force as much as possible. At that point, a raid count was reported to the commander of air operations. 68 bandits in total were out there in the first wave, but for some reason, they were scattered in smaller groups. The Japanese had not formed up after launch, Rather, they had decided to stage immediately prior to launching the attack outside of the area of Task Force 58's control. While this is optimal both in attack coordination and fuel economy, it doesn't factor in the reality that the Americans would have seen them on radar. In the time it took for the Japanese attack to get organized, Task Force 58's fighters were vectored onto them. The Hellcats from Enterprise and Lexington reached the Japanese first. The Grim Reapers once again proved that their name was well earned, tearing into a formation of Zeros, while Lexington's pilots went after the bomber formation behind them. Lieutenant Alexander Vreshu from VF-16 lined up on the formation of newer Judy bombers and engaged. The pilots were either very well disciplined or brand new, most likely the latter, as they didn't maneuver or change formation in an effort to foil his attack. They maintained their speed and heading. In just under 8 minutes, Alex Vreshu had shot down 6 of the bombers before breaking off his attack. He wouldn't get a chance to go in for another run, however, as the remainder of the Hellcats from the other carriers joined the fray. 25 Japanese planes had been shot down in that initial engagement with Enterprise and Lex, 
but the ordeal wasn't over. At the hands of Essex, Bunker Hill, and half a dozen other fighter groups, another 17 were blasted out of the sky, leaving only 27 aircraft left to conduct an attack. Realizing that getting through to the carriers would be nearly impossible, they decided to attack the battleships and destroyers, providing the anti-aircraft screen, in the hopes that they could soften them up enough to give their comrades in the second and third waves a chance. The Hellcats broke off, leaving the anti-air gunners a clear field of fire, which they used to great effect. As a wall of lead flew into the sky, even more Japanese aircraft went up in flames or broke apart. From a raid of 68 aircraft, they were now down to six planes. Spotting USS South Dakota, they rolled in for an attack, but due to the weight of fire and the inexperience of the crews, only one bomb made contact, killing 50 men but otherwise doing no serious damage. However, the price they paid for that one hit did not equate in the slightest, and their day was only going to get a lot worse. As that doomed first wave of aircraft was disappearing over the horizon from their carriers, the second wave began launch operations on the now empty flight decks. Taiho, the flagship with Admiral Ozawa on board, was leading the second wave with her air group, and as such she was into the wind, sailing straight and true. One after another, a total of 42 aircraft lifted from her decks, quickly followed by aircraft from Shokaku and Suikaku. They were completely unaware that the submarine USS Albacore had been stalking the formation for the past two hours and had gotten inside their ASW screen. Failures in her targeting computer meant they had to aim by sight, but they had gotten close enough that it really didn't matter. A full spread of six torpedoes began their run against Taiho. Four of the torpedoes were wide, leaving only two to do the job. One of the last aircraft that had launched from Taiho, however, spotted the launch, and in an act of incredible bravery, dove his aircraft into the path of one of the torpedoes. But ultimately, one weapon made it through. And of all the places to hit, it hit the one place on a Japanese carrier that will kill it. USS Albacore's last torpedo smashed into the Taiho's hull directly underneath the aviation fuel tanks. While this on the surface did not seem fatal, as it had done with the carriers of Kido Butai, the enclosed hangar decks, and the excessive number of watertight bulkheads all the way up to Taiho's armoured flight deck meant that fuel leaks and gasoline vapour spread flammable material all throughout the ship. So you now have a bunch of enclosed spaces filled with a fuel air mixture which is on a ship that is operating both weapons and performing aircraft maintenance. And that maintenance is performed with things like welding torches and generators. Taiho exploded, completely destroying the ship along the length of the flight deck, killing 1,650 men. Admiral Ozawa, being on the bridge, survived, and so along with his staff, he immediately transferred his flag to Zuikaku in order to keep track of the battle. Though I have a feeling at this point he probably wished that the explosion had incinerated him, as the news he was receiving was nothing short of disastrous. As the drama at the Japanese fleet played out, the Americans were in complete control of the situation, though it was a tense one. The second wave that Taiho had initiated was now reaching their radar picket line, a raid count of 107 aircraft. This time, though, the Hellcats were airborne and intercepted them head-on, 60 miles away from the task force. 50 cal tracer arced through the sky, drawing lines of death as the naval aviators smelled blood. The enemy was in their sights and at their mercy. However, no mercy would be shown. Of the 107 aircraft in Wave 2, 70 were shot down before they even saw the US carrier group. The remaining 30, knowing their fate was sealed, disregarded reason or sanity and dove headlong through the defensive AA screen at the nearest carrier they could find. The ship they found was USS Enterprise. But if you think she was going to stand for this, you are gravely mistaken. The Grey Ghost made highly erratic evasive turns. Her hangar bays being empty meant she almost took flight herself. One torpedo exploded in her wake and no hits were scored. Her gunners, meanwhile, did not miss their mark, sending several of the attackers down in flames. The remaining Japanese aircraft tried to hit the USS Princeton, but were gunned down by AA fire before they could even get close. 
107 Japanese aircraft attacked Task Force 58 in Wave 2. Only 10 made it back. The damage they had inflicted was nil. As the first flights of Hellcats landed, Alex Vreshu hopped out of his cockpit aboard Task Force 58's flagship, the Lady Lex, and he was received with a hero's welcome. He saw Admiral Mitchell looking down on him from the bridge catwalk. He grinned and held up six fingers. At that moment, a correspondent asked him to hold the gesture and snapped this iconic photograph. An image which became the symbol of the battle, as well as giving the battle its name. As while Lexington's pilots reported their incredible scores, one of them was heard to say, Hell, it's like an old-time turkey shoot. Meanwhile, back at the Japanese fleet, another US submarine was stalking closer to its prey. While USS Albacore had made its attack and drawn the destroyer screen towards them, USS Kavala had used the chaos to close in on the biggest target in the formation. Shokaku was just finishing up her evolutions from recovering the survivors of the attack against Task Force 58 and was now in the process of rearming and refueling them. At that moment, a full spread of torpedoes slammed into her starboard side. Once again, the enclosed hangar decks proved fatal as the torpedo which hit the bow shattered the aviation fuel tanks while cooking off the aircraft being rearmed. This started a chain reaction along the ship, eventually hitting the munition storage, which went up like a fireball that rapidly began burning out of control. Eventually, after a few minutes, the vapor from the ruptured fuel lines reached critical temperature and ignited. Shokaku exploded, killing 1,253 men. Two of the three fleet carriers the battle began with had been lost. All that remained was Zuikaku and an assortment of light carriers. But a carrier without an air group is just a boat. And by the end of the day, their air groups would be gone. The third attack wave of Japanese aircraft was intercepted further out from the American task force than the others by a wing of 40 Hellcats. The Japanese lost seven planes in the initial pass, and upon realizing they could not get near the enemy task force before losses became critical, they wisely chose to abort their mission, meaning that they would survive to return to what was left of Kido Butai. The fourth wave, though, would not be so lucky. The fourth wave had been given an incorrect heading to the American task force and got lost. Being split up and disorganized, they decided to return to the base on Guam. As they did so, though, a contingent of 18 aircraft once again stumbled across none other than USS Enterprise. However, her combat air patrol was up, and the Grim Reapers spotted them first. They would go on to shoot down nine of them before they could even start their attack. The surviving nine aircraft, realizing that that was a bad idea, switched their focus to Wasp and Bunker Hill, but scored no hits. Only one of the 18 attackers managed to escape, but the American fighter pilots weren't done. They realized the amount of damage they had done to the first two waves, and thus detailed several flights of Hellcats to sweep Guam's airfields in case any stragglers diverted to land there instead of the carriers. And they did this without realizing that the fourth wave had aborted there. And so as the remaining 49 Japanese aircraft entered the landing pattern, the Americans jumped them. 30 of the Japanese planes were shot down, while the other 19 were so heavily damaged they were written off on landing. Throughout the rest of the day, Roving fighter sweeps caught stragglers and cleared the way for search and rescue efforts for what few US pilots were shot down. As the 19th of June 1944 ended, the Americans had lost 30 aircraft and suffered light damage to one ship, and the pilots of those aircraft were mostly recovered. The Japanese, by contrast, had lost two fleet carriers, over 350 aircraft, and thousands of men. And the worst part of all for them was, as night fell, Task Force 58 moved into attack position. The battle wasn't over. But amazingly enough, it was then that the Japanese themselves finally had a stroke of luck. After the devastating losses they had suffered, Admiral Ozawa decided to reposition his carriers west and launch attacks from his air groups that he assumed were safely on the ground at Guam. 
he had no idea that they had already been destroyed. This meant that when the Americans went looking for where the Japanese had been, they were long gone. Almost the whole day went by when a scout from USS Enterprise finally found Kido Batai. The problem was they were approaching the limit of strike range, and given it was 14.30 or 2.30pm when the report came in, that gave the Americans only one chance to hit the Japanese before operations would have to be concluded. Mitchell ordered a full-scale attack with multiple waves to launch in sequence. The first wave of 226 aircraft, 95 Hellcats, 54 Avengers, 51 Helldivers and 26 Dauntlesses, took off, formed up and headed to the target. It was then that a frantic message came through from Enterprise's scout. Their range calculation had been incorrect. The Japanese were actually 60 miles further away than they thought. Mitcher immediately cancelled the subsequent waves of aircraft, but not wanting to lose this opportunity to counterattack, he ordered the first wave to continue on mission. Zuikaku's combat air patrol, 35-0 strong, was orbiting Kido Butai and getting ready to organize recovery for the night. As the sun began to set, however, they noted a large black cloud swarming towards them. Over 200 American aircraft from Task Force 58 intent on delivering the final knockout blow to the Japanese Navy. Stopping them was not going to happen. As such, the only thing they could do was dive in and try to take down as many of the enemy as they could. But with 95 Hellcats between them and the bombers, it was never really going to pose a true threat. The combat air patrol was swept aside as though they weren't there, clearing the way for the Avengers and dive bombers to hit their targets. Enterprise's air group was in one of the leading elements. Seeing the other flights breaking off to hit different targets, VB and VT-10 split off between the ships. The Avengers zoned in on Ryuho, dropping their bombs. However, they only inflicted minor shock damage with near misses from their main bomb load. The dive bombers, however, had better luck. They had chosen the biggest target and the current flagship, Zuikaku. Near misses caused shock damage to her hull as well, but one bomb managed to hit the flight deck and detonated in the hangar bay, starting fires. But fully aware to the danger and light on aircraft, she did not suffer the same fate as her sisters. Her neighbouring carrier Hiyo did not. A flight of Avengers from USS Bellawood slammed her with torpedoes and bombs. Like the other carriers before, the same fatal flaw doomed the ship. A fuel air explosion detonated the hull, setting her ablaze, rendering her dead in the water, ultimately leading her to sink stern first. The Japanese ships had began to evade and scatter, managing to avoid serious damage other than superficial hits. But with the loss of Hiyo, Taiho and Shokaku, along with the entirety of the fleet's aircraft, the battle was now done, and no one could deny the scale of the Americans' victory. They had destroyed the entire Imperial Japanese Naval Air Service for less than 40 aircraft and minor damage to South Dakota. But in a twist of fate, the Americans would end up balancing the score themselves. Due to the miscalculation of range when the attack was launched, it became clear to the aviators and the flag officers of Task Force 58 that a large number of the strike package would not be able to return to the fleet and be forced to ditch. Worse still, they had attacked at sunset, meaning those landings would be night landings, something only the Enterprise aviators were really trained to do. At 2045, the first American aircraft began arriving, running on literal fumes. Knowing that their pilots wouldn't be able to see, they made a risky but necessary tactical decision. All of a sudden, the lights of Task Force 58 flashed on. All the carriers lit up like Christmas trees, while all the surface warships began firing star shells to bring the raiders back home. A radio call went out for all returning aircraft that restrictions on landing protocols were completely lifted. If you can find a carrier, just land on it. We'll sort out who belongs where tomorrow. This led to a tense situation where two aircraft tried landing on Enterprise simultaneously, but miraculously, they avoided crashing and were successfully recovered. Aircraft from all over the fleet ended up on every single open flight deck, to the extent that half of Enterprise's landings were from other carriers. 
while her flight group ended up scattered across all throughout the carriers and the fleet. This organized chaos took place all over Task Force 58 in one giant scramble to get aboard. But despite these frankly Herculean efforts, 80 aircraft still ended up ditching, with three quarters of the crews being rescued. Sadly, however, some aircraft crashed on landing due to running out of fuel, while others went down unseen by air sea rescue, costing the aviators aboard them their lives. It was an unceremonious and tragic end to what had been a miraculously decisive victory. They had accomplished their mission. The Marines on Saipan were safe from the naval and air threat, and Kido Batai, it seemed, had been vanquished once and for all. But not completely. Suikaku, her air wing decimated, and her sister dead, limped home with her wounded comrades throughout the night. The outcome of the war was now no longer in doubt. It was over. At one time, she and her sister sailed alongside the mightiest naval force the world had ever seen, and now... And now that seemed like a distant memory. A hollow and pathetic joke in the face of the raw power that she had just witnessed. They couldn't stand against this. They had no help coming. There was no reinforcements, no saving grace. There was nothing. The Americans would take Saipan. Her old commander would die. Her countrymen, the men which she pledged to protect, they would all die and the enemy would be in range of her homeland. Suikaku was alone. There was no help coming. Of the original carriers of Kido Butai, which struck fear into the enemy, she was the very last one left. She was alone. Her country, her family, her home, all of them would burn, and there was absolutely nothing that she could do to stop it. There can be no peace in the world until the military power of Japan is destroyed. Substantial portions of Japan's key industrial centers have been leveled to the ground in a series of record incendiary raids. What has already happened to Tokyo will happen to every Japanese city if the Japanese insist on continuing resistance beyond the point of reason. Our blows will destroy their whole modern industrial plant and organization which they have built up during the past century and which they are now devoting to a hopeless cause. Only surrender can prevent the kind of ruin as a result of continued useless resistance. Thank you.
Empty. The hangar decks were empty. The ocean around them was empty. And their nation's cause, empty. Admiral Ozawa on the bridge of Zwikaku scanned the horizon, seeing nothing but the small task force around him. So this is the mighty air fleet of the Japanese Navy, he thought bitterly. One full-sized flight deck and three escorts. Total number of aircraft? 116. Command had even been so gracious enough to assign him the Issei-class hybrid battleship aircraft carriers to make up the numbers. Yet no one had thought to give him any aircraft with them. Not that they had the pilots to fly them anyway. This trip was going to be one way. A glorious final battle to force a decision in the field. Then again, we've had several final battles now, haven't we? There always seems to be one more. But not this time. Zwikaku and the pilots aboard her represented the very last of Kido Butai, and even then, most of them were replacements. The few experienced pilots they had left were either promoted to command far earlier than one would expect or require, or walking wounded holding instructor's positions. In the last two weeks alone, the Americans had destroyed over 500 aircraft, a third of those with their crews. Very soon, we're going to be flying with cadets in biplanes. That's why Command recently approved the long-discussed plans that, up until now, were deemed too desperate even for them. Kamikaze. The Divine Wind, which blew away the invading Mongols centuries before, would now blow again, at the cost of Japan's youngest, best, and brightest. It could work, of course. If their carrier fleet could draw the Americans away, it could give his colleagues in the battleship force an opening to hit the enemy fleet anchored offshore. Admiral Kurita was in command of Yamato and Musashi, the mightiest warships ever to sail, with every battleship, cruiser and destroyer Japan had left in support. The resulting slaughter would rout the US Navy, and it very well could give the island garrison a chance, forcing the Americans to the negotiation table. It could work. But was it worth the huge cost they would inevitably pay doing it? Well, that isn't up to me, is it? After the disaster in the Marianas, the odds against them couldn't be clearer. By October 1944, Task Force 58 numbered over 100 ships, with a corps of fleet carriers named Murderer's Row, led by Admiral Mitcher aboard USS Lexington. Across the entire invasion force currently conducting operations, 300 American warships of all types stood ready for action, with an air wing numbering over 1,500 aircraft. This mission was doomed, 
their chances were nearly zero. Yet, as wise men in the grim far future so often say, the Emperor protects. With a little bit of luck, raw audacity, and a well-timed bout of American stupidity, things may just go their way. And still, to this day, 80 years later, no one can really believe just how close they got, nor can they believe what the Americans pulled off to prevent it. In the American camp, meanwhile, things were not as monolithically terrifying as it appeared. Due to the nature of the operations they were carrying out, the chain of command was a complete mess. Simply put, because they were conducting an amphibious invasion of the Philippines, unlike all the major naval operations previously, they fell under Douglas MacArthur's jurisdiction. Therefore, half the naval forces were under his command, while Third Fleet, Task Force 58 and the heavier fleet assets were all under Admiral Halsey, who was in turn under Admiral Nimitz. And while the heavier assets were primarily there to counter any Japanese fleet operations, they also had to do double duty, supporting the troops assaulting the islands with air power and shore bombardment and all of the support missions. So at any given time, no one was really sure who was in charge of who or what their primary objective was. Now it must be said that this was nowhere near as catastrophic as some of the other chain of command structures we've seen, but it must be mentioned because it will help explain why there are a lot of crossed wires, miscommunications and misunderstandings between the different elements of the US task force later on. But of course this was not a concern of the aviators of USS Enterprise. They had their hands full, being the only real fully night capable aircraft carrier on a 24 hour flight roster, responsible for night patrol, combat air patrol and close air support for the landing force. It was a hellish operational schedule, but in recent days it had gotten particularly bad. After the air campaign against the Japanese air forces throughout the Pacific, followed by the invasion of the Philippines, the US carrier force had expended a considerable amount of ammunition and fuel. Given that the invasion was now well underway and the Japanese had yet to appear, Admiral Halsey detached a large number of his carriers with orders to return to Alithi Atoll for resupply, leaving only five fleet carriers on station. Franklin, Intrepid, Lexington, Essex, and of course, USS Enterprise. That said, however, they did have a large number of smaller carriers in support of the landings assigned to Task Force 77. The Taffies, so they'd been called. Thus, they should have enough aircraft to handle any contingency. But of course, having fleet carriers in the double digits is always preferable if you have the option. And so here it is. The US main force is under strength, their command and control is degraded due to conflicts in the chain of command, and the largest battleship flotilla ever assembled is now stealthily passing through the Philippine archipelago in the middle of the night under complete radio silence. The Japanese, by complete accident, and they had no way of knowing it, had against all odds managed to catch the Americans at just the right time for their plan to work. Now all they had to do was catch them by surprise. Enemy spotted. Oh dear. At 1am on the 23rd of October 1944, two US Navy submarines, USS Data and USS Dace, were cruising through the Palawan Passage on the surface, patrolling the sea lanes leading to the main invasion area. They were on their way back to the beginning of their patrol beat when Data's radar operator picked up a large surface force on their scope. It was in the direction of the US fleet, but no surface units were supposed to have come out this far. They were 30,000 yards away, cruising steadily eastwards. The radar operator strained his eyes to make sure what he was seeing on his scope was correct. He counted 30 returns in all, and at the centre of the group he saw the two biggest returns he had ever ever seen on his scope. It had to be a glitch, these couldn't be this big. He fiddled with the settings, but nothing changed. Dace and Data turned to pursue and went to all ahead full, their diesel thundering to life as the submarine slowly accelerated to full speed. Data submitted a contact report to 3rd Fleet Command, while the bridge officer manning the conning tower got a visual with his binoculars. What he saw, he couldn't quite believe. In the darkness, he saw a group entirely composed of surface combatants, no flat tops, and in the middle of the formation he saw two hulking shadows which dwarfed all the other vessels around them, their pagoda silhouettes blocking out the moon. Admiral Kurita, commanding Center Force from Otago, 
had made it this far without being noticed. As per the operational planning, he had gambled that Admiral Ozawa's northern force would be spotted first and draw the Americans away from his movements, giving him an opening. But unfortunately, it hadn't worked. The Americans had spotted his group first. He had heard their contact report go out, but he was still under strict orders to maintain radio silence. That, and if they were focused on attacking him, maybe Ozawa could get in close enough to attack the American LSTs with his surviving air group. Then again, he had both Yamato and Musashi with him, as well as Nagato, Kongo, and Haruna, not to mention a full escort force of cruisers and destroyers. If there was any surface group in the world that could put up a fight against the overwhelming might of the US Navy, it was his. And so he pressed on into the dawn. But as the sun crested the horizon, there came a loud scream from the bridge wing. Yorei! <laughs> Data and Dace had moved ahead of the Japanese formation during the night, and as the sun came up, they had enough light to launch a submerged torpedo attack. Otago took four hits and began to sink almost immediately. There was barely enough time to call abandoned ship before she began heeling over. Admiral Karita was forced to swim for it. There wasn't even time to organize a launch or a raft. As the fleet came to battle stations and destroyers began fanning out to locate the attackers, another set of explosions could be heard from Otago's sister ship Takao. Both US submarines had hit their targets, though Takao only took two hits and managed to enact damage control measures in time. The Japanese ships went to all ahead full and began evasive maneuvers. The destroyer Kishinami, who was nearest to the flagship, immediately began rescue operations. Admiral Kurita was quickly fished out of the water and transported to the relative safety of Yamato, giving orders to find and engage the submarines to ensure that the battleships could get away safely. He couldn't lose those ships. He had to move quickly and he had to get a handle on this situation. But as he gave the order, while the rescue for Otago's crew was underway, yet another Japanese ship, the cruiser Maya, exploded in a ball of flame as four more torpedoes from Data slammed into her port side. This time they had hit one of the magazines and within five minutes she had capsized and plummeted down, taking over 300 men with her. The US submarines had just fired the opening shot of the largest naval battle in human history, having sunk two heavy cruisers while crippling a third. And as the Japanese destroyer screen began their hunt, both Data and Dace made a quick but stealthy getaway, linking up with none other than USS Nautilus as they did so. Things had started badly for the Japanese, and spoiler alert, it's uh, gonna get worse. <laughs> oh, it's gonna get so much worse. <laughs> Admiral Halsey, having received the contact reports from Data, immediately organized his forces for an interception. Task Force 58 was put on alert, with some of the ships that were sent back to Ulithi being recalled. The battleships, meanwhile, were prepared to face off the enemy surface units in the San Bernardino Strait, should the enemy maintain their advance through the air assault. This group was to be designated Task Force 34, under the command of the big man himself, Admiral Willis Ching Kirishima I Don't See Her Lee, who I am certain was salivating at the possibility of taking down history's biggest ever warship. Given the relative distance of the two forces, plus wanting to take stock and get organized over the course of the 23rd of October, no combat took place. But US recon aircraft maintained their patrols, searching for any other Japanese units, which they knew had to be out there. The Japanese were very obviously making their big play, and they definitely have more ships than just center force. And sure enough, they spotted Admiral Nishimura's southern force, comprised of battleships Fuzo and Yamashiro and their escorts. He was making his way through the Surigao Strait, a pincer movement attempting to overwhelm their defenses and hit the landing force. With Halsey's forces moving to intercept Kurita and Center Force, it fell on the 7th Fleet and the older battleships to handle that threat. However, Nishimura, due to the radio silence, had absolutely no idea whatsoever that anything was amiss. They were under orders to keep radio silent, so no one had told him anything. As far as he knew, Ozawa's force was on schedule, and Kurita was sneaking into the Sibian Sea, though he suspected that the Americans would eventually spot him. Hopefully, his colleagues could draw off the enemy long enough to get through, though. He pressed on with confidence, completely unaware that the survivors of Pearl Harbor were even now 
working up their crews. Their boilers were alight, their magazines standing ready. The old and venerable battle wagons of the mighty US Pacific Fleet, who were thought to be dead three years ago, were ready and eager to get some well-deserved and thoroughly righteous payback. And so, as radar-equipped scouts shadowed the enemy forces throughout the night, the stage was set for the US Navy's aviators to do that voodoo that they do oh so very well. As the morning of October 24th, 1944 dawned, the Pacific's morning calm was actually anything but. Across Task Force 58, every vessel, big and small, was a hive of furious activity. The entire rainbow could be seen sprinting to and fro across the crowded flight decks. Purple shirts running hoses, red shirts rigging ordnance, yellow shirts unfastening tie-down chains and moving aircraft into position. To the untrained eye, it seemed like panicked pandemonium, but to those who know, it was a perfectly choreographed dance performed by men who had been on combat operations for months. With its only accompanying music being the relentless general quarters alarms sounding throughout the fleet, as all crewmen donned helmets and manned their battle stations, with thousands upon thousands of 20mm AA guns being turned skyward for the attack they knew would come. And it was definitely coming. After being hit the previous evening, Admiral Kurita knew that the swarm was about to descend upon him, and that without support he was going to get obliterated. Breaking radio silence, he had contacted the surviving air units based on Luzon, led by Admiral Onishi. Orders were given to assemble every land-based aircraft available to attack Task Force 58, with the goal of crippling the enemy carriers while taking pressure off the surface force long enough to allow them to get through and into gun range. Admiral Onishi, who would later be known as the father of the kamikazes, was more than happy to oblige, assembling 180 to 200 aircraft of all types for the mission to be launched in three waves. Unfortunately for them, however, as per standard operating procedure, the first flights launched from each carrier was the combat air patrol to cover the fleet during standard operations. Thus, they will have to fight their way past just as they had to do in the Great Marianas Turkey shoot. That said, due to half the US fleet having fallen back for resupply and the necessary repositioning to counter Curita's advance, the Americans would have to launch their attacks group by group rather than in a massed formation. Intrepid was first in line, launching her air group alongside the CVLs Cabot and Independence. They quickly formed up and set a heading towards the Japanese battleships at full speed, with the rest of the US carriers prepping for launch as they left but the Japanese would get the first hit in. At 7.50am, the radar pickets detected an initial attack wave launched from Luzon. VF-20 from Enterprise turned to engage along with the other elements of the combat air patrol, but it would be the boys from Essex who got there first, and to call it murder would be charitable. By now, the Japanese had finally relaxed their training standards. They were desperate for new pilots after the devastation of the past two years, the only men available were a bunch of raw recruits led by a very small cadre of survivors, some of them from as far back as the initial invasion of the Philippines. In fact, some of them had even bombed the airfield they were now taking off from three years ago. But all that experience, excellent though it was, was by now not enough to sh compete with the sheer technological and numerical superiority of the enemy. Over the next hour, the Japanese attack force was obliterated, with one pilot from Essex, Commander David McCampbell, shooting down an incredible nine Japanese planes in this one battle alone. But as the second Japanese wave started to arrive, several aircraft managed to slip through the screen and board in on the task force, preparing to brave the storm of steel that would come up to meet them from the combined firepower of a thousand radar-guided proximity-fused armed AA guns. However, there were several scattered cloud formations over the fleet at the time, and one of the few veteran pilots of the Imperial Japanese Navy used them to great effect. USS Princeton, alongside the other light carriers, was prepping to strike the Japanese surface group moving in to attack the invasion force. 
As such, she had her strike aircraft fully fueled and in the process of being armed up for the strike. The Hellcats she had on combat air patrol, meanwhile, were coming into land after engaging the first wave of attackers, and so both her hangars and deck spaces were full of aircraft in all various stages of operational evolution, just as the Japanese had suffered at Midway. Bursting out of a cloud bank above her, a single D4Y Judy dove in for the attack. The defensive guns blazed away, but the enemy had gotten within range too quickly to respond. A 500-pound armor-piercing bomb slammed through the deck, detonating the fully armed aircraft inside. A huge explosion rocked the ship, killing over a hundred men before secondary explosions and fires started ripping through the rest of the vessel. The initial shock was so devastating, it broke the fire suppression system. USS Princeton would eventually sink, with a main magazine explosion detonating while rescue operations were underway, killing and wounding hundreds of men while severely damaging several surface combatants in the process. The Japanese pilot never knew of his success though, as a Hellcat from USS Lexington blew him out of the sky soon after his run. A small victory, won at great cost. Of that entire Japanese wave, not a single aircraft survived. But it wouldn't take long for the Americans to reply. Kirita had heard the alarm sound, but it may as well have been a routine weather report. It was just as inevitable. Aboard Yamato, the AA guns barked to life, but being Japanese anti-aircraft guns, the US naval aviators simply moved in between the fire zones as the primary radar gun director for the Japanese gunners was a man holding a stick yelling aggressively for the Emperor. Which if he has a bolter in the other hand is perhaps worth some consideration, but in this case he didn't, and thus it wasn't. The Hell Divers began peeling off and picking their targets, while the Avengers steadily formed up their formation torpedo attacks. Naturally, the Americans aimed for the biggest ships they could see, which of course were the two largest warships ever built, even now maneuvering hard to evade. It wouldn't help them, especially as the second wave from Essex and Lexington were now beginning to arrive as well. Musashi, Nagato and Yamato all took hits from the dive bombers, with a 500 pound bomb smashing through Yamato's deck near A turret, doing notable but not significant damage. Musashi, however, drew the focus of the attackers. Across several hours she was pummeled by the air groups of Intrepid, Cabot, Essex, Lexington, Independence and Langley, with at least 10 armor piercing bombs and a torpedo barrage slamming into her from multiple directions causing her to take on a list to port while wrecking the superstructure and starting multiple fires. Damage control teams rushed to extinguish the flames and get the flooding under control. But there would be no escape. Because there was one more wave of US Navy aircraft inbound. A wave led by a vengeful spirit no enemy had managed to withstand. The two largest warships in history may have been among the strongest vessels afloat, but they weren't the deadliest. The deadliest was at that moment beginning her assault. Enterprise ready? Engage! Let's go. USS Enterprise's pilots circled Musashi like vultures, with USS Franklin's pilots folding in behind them. They were the last to arrive due to the fact that while Intrepid and Essex had initiated the attack on Center Force, Enterprise and Franklin had attacked the approaching Southern Force, with Enterprise's dive bombers scoring multiple hits on both Fuzo and Yamashiro. Now she had come to finish what her little sisters had started. The Japanese sailors fired everything they had, but it was in vain as the Grey Ghost's Avenger pilots slammed several torpedoes into Musashi in a lethal coordinated attack. At the same time, the escorting Hellcats armed with rockets caused a magazine explosion on one of her destroyer escorts, sinking it instantly, while the Hell Divers of both carriers began their runs. Enterprise scored at least four bomb hits on Musashi, causing a number of secondary explosions and starting an enormous fire amidships. Franklin's pilots, meanwhile, added to the inferno with their own barrage of bombs and torpedoes. 
With everyone able to see that Musashi was mortally wounded, the remainder of Enterprise's pilots settled on the cruiser Miyoko as their secondary target, dropping the remaining ordnance on the cruiser, crippling her to the extent that she had to withdraw from the battle outright at half speed. Over the next hour, the Hellcats emptied their guns into Musashi, and as Enterprise's pilots left the scene, Intrepid's pilots returned to ensure her demise. By 1530, Musashi had been blasted apart, her forecastle awash, her bow down in the water to a critical degree. Kirita, realizing that Musashi was almost certainly doomed, ordered several escorts to stay with her and assist in rescue should they fail to save the ship, which of course they would. Dead in the water, with severe flooding, the order to abandon ship was given, and as night began to fall, the once mighty battleship that bore the name of both an ancient province and Japan's mightiest warrior capsized and sank. Coming to rest over 4,000 feet below the waves, her captain still on the bridge by his own will. Kirita analyzed the situation from Yamato and drew a stark conclusion. The operation had failed. He withdrew west away from the combat area to reassess and consider disengaging. He was down half his firepower without even getting close to the enemy's main force, and in the face of such opposition, retreat is the only sensible decision. But that was not going to be an option. Ozawa and Nishimura were proceeding on mission. They would enter the battle by tomorrow. Even if it does put the flagship of the Japanese Navy at risk, strategically and especially politically, he can't sit this one out. Thus, as the sun set, Kirita turned back around and headed towards the invasion beaches. And once again, unknowingly, he had against all odds swung the battle back in his favour. And unless you already know this story, I'm sure you're sitting here confused, wondering how is that even possible given the odds? Well, at 1640, about an hour before Kirita turned round, Admiral Halsey had confirmed that Centre Force was running west, they were running away. It was then that his scouts finally detected Admiral Ozawa's force coming in from the north. In a rather ironic twist, the only Japanese force that had managed to sneak up on the Americans was the one that the entire plan hinged on being found first. It was then that the old Bull Halsey made a fateful decision. Ozawa's flagship was Zuikaku, the last Japanese fleet carrier that struck Pearl Harbor still in service. It was also, as far as he knew, the only major Japanese air threat left in the area after they'd killed all those aircraft from Luzon. With the loss of a Yamato-class battleship and seeing Kurita heading away from the area, Halsey concluded that the main axis of attack wasn't Kurita anymore, but Ozawa, and that he needed to reorient his forces to meet the threat while finally settling accounts with Kido Butai once and for all. However, this kicked off a cavalcade of disastrous miscommunication and bad intelligence all round, which I will give you the short version of. Going back to the start of this battle, when the battleships were approaching, Halsey organized Task Force 34 under Admiral Lee to guard the San Bernardino Strait against further attack, his Iowas forming an unassailable wall of steel and 16-inch guns. And so when he gave the order to move north and engage Ozawa's carriers, Everyone assumed that Task Force 34 was to maintain its position and defend the strait, just in case Kurita turned around. However, because Kurita had withdrawn, Halsey decided to bring the battleships as well, to see if he could get close enough to wipe out Northern Force in its entirety and sink everything. Thing is, due to all the chain of command issues, poor radio communications in this region of the Pacific, and a few problematic, slightly adversarial interpersonal relationships, no one told anybody. And so the San Bernardino Strait was left completely unguarded. Now it's bad enough this is happening by accident, but what's really incredible is that pretty much every other senior officer, including Lee and Mitcher, took one look at this and said, That's bait. Which was very soon confirmed by a nighttime recon aircraft from USS Independence, who saw Yamato heading back east towards the invasion fleet. But again, due to the all aforementioned nonsense and shenanigans, this report was completely ignored, and so the entirety of Third Fleet 
headed north to fight the last major carrier engagement in the Pacific War, leaving a small assembly of destroyers and escort carriers to fend off the largest battleship flotilla in human history. A ragtag bunch of tin can sailors was all that stood up against Yamato and her escorts. They only had tiny 5 inch guns, relatively inexperienced crews, and only a tenth of their normal air support. The Japanese never stood a chance. Over on the other side of the Philippines, however, things were, surprisingly and amazingly given the nature of war, actually going according to plan. Task Force 77 had assembled an absolute monstrosity of a battle group to confront Southern Force, comprised of six battleships, five of which having been revived after Pearl Harbor, eight cruisers, and 28 destroyers, backed up by a screening group of over 40 PT boats. Nishimura was walking into what can only be described as, using scientific terms, an absolute of an ambush. At 22.30 on the 24th of October, PT-131 made contact with the Japanese, sending a contact report back to the main force. Once that was done, the PT boats formed into their squadrons and began a ferocious assault on the Japanese as they sailed through the strait. And things just went downhill really quickly from there. Nishimura has had his fair share of bad days. He commanded part of the escort force at Midway, which he then followed up by leading the 7th Cruiser Squadron through Guadalcanal. Rough days were not an uncommon thing. But today, oh man. And the worst part was, it would be his last day ever. The PT boats kept hitting Southern Force for the next several hours, but Yamashiro and Fuzo were able to keep them at arm's length, allowing the formation to dodge the avalanche of torpedoes sent their way. Problem was, the PT boats were just keeping them busy and keeping them in sight while maintaining an accurate plot on their position. As the Japanese advanced, they were falling deeper and deeper into a closing noose, as just beyond the PT screen, was the entirety of the destroyer force. And once they got into position, they made the torpedo spread of their smaller colleagues look like a joke. And at 3am on the 25th, both Fuzo and Yamashiro took multiple hits, with Fuzo stopping dead in the water. That ship had so many onboard fires, it looked like sunrise had come early. Given Fuzo is another name for Japan, it seems they took the land of the rising sun a bit too literally. Well, um, actually at this point that starts to become a theme, but anyway, Fuzo took such a beating some people thought it had split in half and reported it as such, but nevertheless it capsized and sank within the hour, with USS Melvin scoring the killing blow. Meanwhile, Yamashiro took most of the hits in her main belt, so she could still steam on right ahead, just fine straight into the radar-directed guns of an entire battle line of American battleships who had, for the last time in naval history, crossed the T of their enemy. USS West Virginia detected Yamashiro as she and her surviving escorts pushed through the ambush, and once the Japanese got in range, John Denver's biggest hit song was completely invalidated, as there was absolutely no such thing as almost about the heaven Yamashiro sailors suddenly found themselves in. West Virginia's first salvo slammed into her, followed by a literal wall of shells from her colleagues. California, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, and Maryland sent shell after shell alongside Weavey. Nishimura's force was systematically and completely annihilated. In fact, they were cut down so mercilessly that by the time USS Mississippi, the last battleship in the line, got in range, they only fired one salvo, which is the last time a battleship has fired at another battleship in naval history. Admiral Nishimura was killed, just dead, just straight out blown away, his ship Yamashiro torn down to its individual components. Her escorts were likewise obliterated, among them the heavy cruiser Mogami. Only one ship 
one singular ship, the small destroyer Shigure, managed to escape the fiery hell that the Americans had unleashed upon them. The battle was so viciously one-sided that the second wave of Southern Force, that's right, there was another wave behind them, took one look at this situation and decided, nope! Quickly turning tail and running west as fast as their propellers could turn. As the sun rose on the morning of the 25th, it looked as though it would be a complete clean sweep for the US Navy. But, off the island of Samar, through the now unguarded San Bernardino Strait, Curita's center force was thundering forward at full speed into a small force of destroyers and mini-carriers, setting the stage for the only success the Japanese would achieve in this battle, while simultaneously guaranteeing their defeat. Because unbeknownst to the men aboard battleship Yamato, they had just picked a fight with the US Navy's biggest ever task force in terms of displacement. 90% of that displacement being the uh, testicular fortitude of the men in it. A task force containing the two mightiest warships the US Navy has ever fielded. USS Johnston and the Samuel B. Roberts. Sir, they have an entire flotilla of battleships out there. Their tonnage has us beaten five to one, and they're all fresh. These are truly fearful odds. Oh, that we had here now but one ten thousand of those men back in the States that do no work today. What's he that wishes so? <laughs> well, well. None other than my dear Admiral Sprague. <laughs> no, Admiral. If we are marked to die... We too. We too are enough to do our country loss. <laughs> and yet, yet to live. To live. The fewer men, the greater the share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. God's peace, I would not lose so great an honor as one man more methinks would share from me. So please, please do not wish for one man more, Adam. Rather, proclaim it, proclaim it all throughout my command, that he which hath no stomach for this fight, let him depart. Let him depart. His passport shall be made, and his transfer orders put into his pocket. We want to die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day, this day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall live through this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say tomorrow is Saint Crispian. Then he will strip his sleeve and show his scars and say these wounds I had on Crispian's day. Old men forget Yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember. He'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then, the names of our ships, familiar in his mouth as household words, Samuel B. Roberts, Johnston, and Hall, and Hiraman, White Plains, Fanshaw, and St. Lowe, be in their flowing cups, freshly remembered. This story is a story the good man shall teach his son. And Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day until the ending of the world. But we in it, we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall forever be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile. And this day shall forever gentle his condition. And gentlemen back in America, now abed, shall think themselves accursed they were not here, 
and hold their manhoods cheap whilst any man speaks that fought with us upon this St. Crispin's Day! Soaring through the early morning sun at 0630, Ensign William Brooks in his Avenger was scanning the horizon when he saw a surface force approaching from the northwest. Why was Halsey back so soon? Did the Japanese carrier group disengage? He turned his aircraft towards the approaching force to see what was up, and he called in the sighting, only to get a really confusing response. No friendly vessels in area, report inaccurate, establish direct visual contact. This order came from Admiral Sprague himself, who received the report and didn't believe it. Someone's going to be playing games or screwing around, or they're just not calling their movements. He would have to file a complaint to Nimitz later about whatever idiot was out there. Halsey went running off like a cowboy and he's forgotten someone, most likely. Or maybe he's realised his mistake and sent a force back so we aren't hanging out here with our butts in the wind. That'd be a first, and it'd also be pretty nice. But no, it was neither. Ensign Brooks flew closer, and what he saw confirmed what he thought his eyes were lying about, which was quickly followed by a wall of anti-aircraft fire. Admiral Sprague heard the strained response through the receiver personally. I see pagoda masts and the biggest meatball flag on the biggest battleship I ever saw. Holy crap. Those Japanese battleships had turned around in the middle of the night and were now tearing towards his escort carriers, who were almost completely defenseless. Worse still, they were all prepped for launch in a support configuration, meaning they had ASW, CAS, and air superiority loadouts. Very few of them were armed for anti-shipping operations, as it was thought that Task Force 58 had dealt with the threat. That, and they were supposed to have a heavy surface battle group watching the straits in front of them. We can't stay here, and we sure as hell can't let those battleships and cruisers fire on full carriers. If just one shell hits the hangar bays, the entire ship will go up. Order everyone to launch with whatever they have, and hit that surface force. HE bombs, death charges, BB guns, I don't care. And then turn us east as fast as we can go. We need to draw them away from the transports and towards the fleet. However, Sprague realized in horror that they had gotten within 20 nautical miles of the outer elements, and while the rest of the group would be able to break contact, Taffy 3, the outer picket, would not. Taffy 3, being on the outside, only had depth charges fitted to its aircraft for ASW. There was nothing they could really do to stop the largest battleship in human history, which was even now turning its guns towards the carriers. They tried dropping their depth charges on the lead cruiser in the formation Kumano, only for them to harmlessly bounce off and fall into the water. There was nothing for it but to throw all their 50 cal at the destroyers and cruisers in the hopes that they could do some damage while waiting for backup. It was then that something terrifying occurred. Due to Taffy's air wings having been spotted taking off, Kurita had reorganised into an anti-aircraft defensive formation, only to realise now that he was actually in attack range. His force was spread out in different groups rather than the concentrated battle line that he would normally be in for a surface engagement. Now, for the Americans, this was good news for the carriers, as it meant only the battleships and heavy cruisers could really shoot at them, while for the destroyers, it meant that they could manoeuvre to meet their threats individually. The bad news was that it meant Kurita had no choice but to order a general fleet attack, meaning that the entire Japanese force would kick it up to all ahead full and pursue them until point blank, blasting every single one of them into little itty bitty pieces. Congo, who was out on the northern side, joined up with the cruisers to support them against Taffy's aircraft, who were now beginning to bully Suzia and Kumano quite ruthlessly. Haruna, Nagato, and Yamato, with their destroyer screen and battle column, began closing in, and then... Yamato opened the battle, and the fight of all of these sailors' lives was now on. Admiral Sprague ordered the destroyers to make as big a smokescreen as they could, and then run for the rain squalls that were brewing nearby. Trying to meet a cruiser squadron, two Congos, a Nagato, and the Imperial flagship in open battle was not possible. It would be damn near suicidal, and any efforts to do so would be of little use. Throw five inch at them if you get the chance to throw off their aim, but for God's sake, just run. But the rearmost escort facing down Yamato didn't feel like running. 
Captain Evans stared at the pagoda mast in the distance, firing 18-inch shells straight at him and thought, If I can turn about with enough speed and utilize the smoke screen, I reckon I could just about get into torpedo range of the lead element. His ancestors in the Cherokee hadn't run from the British Empire, and they were the biggest power on Earth at the time. So if this new bunch of imperialist pricks thought they were going to get him to turn tail, he was going to have to correct the record. He turned to the helmsman and gave the order. Flank speed, full left rudder. Mr. Hagen, you are clear to engage. The destroyer, USS Johnston, a ship less than a tenth of the size of just one of the Japanese ships, turned directly into the path of the entire enemy formation, almost crossing the T. However, it was halfway through the maneuver when Evans realized they wouldn't be able to pull it off, and so he had to make a decision. And given the circumstances, there was only one thing for it. Fix bayonets. USS Johnston immediately swung towards the nearest enemy ship, which was the lead cruiser Kumano, and charged, firing every single gun she had. Five-inch shells began raining down on Kumano's superstructure, wrecking it completely both from the over 45-inch impacts and a raging inferno on deck, started by the sheer volume of fire Johnston was throwing her way. And worse still, Johnston was at that moment turning to fire her torpedoes. Upon witnessing this insanity, Admiral Sprague knew that Johnston, against all odds, had seized the initiative and moved to act on it. He ordered the other two destroyers in his screen to follow her and attack the enemy with everything they had. The destroyer Heerman was on the other side of Taffy 3's formation. They went to flank speed immediately, ducking and weaving between the aircraft carriers to get into position. While leading the attack was the flagship of the destroyer screen, USS Hull, who circled around to link up with Johnston. But as Heerman tore past, something rather incredible happened. A destroyer escort, the smallest ship class in the Blue Water Navy, immediately went to flank speed and formed up with the other two ships. The escorts, as their name implies, were ordered on pain of death to stick with the carriers. They had absolutely no hope in this fight. In fact, the destroyers are only here out of desperation and the stupid bravery of one of the commanders. And yet, here came USS Samuel B. Roberts, under the command of Lieutenant Commander, that's right, these ships are so small, they don't even get a captain to command them, Lieutenant Commander Robert Copeland, sailing into harm's way against the biggest battleship in human history. To put it in perspective, just one of Yamato's turrets has more weight displacement than their entire ship. His reasoning was simple. Due to the fact that they were Johnston's wingman in the formation, they were in perfect position for a torpedo attack, and that given their small size, the chaos of battle, the smoke screen, and the rain squalls nearby, they could probably get right up on the Japanese without them noticing. And thus the bosun's whistle blew as the cannonade of battle rang out around them when Commander Copeland addressed the crew. Gentlemen, this will be a fight against overwhelming odds from which survival cannot be expected. So we will do what damage we can. And so the tin cans charged after Johnston into the maelstrom, all guns blazing except for Roberts, who held fire to remain unnoticed in the confusion, hoping to get as close as possible. At that moment, a huge explosion shot up from one of the Japanese cruisers. Kumano had taken a direct hit from Johnston's torpedo attack, and the resulting explosion had torn her bow off completely. Suzuya, meanwhile, was faced with the entirety of Taffy's air groups, relentlessly pounding her with whatever they had to hand. Literally. One of the pilots threw his map case, an oxygen canister, and an empty coke bottle at various Japanese ships. The two cruisers were forced to run north, while Congo was forced to launch a countercharge as Hull's torpedoes stormed towards her. This wasn't a battle. This was a melee, a fistfight in the mud during a hurricane. As Taffy's air group started forming up for their next attack, the tin cans rolled in further, firing their five inches at anything they could hit. Johnston was wrapping back around to screen for the other ships, and as she did so, she fired at the most direct threat to her, which was none other than the battleship Yamato. However, the flagship responded in kind. Three 18-inch shells slammed into Johnston, followed by three 6-inch secondary shells into the bridge wing. Captain Evans's left hand was severely mangled, while a number of the crew had been killed or wounded. However, due to the fact that they had been firing literally everything at the Japanese while going flank speed, Johnston was actually quite light on combustible materials, and so she didn't immediately go down. In fact, the Japanese, erroneously though it was, gave Johnston the compliment of reporting the destruction of an enemy cruiser, 
as no destroyer would be able to do the amount of damage they had just seen. But Johnston wasn't dead. Oh no. Johnston, while the Japanese shifted targets, snuck into a nearby rain squall currently blinding Congo and got her systems back online, because Johnston and her crew didn't hear no goddamn bell. Meanwhile, Samuel B. Roberts had gotten into torpedo range undetected. Not so much as a secondary had been fired at her. And now the crew aboard selected the Japanese cruisers Chokai and Chikuma as their targets. It was then that the Japanese spotted her. This tiny little ship they would use as an armed fleet tug, this pathetic little thing, was now charging towards them. At that moment, Lieutenant Commander Copeland gave the order he had been denying for the past 20 minutes. Mr. Burton, you may open fire. The little destroyer escort started emptying her guns at the enemy cruiser while closing not just a point-blank range, but knife-fighting range. They got inside the minimum range of Chokai's guns to the extent that the enemy couldn't depress their secondaries low enough to engage her. It was then that the lookouts aboard the Japanese ships cringed in horror as they saw the large splash and silvery trails of Mark 15 torpedoes heading straight towards them. And they were far too close to evade. Chokai's stern was blown off, crippling her completely, removing her from the battle as the Roberts ducked back into the smokescreen. And if you think that's metal, here is the insane part. While all this was going on, USS Johnston thundered back out of the rain squall, charging at the Japanese once again. That's right, in the 10 minutes it took for this drama to commence, Johnston's damage control teams had been working frantically and got all their systems back so they could rejoin the fight. And who did this absolute bunch of mad lads go after? Well, it was none other than another battleship, specifically Haruna, who incredulously saw a destroyer closing to gun range and firing. And what's more, that gunfire was effective. Fifteen hits were scored on her superstructure starting fires, all the while buying time for Heerman and Hull, who were launching torpedoes which resulted in forcing Yamato to evade away from the fight temporarily buying the carrier's much-needed time to attempt to escape. And with that, let's talk about the Naval Aviation Division, as we're supposed to be talking about Enterprise, and trust me, as this is going on, she is engaged in her own drama. But I do want to mention the Naval Aviation contingent of Taffy 3, as they get a little overlooked in the retellings of the events, despite being just as giga-chad as their surface colleagues. But as a last word on the tin cans, let me say this. As I recount the rest of these events, for the entire time I talk about them, just know that in the background a small group of four or five destroyers throughout the entire story are locked in mortal combat with several battleships, their destroyer screen, and a heavy cruiser squadron by themselves. But with that, let's talk about the pilots. The aviators had been pummeling the cruisers and destroyers throughout the morning strafing, bombing, dropping death charges, throwing odd bits and pieces out of their cockpit. They had done some serious damage as well, though not fatal damage. But that damage wasn't just restricted to escort vessels. Kalinan Bay's air group was scattered after an emergency launch. A pilot from St. Lo overheard this conversation. This is Georgia 1. Any other Georgia aircraft up? 8-4 here. I'll join on you. What you got? Anti-personnel bombs? Yeah, me too. What do you think we should hit? Probably one of the destroyers. Well, I'm the flight lead, and I think we should go hit a battleship. Won't do y'all much good. If you're scared, you can try landing on the carrier. God damn it, I'll go anywhere you go. And so they did. Making runs at Congo, who was sailing behind the cruiser screen. However, as the day went on, the Taffy pilots steadily ran low on fuel and ammunition, being forced to find an airfield. They couldn't land on the carriers as they were currently under direct fire from the cruisers now tearing towards them. But those carriers weren't the helpless targets the Japanese expected. The escort carriers all had a 5 inch dual purpose gun mounted on the stern for this very scenario to engage surface targets while trying to break contact. And the carriers of Taffy 3 were at this very moment yeeting shells down range as fast as they could load and fire them. And they were scoring hits. Lots of hits in fact. The superstructures of the Japanese cruisers were getting absolutely battered again and again, and while they too were doing damage to the carriers, they weren't doing enough. Not even their torpedoes were working. The Americans were dodging every one they threw at them, and the ones they couldn't dodge were shot out of the water by Taffy's planes. You heard correctly, 
the pilots of Taffy 3 dove down to zero feet to strafe torpedoes. The whole of Taffy 3 amounted to just one of the Japanese ships in terms of displacement, and yet each man on each ship was fighting like a lion. If you want to know what the mood was, the anti-air gunners aboard the carriers sat there watching their 5-inch colleagues firing at the oncoming Japanese, and they weren't scared. No, it was the opposite. They were angry they couldn't join in. So they sat there fuming while their trigger fingers itched, until one of the officers called out, Don't worry boys, we're suckering them into 40 mil range! But the problem with planes is, they run out of ammo and fuel a lot faster than a ship, and landing on the carriers while under shell fire, as mentioned before, is not advisable. They needed to divert. But Task Force 58 was on their own adventure and unable to lend support or provide temporary flight decks. Thankfully, however, the army had seized a number of forward airfields in the Philippines during the invasion. Tom Lupo, from the Fanshawe Bay Air Group, was leading a motley crew of Taffy pilots, having run out of ammo and fuel, when he noted that the recently captured airfield of Tacloban was open. The engineers and CBs were just starting to clear the field of debris and fill in craters caused by the Navy just the previous week. Lieutenant Lupo landed his Avenger, dodging potholes and rolled to a stop near the command tent. He then immediately ran over to the CBs and told them to grab their bulldozers and whoever they can grab with a shovel to clear the field for his fellow aviators. It was then that he spied piles of ammo, tons of bombs and hundreds of barrels of fuel that had just been dropped off. Who's in charge of that? he asked, and was immediately referred to an army major. The army major in question told Lieutenant Lupo that these stores were for the army air force squadrons scheduled to arrive within the next few days. Well, the entire Japanese Navy is out there, and if we don't use those bombs, they're going to sail over here and blow you to hell. The Army Major was still nonplussed and told him that he couldn't have them unless he cleared it with his colonel, who was commanding troops at the front. To which Lieutenant Lupo drew his pistol and said, Well, I'm not going to bother the man, he's out fighting a war like me, so that's just too damn bad. He then pointed the pistol at the officer and handed the pistol to his stunned radio man with instructions to cover him. He then climbed into his aircraft and radioed Fanshawe Bay to direct all friendly aircraft to Tacloban for rearm and refuel. The army anti-aircraft gunners welcomed them for a few moments before being yelled at to stop, however the strip was still very very rough and the first aircraft attempting to land hit a rough patch and went over on its nose, thankfully with the crew all okay though. The other aircraft waved off, only to be radioed by an army air controller who had been joined by a navy aircraft director who had been put ashore with the invasion force. These two men saved the day, coordinating the safe recovery for most of the force. There were some concerning moments as a trio of Japanese Zeros strafed the field in the middle of landing operations, but other than that there were no major incidents. What happened next was the same miracle of American military personnel forced to improvise that we have seen all throughout their storied history. This group of enlisted personnel and junior officers, on the spot with no warning or structure, organized a fluid rearm and refueling point for the entire Taffy Air Group turning aircraft around and quickly deploying them back into the fight. The field was rapidly cleared for safer landings, and even battle damage was fixed, with one of the crews raiding the Avenger who force landed for a new wing, which they then fitted to their aircraft, rearmed, and headed back out. US Naval Aviators and Air Force Maintainers. God himself could not fashion a more lethal team for projecting air power. However, some taffy pilots were still on station. Blue Archer, in his Avenger, was preparing to head back to the airfield for more fuel and ammo. It was then he heard the call for a torpedo attack. Now he didn't have any ammo or fuel, but he did have guts and some friends. And so, to draw the fire from the other aircraft and the aircraft carriers, he opened his bomb bay and began doing low passes with his wingmen over the Japanese task force. It was then he saw Yamato turning to rejoin the fight. So with his two wingmen, he turned in to make a low pass over the ship to draw their attention away from friendlies. It was then that a wall of AA shattered his engine and blew away the Avenger on his left wing. Wounded, concussed, and completely, absolutely, unbelievably livid, Archer opened his canopy for better visibility, and as he flew past Yamato's bridge, drew his pistol and dumped the mag straight at the superstructure with Admiral Kurita staring back in sheer amazement. After this move, the air attacks died down briefly as the Americans returned to rearm. While they departed, Admiral Ugaki was heard to remark on the bravery of the pilots, which left many of the Japanese officers in a state of disbelief alongside Kurita. 
but their bravery, though Herculean, would not outdo that of the Japanese aviators, for a divine wind was blowing. The first kamikazes of the Pacific War had arrived on the scene. They attacked different targets throughout the entire Taffy formation, with their leader, Lieutenant Yukio Sekai, slamming his Zero into St. Lo, causing catastrophic damage that would result in the loss of the ship. Other kamikazes struck targets causing chaos, but most were shot down before they could even get close. It would be the only air support the Japanese would get. And so the battle raged on. The tin cans waged a war of heroic yet spiteful resistance as the carriers tried to escape. But against the force of battleships, the result was never in doubt. In desperation, Sprague passed calls for help up the chain of command, begging for any kind of support from Task Force 58, but none was within range to assist. Nimitz, having thought the Iowas were nearby to assist, fired off an encrypted communication to Halsey. Turkey trots to water. Where is Task Force 34? The world wonders. The answer to that, of course, was nowhere near enough to help. By the end of the engagement, St. Lo and Gambia Bay had been sunk. Heavy cruisers Johnston Hole and Samuel B. Roberts along with them. But due to their sacrifice and their heroic efforts, along with that of the Taffy aviators, the majority of the formation broke contact and survived to fight another day. Yet even as they made good their escape, Yamato and her surviving escorts were now tearing towards the invasion fleet. They had defeated Taffy and were within striking distance of the objective. The Americans were helpless. All they needed to do was press the attack. And so they turned hard about and broke contact west. Admiral Curita ordered a full withdrawal and to abort the entire operation. Taffy's resistance had been so fierce that it had inflicted significant damage on his entire force, including Yamato. Furthermore, he had burned through far more ammunition than he would have liked, and there was now no air support, not even kamikazes to back them up. If he sailed in there, he may very well score a few more kills, but it would almost certainly result in the loss of his entire formation like Southern Force, as the rest of the US fleet would thunder in and crush him before he could get away. And losing both of Japan's mightiest flagships in a single battle would be both a strategic and political disaster. No. Yamato must live on as a final bastion to defend the homeland. Thus the Japanese offensive came to an end. But a question still remains unanswered. And like the world, I'm sure you're wondering. As this drama was playing out, where was USS Enterprise? Well, the answer to that is as fitting as it is poignant. While the drama of Samar played out, Enterprise and her sisters were far to the north. They had sailed at all possible speed, and as the sunlight broke the horizon that day, their airmen took flight for a singular purpose. To settle accounts, once and for all. Admiral Ozawa was once again not having a good day. Honestly, this man just keeps taking L's wherever he goes. Were it not for what's to come, I would say he's the real tragic figure here. Hearing what happened on the 24th, he had rightly concluded that the plan was a bust, and as a result he should withdraw to preserve his force. However, like with Kurita, orders came down that everyone was to turn around and re-engage. They were going to accept battle against the Americans. Now, in his case, that meant taking his force comprised of one air group of 120 planes, Japan's remaining carriers, and his hybrid surface warfare group, up against the entirety of Third Fleet. He had something like 20 ships in total, and that's including his support auxiliaries. The Americans, meanwhile, had over 100 ships hauling towards him, with 10 times the number of aircraft he did, not including the seaplanes and other auxiliary air units, as well as all of the Iowa-class battleships. As if it was any small consolation, their mission hadn't actually changed. Kurita was at this stage just about to hit Taffy 3, so he was bait, and in that sense his mission was accomplished. Now he had to hold the Americans here for his colleagues to do their work, and that would mean spending the lives of his pilots and sailors to do it. Well, it was going to come to this sooner or later anyway, and such was their duty. 
As dawn broke, the 30 Zeros of Zuikaku's combat air patrol launched into the rising sun, while the strike package behind them loaded weapons. Zuiho's pilots had already manned their planes and were waiting for the flag officer to give the word, and as the sun broke free of the horizon, the Japanese launched. They knew where the Americans were, they were hard to miss with a force that size, and so the strike formed up. But as they moved out, they detected American scout aircraft within visual range of the task force. Here they come. The two strike packages passed each other on their way to their respective targets, but only one would reach their objective. As the Japanese pilots approached Task Force 58, the combat air patrol descended on them like a pack of hungry wolves. American radar and fire control was just too effective. Enterprise's pilots from VF-20 scored five kills from the ensuing fight, while the other aviators of Task Force 58 steadily began slaughtering the Japanese. Of the entire attack force sent, not a single one got through the perimeter defences of the task force. However, several of the more experienced pilots aborted their attack, and they would later strafe Taklaban during the Battle of Samar, that was that group of three zeros earlier, eventually joining the kamikazes for one last attempt at victory. The Americans, meanwhile, had no such problems. The first wave of US Navy aircraft arrived over the Japanese force. The Japanese combat air patrol bravely tried to mount a defence, only to be scythed down by escorting Hellcats as though they were nothing. It wasn't without results though, One Zero did manage to shoot down an Enterprise Avenger, however the pilot was rescued by seaplane promptly afterwards along with his crew. With their only defence gone and only a small group of ships to provide AA fire, they were now at the mercy of the Americans, who would show precisely none at all. Bombs and torpedoes began raining down on every ship in the group. Issei took several near misses and a small bomb hit to one of her turrets, while a destroyer was completely immolated by Enterprise's pilots with a rocket barrage. But they weren't what most of the air group was aiming for. No, they were aiming for the carriers. Zuikaku and Zuiho, in the centre of the formation, manoeuvred to escape. One more time, the Grey Ghost and the sole survivor met in battle. And it would be the last time. Wave after wave of aircraft struck the Japanese. The near misses alone caused shock damage to almost every ship in the formation, but the carriers and seaplane tenders were sentenced to certain death. The aircraft from every ship in the US fleet pummeled the Japanese flat tops, and it seemed that Enterprise would finally vanquish her nemesis. It was the end. She'd finally, after all these years, she'd finally won. But there was no glory, no honour, no triumphant final battle. No, it was merely an execution for a long-defeated adversary. Yet as they stared each other down, it would not be Enterprise who settled it. As the third wave crested the horizon towards the Japanese, at its head was none other than the air group of USS Lexington. Her namesake, her mothership, her predecessor had perished at Zuikaku's hands. She would answer for that death, and Zuikaku would answer to her. The last survivor of Kido Butai, the only ship left to stand against the oncoming storm, a mirror to her rival in so many ways, was helpless to save herself. Bomb after bomb smashed through her flight deck, as no less than seven torpedoes smashed into her hull. Her anti-aircraft defences were useless, along with Zuiho fighting for her life alongside her, and failing. The situation was well and truly hopeless. At 13.58, the order to abandon ship was given, with Admiral Ozawa transferring the flag to the cruiser Oyodo. Her surviving crew gathered on the starboard side of the flight deck, which was now the only part of the ship above water, and officially struck the ensign in a ceremonial parade. Even as bombs and torpedoes were dropping around them, a mark of respect and honour for this valiant ship who had been their home for the past five years. This done, they dropped their gear and jumped over the side, with the ever-worsening list aiding their departure. The Americans, seeing that she was finished, switched targets and started hitting every other ship in sight. 
Chiyoda was bombarded repeatedly, while even more pressure fell upon Zuiho. But all of that faded into noise, as at 1414, the moment finally came. Zuikaku, the auspicious crane, capsized and slipped beneath the waves by the stern, taking her captain and 842 men with her. And as she fell to the ocean floor, the only thing she could see was the twisting and writhing hull of Zuiho, who she knew would soon be in her company for all eternity. The airstrikes continued. The submarines of the US Navy closed in like a pack of hungry wolves, but it was this moment more than any other that tolled like the final bell. Kido Butai, the force which struck at the heart of freedom, was finally no more and history's largest sea battle was over. And though Halsey would be criticized for leaving the rest of the US fleet unguarded, the heroics of the tin can sailors and the US naval aviators had turned the odds in their favor and achieved a total victory, though there was never really any doubt of the outcome in the end. The Japanese navy had launched its last gasp, and they had suffocated. It was now time to tighten the noose. With their only defences down, it was time for the final phase, and there was only one place for Enterprise to go now. Tokyo. After a return to Ulithi for rearm and refuel, Enterprise and her sisters sailed unopposed across the length of the southwestern Pacific. With her air group being one of the few trained and equipped for dedicated night operations, she operated on rotating shifts, blasting Japanese positions all throughout the region, including targets in Taiwan, Macau, the Philippines and Vietnam. From airfields to army depots to strategically crucial infrastructure, all the while engaging and destroying any aircraft or shipping they came across. Throughout December and January, these efforts continued until Task Force 58 was tasked with one mission, the one objective that Enterprise's sailors and airmen had been waiting for since 1941. Their target in February was the city of Tokyo, specifically aircraft production and engine plants in the city. Task Force 58 was to conduct round-the-clock strikes, with the early morning and late night missions being flown by Enterprise. But she was not the only night carrier in the group because Enterprise would be reunited with a very old friend. USS Saratoga, having completed night training for a number of US Navy pilots throughout Carrier Division 11, joined the force to assist in the upcoming operation. The task force fully assembled by February 14th, and two days later, the task force began hitting targets in the major cities along the eastern coast of Japan. Tokyo was hit along with naval installations at Yokosuka Naval Arsenal. Strikes continued over two days until the 18th. Once completed, they immediately sailed south to rejoin the main US armada, bombarding Iwo Jima to support the upcoming invasion. Enterprise and her colleagues arrived on station just in time to support Uncle Sam's misguided children, who were wading ashore just as they began flight operations. Throughout the campaign to take the island, Enterprise began flying constant strikes and combat air patrols, many of them against Mount Suribachi as our favourite Crayola canines slogged their way up its slopes. Enterprise here would set yet another world first record, conducting constant flight operations without a break over the span of 174 hours. Enterprise's pilots were literally flying a week straight with no break. She stayed in this role until March the 9th, when she left a resupply for an attack on Kyushu, the southern island of the Japanese homeland. Sorting again, she conducted strikes all across Kyushu and Honshu in precision night raids, pioneering radar-guided bombing attacks against crucial industrial targets. She sustained light battle damage on the 18th, but it was inconsequential. She then proceeded to support the landings on Okinawa, which is where her tour of duty would ultimately end. From April 5th to April 11th, the aviators of the Big E flew constant sorties in support of the Marines working their way across the island. Conditions were horrible and the resistance fierce. It was then that the last great naval operation conducted by Japan took place, 
as <laughs> sailed forth to make her final stand. Enterprise, however, was not involved, as by now there were so many Essex-class carriers present that her specialist night pilots had, quite literally, a million better things to do than to blow up the world's biggest battleship. Because Enterprise is the true queen of these waters. However, not even queens can defeat Mother Nature. The weather proved hazardous for both naval and air operations, but there was one storm that was worse than any other. The Divine Storm. The kamikaze had begun in earnest. Wave upon wave of Japanese aviators threw their lives away in the hope that they could achieve critical damage on enemy ships. And those that managed to get through the defences inflicted horrific losses on the Americans. Proper countermeasures to the threat were still in the process of being developed, some of them very creative. One such ingenious idea was the creation of smokescreen boys to be dropped by support vessels in order to shield the ships from view, while allowing the radar-guided AA guns to engage and destroy the oncoming attackers at will. And one of the pioneers of this method was a ship currently overseeing a forward emergency repair station among the islands south of Okinawa, a ship that bore the name USS Vestal. On April 11th, a wave of kamikazes struck the carrier group anchored offshore. Enterprise was damaged considerably by two near misses, with the explosives aboard setting shockwaves strong enough to rupture her fuel tanks, damage her engines, and knock out power to numerous systems on the ship. However, the damage was not fatal, and under her own power, she limped back to Ulithi for emergency repairs. These were completed quickly, allowing her to return on station off Okinawa by the 6th of May, conducting round-the-clock flight operations constantly for the next four days. In the time she had been absent, Things had gotten worse. Kamikaze attacks had increased in frequency, and though damage had been heavy throughout the fleet, there were some incredible stories of bravery. One such story belonged to a ship named USS Laffey, she's back, who against all odds held off the assault of an entire squadron of kamikazes by herself and lived to sail away from it. Throughout the first half of May, Enti's pilots racked up the flight hours and took down kamikazes. The gun crews as well were getting quite proficient, adding to their tally quite regularly as the fleet came under attack. However, while Enterprise was the luckiest ship in the fleet, everyone's luck eventually has to run out. On the 14th of May, another wave of kamikazes hit Task Force 58. One Zero, flown by Lieutenant Shinusuke Tomiyasu, managed to evade the combat air patrol and braved through the ungodly fusillade of AA fire taking aim at the nearest carrier he could see. The carrier he found was USS Enterprise. He aimed his aircraft towards the bow section, hoping to destroy the flight deck and knock out the ship. He slammed into the forward deck elevator, sending the elevator flying through the air. Thirteen men were killed in the attack, with another 68 wounded. Damage control teams moved swiftly to douse the flames and restore the flight deck to active use, patching the elevator hole and running diagnostic checks throughout the ship. Enterprise's captain said she was still combat capable and could continue operations. However, given that the entire Essex class was now present and available, it was deemed unnecessary to keep her there, and she was ordered back to the States for a full refit. As such, Enterprise, with the aid of local auxiliaries, checked out her systems, secured the decks, and set sail for Puget Sound, saying farewell to her old friend, USS Vestal who was at that time aiding a pair of destroyers in the maintenance area while Enterprise handled her own repairs. They had been comrades through the darkest times, saving each other more times than either one could count. Enterprise and Vestal were sisters in arms through and through. And this would be the very last time they would see each other. CV-6, the Grey Ghost, pulled into Puget Sound on the 12th of June, disembarking her air group and her battle-weary crew. There was much work to be done. The ship was worn out. 
The crew had cared for her deeply, but there was no hiding the battle scars, the dents, the scratches, wear and tear. Nevertheless, the yard got to work, bringing her back up to the best condition they could in preparation for Operation Olympic, the invasion of Kyushu to secure the southern flank and forward base for the final part of Operation Downfall, the invasion of mainland Japan. It was going to be a brutal fight. Hundreds of thousands were expected to die. Purple Hearts were manufactured by the millions. However, those medals would not be awarded until 60 years later. As on August the 6th, a small flight of Boeing B-29s soared through the morning sun over the Pacific. Their lead aircraft bore the name Enola Gay. At 8.15, a bright flash enveloped the city of Hiroshima, leveling the city to the ground in an instant, extinguishing the lives of 100,000 people with it. An emergency meeting of the Imperial Council was called. However, the military was adamant the war would continue. They would force the Allies to invade. The Emperor, however, was not convinced. He, along with his aides in the civilian government, were looking for a solution. But their hands would be forced. As on August 9th, Nagasaki was struck by a plutonium bomb, killing a further 40,000 people and destroying a key port in Kyushu vital for the defence. On the same day, Soviet troops invaded Manchuria, scuttling any hope for a negotiated peace via arbitration. Realising the situation was hopeless, the Emperor declared his intention to end the war. And this actually resulted in an attempted coup by overzealous Japanese officers, along with multiple units defying the order to cease hostilities. But in the end, eventually, the Emperor's will would be enforced. In his address to the nation, he accepted the terms of unconditional surrender established at Potsdam with the words, The war has developed not entirely in Japan's favour. A ceasefire was announced, and on September 2nd, 1945, aboard USS Missouri, Japan formally capitulated to the Allied powers, bringing humanity's largest and most horrific conflict to an end. However, missing from Tokyo Bay and the air parade over the city was the ship who had done more to bring about this moment than any other. USS Enterprise sat in Puget Sound, her refit finished two days earlier. Her restoration, though, was now no longer needed. She was old, obsolete, and even with her new coat of paint there was no doubt that with the end of hostilities, her career was at an end. But true to her fighting spirit, true to all the sacrifices she had made, true to all the men who served her to the last, she embarked on one last mission in service to the country. And it could not have been more perfect. USS Enterprise, the Grey Ghost, the Big E, the ship which had stood firm in America's darkest hour, was the ship that took America to war. And now she would bring America to peace. And she would bring all those Americans home. USS Enterprise immediately began Operation Magic Carpet to retrieve as many US servicemen as possible and bring them back home to the United States. She sailed to Hawaii where she embarked 1,141 servicemen for the voyage home. After this was done, she sailed on to New York and later Boston, where she would have her aircraft support facilities removed and replaced with as many berthings as possible made to accommodate soldiers returning from Europe. She would make three voyages across the Atlantic, bringing over 10,000 servicemen and women back to the United States. On the second trip, she stopped in Southampton, where she was received officially by the British First Lord of the Admiralty and his senior staff. As recognition for achievements in battle and the friendship between the two navies, USS Enterprise was awarded with a Royal Navy Admiralty pennant, a symbol of distinction and the only US ship in history to ever receive the honour, capping off an illustrious and storied career. By war's end, USS Enterprise was the most decorated ship in US Navy history, as well as its most deadly. In her time of service, she had accounted for 911 planes and 71 ships by herself, 
while sharing in the disabling or the destruction of 192 further vessels of all types with her sisters. She was officially awarded both the Presidential Unit Citation and the Navy Commendation Medal with 20 Battle Stars to her Asia Pacific Service Award, more stars than any other vessel in the US Navy before or since. USS Enterprises only equal in American naval history is USS Constitution. That is the level of honor and reverence we are discussing. On the 18th of January 1946, Enterprise entered New York Naval Yard for decommissioning. It was originally intended for her to become a war memorial, to be cared for by the state of New York, but plans for this fell through and were suspended in 1949. This decision caused outrage among what amounted to the entire U.S. naval aviation community. Veterans of USS Enterprise campaigned relentlessly for her to be saved as a museum, even gaining the support of both Admiral Nimitz and Admiral Halsey. Eventually, the U.S. Navy gave them an ultimatum. The cost for the purchase of Enterprise from the Navy was listed as $2 million U.S., roughly $25 million in today's money. There was no way that they could raise enough. And so... In what I consider the worst and most sacrilegious crime ever to take place in naval history, USS Enterprise, CV-6, was sold for scrap on the 1st of July, 1958, to the Lipset Corporation of New York, to be dismantled in the breaker's yard of Kearney, New Jersey. Several precious artifacts were saved, though, such as her stern plate, which rests in a park in New Jersey, while her anchors are preserved in the Washington Navy Yard. Most prestigiously, though, her ship's bell is held in pride of place at the U.S. Naval Academy, and it is only ever rung if the midshipmen beat West Point in the annual Army-Navy game. But nevertheless, it was over. Her journey was at an end. From Pearl Harbor to Midway, to Santa Cruz to Guadalcanal, to the very gates of Tokyo she sailed, and now, her final resting place awaited her arrival. She passed through Manhattan, under the mighty spans of her bridges, and the towering buildings of a prosperous nation. A nation she fought so valiantly to save. It was not the end she deserved, but... There is a part of me that thinks it may have been the end her spirit wanted. And I cannot think of a more fitting place for Enterprise to rest. As she sailed to her last port of call, she passed the Statue of Liberty. A beacon of hope. A symbol that she herself, on her final mission, had brought so many of America's finest to see to let them know that they had come home. But, but it's more than that. As Enterprise slowly passed from this earth, she was overlooking New York Harbor. And in Lady Liberty, I think she actually found a kindred spirit in the end, for both of them had made a solemn promise that they would be a guardian a watcher, a protector of the flame of liberty, ensuring that for all time, forevermore and without compromise, there will always, always be a land on earth where anyone can find sanctuary, where the poor and the oppressed and downtrodden, regardless of who they be, may once again breathe free.
trade towers where thousands of people work have now been attacked and destroyed with thousands of people. I can hear you! And the people who knocked these buildings down will hear all of us soon.